Chapter 31 Prax With every day that passed, the question came closer. What was the next step? It didn't feel all that different from those first terrible days on Ganymede, making lists as a way of telling himself what to do. Only now he wasn't only looking for May. He was looking for Strickland, or the mysterious woman in the video, or whoever had built the secret lab. In that sense, he was much better off than he had been before. On the other hand, he had been searching Ganymede. Now the field had expanded to include everywhere. The lag time to Earth, or Luna, actually, since Perse's stroke security consultants was based in orbit rather than down the planet's gravity well, was a little over twenty minutes. It made actual conversation essentially impossible, so in practice the hatchet-faced woman on his screen was making a series of promotional videos more and more specifically targeted to what Prax wanted to hear. We have an intelligence-sharing relationship with Pinkwater, which is presently the security company with the largest physical and operational presence in the outer planets, she said. We also have joint action contracts with Alabik and Star Helix. With those, we can take immediate action, either directly or through our partners, on literally any station or planet in the system. Prax nodded to himself. That was exactly what he needed. Someone with eyes everywhere, with contacts everywhere. Someone who could help. I'm attaching a release, the woman said. We will need payment for the processing fee, but we won't be charging your accounts for anything more than that until we've agreed on the scope of the investigation you're willing to be liable for. Once we have that in hand, I will send you a detailed proposal with an itemized spreadsheet, and we can decide the scope of work that works best for you. Thank you, Prax said. He pulled up the document, signed off, and returned it. It would be twenty minutes at the speed of light before it reached Luna. Twenty minutes back. Who knew how long in between? It was a start. He felt good about that, at least. The ship was quiet in a way that felt like anticipation. But Prax didn't know exactly what of. The arrival at Tycho Station, but beyond that he wasn't sure. Leaving his bunk behind, he went through the empty galley and up the ladder toward the ops center and then the pilot station. The small room was dim, most of the light coming from the control panels and the sweep of high-definition screens that filled 270 degrees of vision with starlight, the distant sun, and the approaching mass of Tycho Station, the oasis in the vast emptiness. Hey there, Doc, Alex said from the pilot's couch. Come up to see the view? If, I mean, if that's all right. Not a problem. I haven't been running with a co-pilot since we got the Rosie. Strap in right there. Just if something happens, don't touch anything. I won't, Prax promised as he scrambled into the acceleration couch. At first, the station seemed to grow slowly. The two counter-rotating rings were hardly larger than Prax's thumb. The sphere they surrounded little more than a gumball. Then, as they drew nearer... The fuzzy texture at the edge of the construction sphere began to resolve into massive waldos and gantries reaching toward a strangely aerodynamic form. The ship under construction was still half undressed. Ceramic and steel support beams opened to the vacuum like bones. Tiny fireflies flickered inside and out, welders and sealant packs firing off too far away to see apart from the light. Is that built for atmosphere? Nope. Kind of looks that way, though. That's the Chesapeake. Or it will be, anyway. She's designed for a sustained high G. I think they're talking about running the poor bastard at something like 8G for a couple of months. All the way where? Prax asked, doing a little napkin-back math in his head. It would have to be outside the orbit of... anything. Yep, she'll be going deep. They're going after that Nauvoo. The generation ship that was supposed to knock Eros into the sun? That's the one. 
They cut her engines when the plan went south, but she's been cruising on ever since. Wasn't finished, so they can't bring her around on remote. Instead, they're building a retriever. Hope they manage to. The Nauvoo was an amazing piece of work. Of course, even if they get her back, it won't keep the Mormons from suing Tycho into non-existence if they can figure out how. Why would that be hard? OPA doesn't recognize the courts on Earth and Mars, and they run the ones in the belt. So it's pretty much win in a court that doesn't matter or lose in one that does. Oh, Prax said. On the screens, Tycho's station grew larger and more detailed. Prax couldn't tell what detail of it brought it into perspective, but between one heartbeat and the next, he understood the scope and size of the station before him and let out a little gasp. The construction sphere had to be half a kilometer across, like two complete farm domes stuck bottom to bottom. Slowly, the great industrial sphere grew until it filled the screens, starlight replaced by the glow from equipment guides and a glass-domed observation bubble. Steel and ceramic plates and scaffolds took the place of the blackness. There were the massive drives that could push the entire station like a city in the sky anywhere in the solar system. There were the complex swivel points, like the gimbals of a crash couch made by giants, that would reconfigure the station as a whole when thrust gravity took rotation's place. It took his breath away. The elegance and functionality of the structure lay out before him, as beautiful and simple and effective as a leaf or a root cluster. To have something so much like the fruits of evolution, but designed by human minds, was awe-inspiring. It was the pinnacle of what creativity meant, the impossible made real. That's good work, Prax said. Yep, Alex said, and then on the shipwide channel. We've arrived. Everyone strap in for docking. I'm going to manual. Prax half rose in his couch. Should I go to my quarters? Where you are is as good as any place. Just put the web on in case we bump against something, Alex said. And then, his voice changing to a stronger, more clipped cadence, Tycho Control, this is the Rosinante. Are we cleared for docking? Prax heard a distant voice speaking to Alex alone. Roger that, Alex said. We're coming in. In the dramas and action films that Prax had watched back on Ganymede, piloting a ship had always looked like a fairly athletic thing. Sweating men dragging hard against the control bars. Watching Alex was nothing like it. He still had the two joysticks, but his motions were small, calm. A tap, and the gravity under Prax changed, his couch shifting under him by a few centimeters. Then another tap, and another shift. The heads-up display showed a tunnel through the vacuum outlined in a blue and gold that swept up and to the right, ending against the side of the turning ring. Prax looked at the mass of data being sent to Alex and said, Why fly at all? Couldn't the ship just use this data to do the docking itself? Why fly? Alex repeated with a laugh. Because it's fun, Doc. Because it's fun. The long, bluish lights of the windows in Tycho's observation dome were so clear, Prax could see the people looking out at him. He could almost forget that the screens in the cockpit weren't windows. The urge to look out and wave, to watch someone wave back, was profound. Holden's voice came over Alex's line, the words unidentifiable and the tone perfectly clear. We're looking fine, Cap, Alex said. Ten more minutes. The crash couch shifted to the side, the wide plane of the station curving down as Alex matched the rotation. To generate even a third of a G on a ring that wide would demand punishing inertial forces. But under Alex's hand, ship and station drifted together slowly and gently. Before Prax had gotten married, he'd seen a dance performance based on neo-Daoist traditions. For the first hour, it had been utterly boring. And then, after that, 
the small movements of arms and legs and torso, shifting together, bending and falling away, had been entrancing. The Rosinante slid into place beside an extending airlock port with the same beauty Prax had seen in that dance, but made more powerful by the knowledge that instead of skin and muscles, this was tons of high tensile steel and live fusion reactors. The Rosinante eased into her berth with one last correction, one last shifting of the gimbaled couches. The final matching spin had been no more than any of the small corrections Alex had made on the way in. There was a disconcerting bang as the station's docking hooks latched onto the ship. Tyco Control, Alex said. This is the Rosinante confirming dock. We have seal on the airlock. We are reading the clamps in place. Can you confirm? A moment passed, and a mutter. Thank you too, Tycho, Alex said. It's good to be back. Gravity in the ship had shifted subtly. Instead of thrust from the drive creating the illusion of weight, it now came from the spin of the ring they were clamped to. Prax felt like he was tilting slightly to the side whenever he stood up straight and had to fight the urge to overcompensate by leaning the other way. Holden was in the galley when Prax reached it, the coffee machine pouring black and hot, with just the slightest bend to the stream. Coriolis effect, a dimly remembered high school class, reminded Prax. Amos and Naomi came in together. They were all together now, and Prax felt the time was right to thank them all for what they'd done for him. For May, who was probably dead. The naked pain on Holden's face stopped him. Naomi stood in front of him, a duffel bag over her shoulder. You're heading out, Holden said. I am. Her voice was light, but it had meaning radiating from it like harmonic overtones. Prax blinked. All right, then, Holden said. For a few seconds, no one moved. Then Naomi darted in, kissing Holden lightly on the cheek. The captain's arms moved out to embrace her, but she'd already stepped away, marching out through the narrow hallway with the air of a woman on her way someplace. Holden took his coffee. Amos and Alex exchanged glances. Uh, Captain? Alex asked. Compared to the voice of the man who'd just put a nuclear warship against a spinning metal wheel in the middle of interplanetary space, the voice was hesitant and concerned. Are we looking for a new XO? We're not looking for anything until I say so, Holden said. Then his voice quieted her. But God, I hope not. Yes, sir, Alex said. Me too. The four men stood for a long, awkward moment. Amos was the first to speak. You know, Cap, he said. The place I've got booked has a room for two. If you want the spare bunk, it's yours. No, Holden said. He didn't look at them as he spoke, but reached out his hand and pressed his palm to the wall. I'm staying on the Rossi. I'll be right here. You sure? Amos asked, and again it seemed to mean something more than Prax could understand. I'm not going anywhere, Holden said. All right, then. Prax cleared his throat, and Amos took his elbow. How about you? Amos said. You got a place to bunk down? Prax's prepared speech, I wanted to tell you all how much I appreciate, ran into the question, derailing both thoughts. I, uh, I don't, but... Right then, get your stuff and you can come with me. Well, yes, thank you, but first I wanted to tell you all... Amos put a solid hand on his shoulder. Maybe later, the big man said. Right now, how about you just come with me? Holden leaned against the wall now. His jaw was set hard, like that of a man about to scream, or vomit, or weep. His eyes were looking at the ship, but seeing past it. Sorrow welled up in Prax as if he were looking into a mirror. Yeah, he said. Okay.
Amos's rooms were, if anything, smaller than the bunks on the Rocinante. Two small privacy areas, a common space less than half the size of the galley, and a bathroom with a fold-out sink and toilet in the shower stall. It would have induced claustrophobia if Amos had actually been there. Instead, he'd seen Prax settled in, taken a quick shower, and headed out into the wide, luxurious passageways of the station. There were plants everywhere, but for the most part they seemed decorative. The curve of the decks was so slight, Prax could almost imagine he was back on some unfamiliar part of Ganymede, that his hole was no more than a tube ride away, that May would be there, waiting for him. Prax let the outer door close, pulled out his hand terminal and connected to the local network. There was still no reply from Purse's strokes, but it was probably too early to expect one. In the meantime, the problem was money. If he was going to fund this, he couldn't do it alone, which meant Nicola. Prax set up his terminal, turning the camera on himself. The image on the screen looked thin, wasted. The weeks had dried him out, and his time on the Rocinante hadn't completely rebuilt him. He might never be rebuilt. The sunken cheeks on the screen might be who he was now. That was fine. He started recording. Hi, Nicky, he said. I wanted you to know I'm safe. I got to Tycho Station, but I still don't have May. I'm hiring a security consultant. I'm giving them everything I know. They seem like they'll really be able to help, but it's expensive. It may be very expensive. And she may already be dead. Prax took a moment to catch his breath. She may already be dead, he said again. But I have to try. I know you aren't in a great financial position right now. I know you've got your new husband to think of. But if you have anything you can spare... Not for me. I don't want anything from you. Just May. For her. If you can give her anything, this is the last chance. He paused again, his mind warring between thank you and it's the least you can fucking do. In the end, he just shut off the recording and sent it. The lag between Ceres and Tycho Station was fifteen minutes given their relative positions. And even then, he didn't know what the local schedule there was. He might be sending his message in the middle of the night or during dinner time. She might not have anything to say to him. It didn't matter. He had to try. He could sleep if he knew he'd done everything he could to try. He recorded and sent messages to his mother, to his old roommate from college who'd taken a position on Neptune Station, to his postdoctorate advisor. Each time, the story got a little easier to tell. The details started coming together, one leading into another. With them, he didn't talk about the protomolecule. At best, it would have scared them. At worst, they'd have thought the loss had broken his mind. When the last message was gone, he sat quietly. There was one other thing he thought he had to do, now that he had full communication access. It wasn't what he wanted. He started the recording. Basha, he said, this is Praxidiki. I wanted you to know that I know Katoi is dead. I saw the body. It didn't, it didn't look like he suffered. And I thought if I was in your place, that wondering, wondering could be worse. I'm sorry. I'm just... He turned off the recording, sent it, and crawled onto the small bed. He'd expected it to be hard and uncomfortable, but the mattress was as cradling as crash couch gel, and he fell asleep easily and woke four hours later like someone had flipped a switch on the back of his head. Amos was still gone, even though it was station midnight. There was still no message from Purse's strokes, so Prax recorded a polite inquiry just to be sure the information hadn't gotten lost in transit, then watched it and erased it. He took a long shower, washing his hair twice, 
shaved and recorded a new inquiry, looking less like a raving lunatic. Ten minutes after he sent it, a new message alert chimed. Intellectually, he knew it couldn't be a response. With lag, his message wouldn't even be at Luna yet. When he pulled it up, it was Nicola. The heart-shaped face looked older than he remembered it. There was the first dusting of gray at her temples. But when she made that soft, sad smile, he was twenty again, sitting across from her in the Grand Park while Bhangra throbbed and lasers traced living art on the domed ice above them. He remembered what it had been like to love her. I have your message, she said. I'm... I'm so sorry, Praxidiki. I wish there was more I could do. Things aren't so good here on Ceres. I will talk with Taban. He makes more than I do, and if he understands what's happened, he might want to help too, for my sake. Take care of yourself, old man. You look tired. On the screen, May's mother leaned forward and stopped the recording. An icon showed an authorized transfer code for 80 Fusion Tech Real. Prax checked the exchange rates, converting the company script to UN dollars. It was almost a week's salary. Not enough. Not near enough. But still, it had been a sacrifice for her. He pulled the message back up, pausing it in the gap between two words. Nicola looked at him from the terminal. Her lips parted barely enough for him to see her pale teeth. Her eyes were sad and playful. He'd thought for so long that it was her soul and not just an accident of physiology that gave her that look of fettered joy. He'd been wrong. As he sat, lost in history and imagination, a new message appeared. It was from Luna. Percy's strokes. With a feeling somewhere between anxiety and hope, he went to the attached spreadsheet. At the first set of numbers, his heart sank. May might be out there. She might be alive. Certainly Strickland and his people were there. They could be found. They could be caught. There was justice to be had. He just couldn't afford it. Chapter 32 Holden Holden sat in a pull-down chair in the Rosinante's engineering bay, reviewing the damage and making notes for Tycho's repair crew. Everyone else was gone. Some more than others, he thought. Replace starboard engineering bulkhead. Significant damage to port side power cable junction, possibly replace entire junction box. Two lines of text representing hundreds of work hours, hundreds of thousands of dollars in parts. It also represented the aftermath of coming within a hand's breadth of fiery annihilation for the ship and crew. Describing it in two quick sentences felt almost sacrilegious. He made a footnote of the types of civilian parts that Tycho was likely to have available that would work with his Martian warship. Behind him, a wall monitor streamed a series-based news show. Holden had it turned on to keep his mind occupied while he tinkered with the ship and made notes. Which was all bullshit, of course. Sam, the Tycho engineer who usually took the lead on their repair jobs, didn't need his help. She didn't need him making lists of parts for her. She was, in every sense, better qualified to be doing what he was doing right now. But as soon as he turned the job over to her, he wouldn't have any reason to stay on the ship. He would have to confront Fred about the protomolecule on Ganymede. And maybe lose Naomi in the process. If his earlier suspicion was correct, and Fred actually had bartered using the protomolecule as currency, or worse, as a weapon, Holden would kill him. He knew that like he knew his own name. And he feared it that it would be a capital offense and would almost certainly get him burned down on the spot was actually less important than the fact that it would be the final proof that Naomi was right to leave, that he turned into the man she feared he was becoming, just another Detective Miller, dispensing frontier justice from the barrel of his gun. 
But whenever he pictured the scene, Fred's admission of guilt and heartfelt appeal for mercy, Holden couldn't picture not killing him for what he'd done. He remembered being the sort of man who would make a different choice, but he couldn't actually remember what being that man was like. If he was wrong, and Fred had nothing to do with the tragedy on Ganymede, then she'd have been right all along, and he had just been too stubborn to see it. He might be able to apologize for that with sufficient humility to win her back. Stupidity was usually a lesser crime than vigilantism. But if Fred wasn't the one playing God with the alien supervirus, that was much, much worse for humanity in general. It was an unpleasant thought that the truth that would be the worst for humanity was the one that would be best for him. Intellectually, he knew he wouldn't hesitate to sacrifice himself or his happiness to save everyone else. But that didn't stop the tiny voice at the back of his head that said, Fuck everyone else. I want my girlfriend back. Something half-remembered pushed up from his subconscious, and he wrote, More coffee filters on his list of needed supplies. The wall panel behind him chimed an alert half a second before his hand terminal buzzed to let him know someone was at the airlock, requesting permission to board. He tapped the screen to switch to the airlock's outer door camera and saw Alex and Sam waiting in the corridor. Sam was still the adorable red-haired pixie in the oversized gray coveralls he remembered. She was carrying a large toolbox and laughing. Alex said something else, and she laughed harder, almost dropping her tools. With the intercom off, it was a silent movie. Holden tapped the intercom button and said, Come on in, guys. Another tap cycled the outer airlock doors open. Sam waved at the camera and stepped inside. A few minutes later, the pressure hatch to engineering banged open and the ladder lift whined its way down. Sam and Alex stepped off, Sam dropping her tools onto the metal deck with a loud crash. What's up? she said, giving Holden a quick hug. You getting my girl all shut up again? Your girl? Alex said. Not this time, Holden replied, pointing out the damaged bulkheads in the engineering bay to her. Bomb went off in the cargo bay, burned a hole there, and threw some shrapnel into the power junction there. Sam whistled. Either that shrapnel took the long way around, or your reactor knows how to duck. How long, you think? Bulkhead's simple, she said, punching something into her terminal, then tapping her front teeth with its corner. We can bring a patch in through the cargo bay in a single piece. Makes the job a lot easier. Power junction takes longer, but not a lot. Say four days if I get my crew on it right now. Well, Holden said, wincing like a man who had to keep admitting to new wrongdoings. We also have a damaged cargo bay door that will either have to be fixed or replaced, and our cargo bay airlock is kind of messed up. Couple more days then, Sam said, then knelt down and began pulling things out of her toolbox. Mind if I start taking some measurements? Holden waved at the wall. Be my guest. Been watching the news a lot? Sam said, pointing at the talking heads on the wall monitor. Ganymede is fucked, right? Yeah, Alex said, pretty much. But it's only Ganymede so far, Holden said. So that means something I haven't quite figured out yet. Naomi's staying with me right now, Sam said, as if they'd been talking about that all along. Holden felt his face go still and tried to fight against it, forcing himself to smile. Oh, cool. She won't talk about it, but if I found out you did something shitty to her, I'm using this on your dick, she said, holding up a torque wrench. Alex laughed nervously for a second, then trailed off and just looked uncomfortable. I consider myself fairly warned, Holden said. How is she? Quiet, Sam said. Okay, got what I need. Gonna scoot now and get fabrication to work on cutting this bulkhead patch. See you boys around. Bye, Sam, Alex said, watching her ride the ladder lift until the pressure door closed behind her. I'm twenty years too old, and I'm pretty sure I've got the wrong plumbing, but I like that gal. 
You and Amos just trade this crush back and forth? Holden said. Or should I be worried about you two doing pistols at dawn over her? My love is a pure love, Alex said with a grin. I wouldn't sully it by actually, you know, doing anything about it. The kind poets write about then. So, Alex said, leaning against a wall and looking at his nails. Let's talk about the XO situation. Let's not. Oh, let's do, Alex said then took a step forward and crossed his arms like a man who was not going to give any ground. I've been flying this boat solo for over a year now. That only works because Naomi is a brilliant ops officer and takes up a whole lot of slack. If we lose her, we don't fly, and that's a fact. Holden dropped the hand terminal he'd been using into his pocket and slumped back against the reactor shielding. I know, I know. I never thought she'd actually do this. Leave, Alex said. Yeah. We never talked about pay, Alex said. We don't get salaries. Pay? Holden frowned at Alex and banged out a quick drumbeat on the reactor behind him. It echoed like a metal tomb. Every dime that Fred's given us that hasn't gone to pay for operating the ship is in the account I set up. If you need some of it, Twenty-five percent of that money belongs to you. Alex shook his head and waved his hands. No, don't get me wrong, I don't need money. And I don't think you're stealing from us. Just pointing out that we never talked about pay. So? So, that means we aren't a normal crew. We aren't working the ship for money or because the government drafted us. We're here because we want to be. That's all you've got over us. We believe in the cause, and we want to be part of what you're doing. The minute we lose that, we might as well take a real paying job. But Naomi, Holden started, was your girlfriend, Alex said with a laugh. Damn, Jim, have you seen her? She can get another boyfriend. In fact, you mind if I... I take your point. I hear you. I fucked it up. It's my fault. I know that. All of it. I need to go see Fred and start thinking about how to put it all back together again. Unless Fred actually did do it. Yeah. Unless that. I've been wondering when you'd finally drop by, Fred Johnson said as Holden walked through his office door. Fred was looking both better and worse than when Holden had first met him a year earlier. Better because the Outer Planets Alliance, the quasi-government that Fred was the titular head of, was no longer a terrorist organization, but a de facto government that could sit at the diplomatic table with the inner planets. And Fred had taken to the role of administrator with a relish he must not have felt for being a freedom fighter. It was visible in the relaxed set of his shoulders and the half-smile that had become his default expression. And worse, because the last year and all the pressures of government had aged him. His hair was both thinner and whiter. His neck a confusion of loose flesh and old ropey muscle. His eyes had permanent bags under them now. His coffee-colored skin didn't show many wrinkles, but it had a tinge of gray to it. But the smile he gave Holden was genuine and he came around the desk to shake his hand and guide him to a chair. I read your report on Ganymede, Fred said. Talk to me about it. Impressions on the ground. Fred, Holden said. There's something else. Fred nodded to him as he moved back around his desk and sat down. Go on. Holden started to speak, then stopped. Fred was staring at him. His expression hadn't changed, but his eyes were sharper, more focused. Holden felt a sudden and irrational fear that Fred already knew everything he was about to say. The truth was, Holden had always been afraid of Fred. There was a duality to the man that left him on edge. Fred had reached out to the crew of the Rosinante at the exact moment they'd needed help the most. He'd become their patron their safe harbor against the myriad enemies they'd gathered over the last year. And yet, 
Holden couldn't forget that this was still Colonel Frederick Lucius Johnson, the butcher of Anderson Station. A man who had spent the last decade helping to organize and run the Outer Planets Alliance, an organization that was capable of murder and terrorism to further its goals. Fred had almost certainly ordered some of those murders personally. It was entirely possible that the OPA leader version of Fred had killed more people than even the United Nations Marine Colonel version of Fred had. Would he really balk at using the protomolecule to further his agenda? Maybe. Maybe that would be going too far. And he'd been a friend, and he deserved the chance to defend himself. Fred, I... Holden started, then stopped. Fred nodded again the smile slipping off his face and being replaced by a slight frown. I'm not going to like this. It was a statement of fact. Holden grabbed the arms of the office chair and pushed himself to his feet. He shoved more violently than he wanted to and, in the low point three g of station spin, flew off his feet for a second. Fred chuckled, and the frown shifted back into a grin. And that was it. The grin and the laugh broke the fear and turned it into anger. When Holden settled back to his feet, he leaned forward and slammed both palms onto Fred's desk. You, he said, don't get to laugh. Not until I know for sure it wasn't all your fault. If you can do what I think you might have done and still laugh, I will shoot you right here and now. Fred's smile didn't change but something in his eyes did. He wasn't used to being threatened, but it wasn't new territory either. What I might have done, Fred said, not turning it into a question, just repeating it back. It's the protomolecule, Fred. That's what's happening on Ganymede. A lab with kids as experiments and that black webbing shit and a monster that almost killed my ship. That's my fucking impression on the ground. Someone has been playing with the bug, and it might be loose, and the inner planets are shooting each other to shit in orbit around it. You think I did this, Fred said. Again, just a flat statement of fact. We threw this shit into Venus, Holden yelled. I gave you the only sample. And suddenly Ganymede, breadbasket of your future empire, the one place the inner navies won't cede control of, gets a fucking outbreak? Fred let the silence answer for a beat. Are you asking me if I'm using the protomolecule to drive the inner planet's troops off Ganymede and strengthen my control of the outer planets? Fred's quiet tone made Holden realize how loud he'd gotten, and he took a moment to take several deep breaths. When his pulse had slowed a bit, he said, Yes, pretty much exactly that. You... Fred said with a broad smile that did not extend to his eyes. Do not get to ask me that. What? In case you've forgotten, you are an employee of this organization. Fred stood up, stretching to his full height, a dozen centimeters taller than Holden. His smile didn't change, but his body shifted and sort of spread out. Suddenly, he looked very large. Holden took a step back before he could stop himself. I, Fred continued, owe you nothing but the terms of our latest contract. Have you completely lost your mind, boy? Charging in here, shouting at me, demanding answers? No one else could have... Holden started, but Fred ignored him. You gave me the only sample we knew of, but you assume that if you don't know about it, it doesn't exist. I've been putting up with your bullshit for over a year now, Fred said. This idea you have that the universe owes you answers, this righteous indignation you wield like a club at everyone around you, but I don't have to put up with your shit. Do you know why that is? Holden shook his head, afraid if he spoke it might come out as a squeak. It's because, Fred said, I'm the fucking boss. I run this outfit. You've been pretty useful, and you might be again in the future, 
but I have enough shit to deal with right now without you starting another of your crusades at my expense. So, Holden said, letting the word drag to two syllables, so you're fired. This was your last contract with me. I'll finish fixing the Rossi, and I'll pay you, because I don't break a deal. But I think we've finally built enough ships to start policing our own sky without your help, and even if we haven't, I'm just about done with you. Fired, Holden said. Now get the hell out of my office before I decide to take the Rossi, too. She's got more Tycho parts on her now than originals. I think I might be able to make a good argument I own that ship. Holden backed up toward the door, wondering how serious that threat might actually be. Fred watched him go, but didn't move. When he reached the door, Fred said, It wasn't me. Their gazes met for a long, breathless moment. It wasn't me, Fred repeated. Holden said, Okay, and backed out the door. When the door slid shut and blocked Fred from view, Holden let out a long sigh and collapsed against the corridor wall. Fred was right about one thing. He'd been excusing himself with his fear for far too long. This righteous indignation you wield like a club at everyone around you. He'd seen humanity almost end due to his own stupidity. It had left him shaken to the core. He'd been running on fear and adrenaline ever since Eros. But it wasn't an excuse. Not anymore. He started to pull out his terminal to call Naomi when it hit him like a light turning on. I'm fired. He'd been on an exclusive contract with Fred for over a year. Tycho Station was their home base. Sam had spent almost as much time tuning and patching the Rossi as Amos had. That was all gone. They'd have to find their own jobs, find their own ports, buy their own repairs. No more patron to hold his hand. For the first time in a very long time, Holden was a real independent captain. He'd need to earn his way by keeping the ship in the air and the crew fed. He paused for a moment, letting that sink in. It felt great. Chapter 33 Prax Amos sat forward in his chair. The sheer physical mass of the man made the room seem smaller, and the smell of alcohol and old smoke came off him like heat from a fire. His expression couldn't have been more gentle. I don't know what to do, Prax said. I just don't know what to do. This is all my fault. Nicola was just... She was so lost and so angry. Every day I woke up and I looked over at her and all I saw was how trapped she was. And I knew May was going to grow up with that. With trying to get her mommy to love her when all Nicky wanted to do was be somewhere else. And I thought it would be better. When she started talking about going, I was ready for her to do it, you know? And when May... when I had to tell May that... Prax dropped his head into his hands, rocking slowly back and forth. You gonna sick up again, Doc? No, I'm fine. If I'd been a better father to her, she'd still be here. We're talking about the ex-wife or the kid. I don't care about Nicola. If I'd been there for May, if I'd gone to her as soon as we got the warning, if I hadn't waited there in the dome, and for what? Plants? They're dead now anyway. I had one, but I lost it too. I couldn't even save one. But I could have gotten there, found her, if I'd... You know, she was gone before the shit hit the fan, right? Prax shook his head. He wasn't about to let reality forgive him. And this. I had a chance. I got out. I got some money. And I was stupid. It was her last chance, and I was stupid about it. Yeah, well, you knew it, this duck. She should have had a better dad. She deserved a better dad. It was such a good... 
She was such a good girl. For the first time, Amos touched him. The wide hand took his shoulder, gripping him from collarbone to scapula and bending Prax's spine until it was straight. Amos's eyes were more than bloodshot. White sclera marbled with red. His breath was hot and astringent. The platonic ideal of a sailor on a shore-leave bender. But his voice was sober and steady. She's got a fine daddy, Doc. You give a shit. And that's more than a lot of people ever do. Prax swallowed. He was tired. He was tired of being strong, of being hopeful and determined and preparing for the worst. He didn't want to be himself anymore. He didn't want to be anyone at all. Amos's hand felt like a ship clamp, keeping Prax from spinning away into darkness. All he wanted was to be let go. She's gone, Prax said. It felt like a good excuse, an explanation. They took her away from me, and I don't know who they are, and I can't get her back. And I don't understand. It ain't over yet. Prax nodded, not because he was actually comforted, but because this was the moment when he knew he should act like he was. I'm never going to find her. You're wrong. The door chimed and slid open. Holden stepped in. Prax couldn't see at first what was different about him, but that something had happened, had changed, was unmistakable. The face was the same. The clothes hadn't changed. Prax had the uncanny memory of sitting through a lecture on metamorphosis. Hey, Holden said. Everything all right? Little bumpy, Amos said. Prax saw his own confusion mirrored in Amos's face. They were both aware of the transformation, and neither of them knew what it was. You get laid or something, Cap? No, Holden said. I mean, good on you if you did, Amos said. It just wasn't how I pictured. I didn't get laid, Holden said hesitantly. The smile that came after was almost radiant. I got fired. Just you got fired, or all of us? All of us. Huh, Amos said. He went still for a moment, then shrugged. All right. I need to talk to Naomi, but she's not accepting connections from me. Do you think you could track her down? Discomfort pursed Amos's lips like he'd sucked in an old lemon. I'm not going to pick a fight, Holden said. We just didn't leave it in the right place. And it's my fault, so I need to fix it. I know she was hanging out down in that one bar Sam told us about last time, the Blaue Bloom. But you make a dick of yourself, and I'm not the one that told you. Not a problem, Holden said. Thanks. The captain turned to leave and then stopped in the doorway. He looked like someone still half in a dream. What's Bumpy? he asked. You said it was Bumpy. The doc was looking to hire on some Luna private security squad to track the kid down. Didn't work out, and he kind of took it bad. Holden frowned. Prax felt the heat of a blush pushing up his neck. I thought we were finding the kid, Holden said. He sounded genuinely confused. Doc wasn't clear on that. Oh, Holden said. He turned to Prax. We're finding your kid. You don't need to get someone else. I can't pay you, Prax said. All my accounts were on the Ganymede system, and even if they're still there, I can't access them. I just have what people are giving me. I can probably get something like a thousand dollars UN. Is that enough? No, Holden said. That won't buy a week's air, much less water. We'll have to take care of that. Holden tilted his head like he was listening to something only he could hear. I've already talked to my ex-wife, Prax said, and my parents. I can't think of anyone else. How about everyone, Holden said. I'm James Holden, the captain said from the huge screen of the Rosinante's pilot capsule, and I'm here to ask for your help. Four months ago... Hours before the first attack on Ganymede, 
a little girl with a life-threatening genetic illness was abducted from her daycare. In the chaos that... Alex stopped the playback. Prax tried to sit up, but the gimbaled co-pilot's chair only shifted under him and he lay back. I don't know, Alex said from the pilot's couch. The green background kind of makes him look pasty, don't you think? Prax narrowed his eyes a degree, considered, then nodded. It's not really his color, Prax said. Maybe if it was darker. I'll try that, the pilot said, tapping at his screen. Normally it's Naomi who does this stuff. Communications packages ain't exactly my first love, but we'll get it done. How about this? Better, Prax said. I'm James Holden, and I'm here to ask for your help. Four months ago... Holden's part of the little presentation was less than a minute, speaking into the camera from Amos's hand terminal. After that, Amos and Prax had spent an hour trying to create the rest. Alex had been the one to suggest using the better equipment on the Rosinante. Once they'd done that, putting together the information had been easy. He'd taken the start he'd made for Nicola and his parents as the template. Alex helped him record the rest. An explanation of May's condition, the security footage of Strickland and the mysterious woman taking her from the daycare, the data from the secret lab, complete with images of the protomolecule filament, pictures of May playing in the parks, and a short video from her second birthday party when she smeared cake frosting on her forehead. Prax felt odd watching himself speak. He had seen plenty of recordings of himself, but the man on the screen was thinner than he'd expected. Older. His voice was higher than the one he heard in his own ears and less hesitant. The Praxitic Mung, who was about to be broadcast out to the whole of humanity, was a different man than he was. But it was close enough. And if it helped to find May, it would do. If it brought her back, he'd be anyone. Alex slid his fingers across his controls, rearranging the presentation, connecting the images of May to the timeline to Holden. They had set up an account with a belt-based credit union that had a suite of options for short-term, unincorporated non-profit concerns so that any contributions could be accepted automatically. Prax watched, wanting badly to offer comment or to take control, but there was nothing more to do. All right, Alex said. And it's about as pretty as I can make it. Okay, then, Prax said. What do we do with it now? Alex looked over. He seemed tired, but there was also an excitement. Hit send. But the review process? There is no review process, Doc. This isn't a government thing. Hell, it's not even a business. It's just us monkeys flying fast and trying to keep our butts out of the engine plume. Oh, Prax said. Really? You hang around the captain long enough, you get used to it. You might want to take a day, though. Think it through. Prax lifted himself on one elbow. Think what through? Sending this out. If it works the way we're thinking, you're about to get a lot of attention. Maybe it'll be what we're hoping for. Maybe it'll be something else. All I'm saying is you can't unscramble that egg. Prax considered for a few seconds. The screens glowed. It's May, Prax said. All right, then, Alex said and shifted communication control to the co-pilot station. You want to do the honors? Where is it going? I mean, where are we sending it? Simple broadcast, Alex said. Probably get picked up by some local feeds in the belt. But it's the captain, so folks will watch it. Pass it around on the net, and... And? We didn't put our hitchhiker in, but the filament out of that glass case? We're kind of announcing that the protomolecule's still out there. That's going to boost the signal. And we think that's going to help? First time we did something like this, it started a war, Alex said. Help might be a strong word for it. Stirs things up, though. Prax shrugged and hit send. Torpedoes away. Alex said, chuckling. Prax slept on the station, serenaded by the hum of the air recyclers. Amos was gone again, 
leaving only a note that Prax shouldn't wait up. It was probably his imagination that made the spin gravity seem to feel different. With a diameter as wide as Tycho's, the Coriolis effect shouldn't have been uncomfortably noticeable, and certainly not when he lay there, motionless, in the darkness of his room. And still, he couldn't get comfortable. He couldn't forget that he was being turned, inertia pressing him against the thin mattress as his body tried to fly out into the void. Most of the time he'd been on the Rosinante, he'd been able to trick his mind into thinking that he had the reassuring mass of a moon under him. It wasn't, he decided, an artifact of how the acceleration was generated, so much as what it meant. As his mind slowly spiraled down, bits of his self breaking apart like a meteor hitting atmosphere, he felt a massive welling up of gratitude. Part of it was to Holden, and part to Amos, the whole crew of the Rosinante. Half dreaming, he was on Ganymede again. He was starving walking down ice corridors with the certainty that somewhere nearby one of his soybeans had been infected with the protomolecule and was tracking him, bent on revenge. With the broken logic of dreams, he was also on Tycho, looking for work, but all the people he gave his CV to shook their heads and told him he was missing some sort of degree or credential he didn't recognize or understand. The only thing that made it bearable was a deeper knowledge, certain as bone, that none of it was true, that he was sleeping, and that when he woke, he would be somewhere safe. What did wake him at last was the rich smell of beef. His eyes were crusted like he'd been crying in his sleep, the tears leaving salt residues where they'd evaporated. The shower was hissing and splashing. Prax pulled on his jumpsuit, wondering again why it had Tachi printed across the back. Breakfast waited on the table. Steak and eggs, flour tortillas, and black coffee. Real food that had cost someone a small fortune. There were two plates, so Prax chose one and started eating. It had probably cost a tenth of the money he had from Nicola, but it tasted wonderful. Amos ducked out of the shower, a towel wrapped around his hips. A massive white scar puckered the right side of his abdomen, pulling his navel off-center and a nearly photographic tattoo of a young woman with wavy hair and almond-shaped eyes covered his heart. Prax thought there was a word under the tattooed face, but he didn't want to stare. Hey, Doc, Amos said. You're looking better. I got some rest. Prax said as Amos walked into his own room and closed the door behind him. When Prax spoke again, he raised his voice. I want to thank you. I was feeling low last night, and whether you and the others can actually help find May or not, why wouldn't we be able to find her? Amos asked, his voice muffled by the door. You ain't losing respect for me, are you, Doc? No, Prax said. No, not at all. I only meant that what you and the captain are offering is... it's huge. Amos came back out, grinning. His jumpsuit covered scars and tattoos as if they'd never been. I knew what you meant. I was just joshing you. You like that steak? Keep wondering where they put the cows on this thing, don't you? Oh no, this is vat-grown. You can tell from the way the muscle fibers grow. You see how these parts right here are layered? Actually, it makes it easier to get a good marbled cut than when you carve it out of a steer. No shit, Amos said, sitting across from him. I didn't know that. Microgravity also makes fish more nutritious, Prax said around a mouthful of egg. Increases the oil production. No one knows why, but there are a couple of very interesting studies about it. They think it may not be the low G itself so much as the constant flow you have to have so that the animals don't stop swimming, make a bubble of oxygen-depleted water, and suffocate. Amos ripped a bit of tortilla and dipped it into the yolk. This is what dinner conversation's like in your family, ain't it? Prax blinked. Mostly, yes. Why? What do you talk about? Amos chuckled. He seemed to be in a very good mood. There was a relaxed look about his shoulders, and something in the set of his jaw had changed. Prax remembered the previous night's conversation with the captain. 
You got laid, didn't you? Oh, hell yes, Amos said. But that's not the best part. It's not? Oh, it's a fucking good part, but there's nothing better in the world than getting a job the day after your ass gets canned. A pang of confusion touched Prax. Amos pulled his hand terminal out of his pocket, tapped it twice, and slid it across the table. The screen showed a red security border, and the name of the credit union Alex had been working with the night before. When he saw the balance, his eyes went wide. Is... is that... That's enough to keep the Rosy flying for a month, and we got it in seven hours, Amos said. You just tied yourself a team, Doc. I don't know, really? Not just that. Take a look at the messages you've got coming in. Captain made a pretty big splash back in the day, but your kiddo? All that shit that came down on Ganymede just got itself a face, and it's her. Prax pulled up his own terminal. The mailbox associated with the presentation had over five hundred video messages and thousands of texts. He began going through them. Men and women he didn't know, some of them in tears, offered up their prayers and anger and support. A belter with a wild mane of gray-black hair gibbered in patois so thick Prax could barely make it out. As near as he could tell, the man was offering to kill someone for him. Half an hour later... Prax's eggs had congealed. A woman from Ceres told him that she'd lost her daughter in a divorce and that she was sending him her month's chewing tobacco money. A group of food engineers on Luna had passed the hat and sent along what would have been a month's salary if Prax had still been a botanist. An old Martian man with skin the color of chocolate and powdered sugar hair gazed seriously into a camera halfway across the solar system and said he was with Prax. When the next message began, it looked just like the others before it. The man in the image was older, eighty, maybe ninety, with a fringe of white hair clinging to the back of his skull and a craggy face. There was something about his expression that caught Prax's attention, a hesitance. Dr. Mung, the man said. He had a slushy accent that reminded Prax of recordings of his own grandfather, I'm very sorry to hear of all you and your family have suffered, are suffering. The man licked his lips. The security video on your presentation. I believe I know the man in it. But his name isn't Strickland. Chapter 34 Holden According to the station directory, the Blauer Bloom was famous for two things. A drink called the Blue Meanie, and its large number of Golgo tables. The guidebook warned potential patrons that the station allowed the bar to serve only two Blue Meanies to each customer, due to the drink's fairly suicidal mixture of ethanol, caffeine, and methylphenidate, and, Holden guessed, some kind of blue food coloring. As he walked through the corridors of Tycho's leisure section, the guidebook began explaining the rules of Golgo to him. After a few moments of utter confusion, goals are said to be borrowed when the defense deflects the drive, he shut it off. There was very little chance he was going to be playing games, and a drink that removed your inhibitions and left you wired and full of energy would be redundant right now. The truth was, Holden had never felt better in his life. He'd messed a lot of things up over the last year. He'd driven his crew away from him. He'd aligned himself with a side he wasn't sure he agreed with in exchange for safety. He might have ruined the one healthy relationship he'd had in his life. He'd been driven by his fear to become someone else. Someone who handled fear by turning it into violence. Someone who Naomi didn't love who his crew didn't respect, who he himself didn't like much. The fear wasn't gone. It was still there, making his scalp crawl every time he thought about Ganymede and about what might be loose and growing there right now. But for the first time in a long time, he was aware of it and wasn't hiding from it. He had given himself permission to be afraid. It made all the difference. 
Holden heard the blower bloom several seconds before he saw it. It began as a barely audible rhythmic thumping, which gradually increased in volume and picked up an electronic wail and a woman's voice singing in mixed Hindi and Russian. By the time he reached the club's front door, the song had changed to two men in an alternating chant that sounded like an argument set to music. The electronic wail was replaced by angry guitars. The bass line changed not at all. Inside, the club was an all-out assault on the senses. A massive dance floor dominated the center space, and the dozens of bodies writhing on it were bathed in a constantly changing light show that shifted and flashed in time to the music. The music had been loud out in the corridor, but inside it became deafening. A long chrome bar was set against one wall, and half a dozen bartenders were frantically filling drink orders. A sign on the back wall read, Golgo, and had an arrow pointing down a long hallway. Holden followed it, the music fading with each step so that by the time he reached the back room with the game tables, it was back to being muted bass lines. Naomi was at one of the tables with her friend Sam, the engineer, and a cluster of other belters. Her hair was pulled back with a red elastic band wide enough to be decorative. She'd switched out her jumpsuit for a pair of gray, tailored slacks he hadn't known she owned, and a yellow blouse that made her caramel-colored skin seem darker. Holden had to stop for a moment. She smiled at someone who wasn't him, and his chest went tight. As he approached, Sam threw a small metal ball at the table. The group at the other end reacted with sudden, violent movements. He couldn't see exactly what was happening from where he stood, but the slumped shoulders and half-hearted curses coming from the second group led Holden to believe that Sam had done something good for her team. Sam spun around and threw up her hand. The group at her end of the table, which included Naomi, took turns slapping her palm. Sam saw him first and said something he couldn't hear. Naomi turned around and gave him a speculative look that stopped him in his tracks. She didn't smile, and she didn't frown. He raised his palms in what he hoped was an I-didn't-come-to-fight gesture. For a moment, they stood facing each other across the noisy room. Jesus, he thought. How did I let it come to this? Naomi nodded at him and pointed at a table in one corner of the room. He sat down and ordered himself a drink. Not one of the blue liver killers the bar was famous for, just a cheap belt-produced scotch. He'd grown to, if not appreciate, at least tolerate the faint mold aftertaste it always had. Naomi said goodbye to the rest of her team for a few minutes and then walked over. It wasn't a casual stroll, but it wasn't the gait of someone going to a dreaded meeting, either. Can I order you something? Holden asked as he sat. Sure, I'll take a grapefruit martini, she said. While Holden entered the order on the table, she looked him over with a mysterious half-smile that turned his belly to liquid. Okay, he said, authorizing his terminal to open a bar tab and pay for the drinks. One hideous martini on its way. Naomi laughed. Hideous? A near-fatal case of scurvy being the only reason I can imagine drinking something with grapefruit juice in it. She laughed again, untying at least one of the knots in Holden's gut, and they sat together in companionable silence until the drinks arrived. She took a small sip and smacked her lips in appreciation, then said, Okay, spill. Holden took a much longer drink, nearly finishing off the small glass of scotch in a single gulp, trying to convince himself that the spreading warmth in his belly could stand in for courage. He thought, I didn't feel comfortable with where we left things, and I thought that we should talk, kind of process this together. He cleared his throat. I fucked everything up, he said. I've treated my friends badly, worse than badly. You were absolutely right to do what you did. I couldn't hear what you were saying at the time, but you were right to say it. 
Naomi took another drink of her martini, then casually reached up and pulled out the elastic band holding her masses of black curls behind her head. Her hair fell down around her face in a tangle, making Holden think of ivy-covered stone walls. He realized that for as long as he'd known her, Naomi had always let her hair down in emotional situations. She hid behind it, not literally, but because it was her best feature. The eye was just naturally drawn to its glossy black curls. A distraction technique. It made her suddenly seem very human, as vulnerable and lost as he was. Holden felt a rush of affection for her that must have showed on his face, because she looked at him and then blushed. What is this, Jim? An apology, he said. An admission that you were right and that I was turning into my own screwed-up version of Miller? Those, at the very least. Hopefully opening the dialogue to reconciliation, if I'm lucky. I'm glad, Naomi said. I'm glad you're figuring that out. But I've been saying this for months now, and you— Wait, Holden said. He could feel her pulling back from him, not letting herself believe. All he had left to offer her— was absolute truth. So he did. I couldn't hear you, because I've been terrified, and I've been a coward. Fear doesn't make you a coward. No, he said, of course it doesn't. But refusing to face up to it, to not admit to you how I felt, to not let you and Alex and Amos help me, that was cowardice. And it may have cost me you, the crew's loyalty, everything I really care about. It made me keep a bad job a lot longer than I should have because the job was safe. A small knot of the Golgo players began drifting toward their table, and Holden was gratified when he saw Naomi wave them off. It meant she wanted to keep talking. That was a start. Tell me, she said, where are you going from here? I have no idea, Holden replied with a grin and that's the best feeling I've had in ages. But no matter what happens next, I need you there. When she started to protest, Holden quickly put up a hand to stop her and said, No, I don't mean like that. I'd love to win you back, but I'm perfectly okay with the idea that it might take some time or never happen at all. I mean the Rossi needs you back. The crew needs you there. I don't want to leave her. Naomi said with a shy smile. She's your home, Holden said. Always will be as long as you want it. And that's true no matter what happens between us. Naomi began wrapping one thick strand of hair around her finger and drank off the last of her drink. Holden pointed at the table menu, but she shook her hand at him. This is because you confronted Fred, right? Yeah, partly, Holden said. I was standing in his office feeling terrified and realizing I'd been afraid for a long, long time. I've screwed things up with him, too. Some of that's probably his fault. He's a true believer, and those are bad people to climb into bed with. But it's mostly still mine. Did you quit? He fired me, but I was probably going to quit. So, Naomi said, you've lost us our paying gig and our patron. I guess I feel a little flattered that the part you're trying to patch up is me. You, Holden said, are the only part I really care about fixing. You know what happens now, right? You move back onto the ship? Naomi just smiled the comment away. Now we pay for our own repairs. If we fire a torpedo, we have to find someone to sell us a new one. We pay for water, air, docking fees, food, and medical supplies for our very expensive automated sick bay. Have a plan for that? Nope, Holden said. But I have to say, for some reason, it feels great. And when the euphoria passes? I'll make a plan. Her smile grew reflective, and she tugged on her lock of hair. I'm not ready to move back to the ship right now, Naomi said, reaching across the table to take his hand in hers. But by the time the Rossi is patched up, I'll need my cabin back. 
I'll move the rest of my stuff out immediately. Jim, she said, squeezing his fingers once before letting go. I love you, and we're not okay yet. But this is a good start. And yes, Holden thought. It really was. Holden woke up in his old cabin on the Rocinante feeling better than he had in months. He climbed out of his bunk and wandered naked through the ship to the head. He took an hour-long shower in water he actually had to pay for now, heated by electricity the dock would be charging him for by the kilowatt hour. He walked back to his bunk, drying skin made pink by the almost scalding water as he went. He made and ate a large breakfast and drank five cups of coffee while catching up on the technical reports on the Rosie's repairs, until he was sure he understood everything about what had been done. Holden had switched to reading a column about the state of Mars-Earth relations by a political humorist when his terminal buzzed at him, and a call came through from Amos. Hey, Cap, he said, his big face filling the small screen. You coming over to the station today, or should we come meet you on the Rosie? Let's meet here, Holden replied. Sam and her team will be working today, and I want to keep an eye on things. See you in a few, then, Amos said and killed the connection. Holden tried to finish the humor column, but kept getting distracted and having to read the same passage over again. He finally gave up and cleaned the galley for a while, then set the coffee maker to brew a fresh pot for Amos and the work crew when they arrived. The machine was gurgling happily to itself, like a content infant, when the deck hatch clanged open and Amos and Prax climbed down the crew ladder and into the galley. Cap, Amos said, dropping into a chair with a thump. Prax followed him into the room but didn't sit. Holden grabbed mugs and pulled two more cups of coffee, then set them on the table. What's the news? he said. Amos answered with a shit-eating grin and spun his terminal across the table to Holden. When Holden looked at it, it was displaying the account information for Prax's Save May fund. It had just over half a million U.N. dollars in it. Holden whistled and slumped into a chair. Jesus grinned, Amos. I'd hoped we might, but never this. Yeah. It was a little under 300k this morning. It's gone up another 200k just over the last three hours. Seems like everyone following the Ganymede shit on the news has made little May the poster child for the tragedy. Is this enough? Prax cut in, anxiety in his voice. Oh, hell yes, Holden said with a laugh. Way more than enough. This will fund our rescue mission just fine. Also, we got a clue, Amos said pausing dramatically to sip his coffee. About May? Yep, Amos said, adding a little more sugar to his cup. Prax, send him that message you got. Holden watched the message three times, grinning wider with each viewing. The security video on your presentation. I believe I know the man in it, the elderly gentleman on the screen was saying. But his name isn't Strickland. When I worked with him at Ceres Mining and Tech University, his name was Marion. Carlos Marion. That, Holden said after his final viewing, is what my old buddy Detective Miller might have called a lead. What now, Chief? Amos asked. I think I need to make a phone call. Okay. The Doc and I will get out of your hair and watch his money roll in. They left together. Holden waiting until the deck hatch slammed behind them to send a connection request to the switchboard at Ceres M&T. The lag was running about fifteen minutes with Tycho's current location, so he settled back and played a simple puzzle game on his terminal that left his mind free to think and plan. If they knew who Strickland had been before he was Strickland, they might be able to trace his career history. And somewhere along the way, He'd stopped being a guy named Carlos who worked at a tech school and became a guy named Strickland who stole little kids. Knowing why would be a good start to learning where he might be now. Almost forty minutes after sending out the request, he received a reply. He was a little surprised to see the elderly man from the video message. He hadn't expected to connect on his first try. 
Hello, the man said. I'm Dr. Moynihan. I've been expecting your message. I assume you want to know the details about Dr. Marion. To make a long story short, he and I worked together at the CMTU Biosciences Lab. He was working on biological development constraint systems. He was never good at playing the university game, didn't make many allies while he was here, so when he crossed some ethical gray areas, they were only too happy to run him out of town. I don't know the details on that. I wasn't his department head. Let me know if you need anything else. Holden watched the message twice, taking notes and cursing the fifteen-minute lag. When he was ready, he sent a reply back. Thank you so much for the help, Dr. Moynihan. We really appreciate it. I don't suppose you know what happened after he was kicked out of the university, do you? Did he go to another institution? Take a corporate job? Anything? He hit send and sat back to wait again. He tried the puzzle game, but got annoyed and turned it off. Instead, he pulled up the Tycho public entertainment feed and watched a children's cartoon that was frantic and loud enough to distract him. When his terminal buzzed with the incoming message, he almost knocked it off the table in his haste to start the video. Actually, Dr. Moynihan said, scratching at the gray stubble on his chin while he spoke, he never even made it in front of the ethics review. Quit the day before. Made a lot of fuss walking through the lab and yelling that we weren't going to be able to push him around anymore. That he had a big-wig corporate job with all the funding and resources he wanted. Called us small-minded pencil pushers, stagnating in a quagmire of petty ethical constraints. Can't remember the name of the company he was going to work for, though. Holden hit pause and felt a chill go down his spine stagnating in a quagmire of petty ethical constraints. He didn't need Moynihan to tell him which company would snatch a man like that up. He'd heard almost those exact words spoken by Antony Dresden, the architect of the Eros Project, that had killed a million and a half people as part of a grand biology experiment. Carlos Marion had gone to work for Protogen and disappeared. He'd come back as Strickland, abductor of small children. And, Holden thought, the murderer, too. Chapter 35 Avasarala On the screen, the young man laughed as he had laughed twenty-five seconds earlier on Earth. It was the level of lag Avasarala hated the most. Too much for the conversation to feel anything like normal, but not quite enough to make it impossible. Everything she did took too long. Every reading of reaction and nuance crippled by the effort to guess what exactly in her words and expression ten seconds before had elicited it. Only you, he said, could take another Earth-Mars war, turn it into a private cruise, and then seem pissed off about it. Anyone in my office would give their left testicle to go with you. Next time I'll take up a collection. But, as far as an accurate military inventory, he said, twenty-five seconds ago, there are reports in place, but they're not as good as I'd like. Because it's you, I've got a couple of my interns building search parameters. My impression is that the research budget is about a tenth of the money going to actual research. With your clearances, I have rights to look at it, but these Navy guys are pretty good at obscuring things. I think you'll find... His expression clouded. A collection? Forget it, you are saying? She waited fifty seconds, resenting each individually. I don't know that we'll be able to get a definitive answer, the young man said. We might get lucky, but if it's something they want to hide, they can probably hide it especially since they'll know you're looking for it, and what I asked you to look for, Avasarala thought. Even if the income stream between Mao Kwiatkowski, Nguyen, and Ehrenreich was in all the budgets right now, by the time Avasarala's allies looked, it would be hidden. All she could do was keep pushing on as many fronts as she could devise, and hope that they fucked up. Three more days of information requests and queries, 
and she could ask for traffic analysis. She couldn't know exactly what information they were hiding, but if she could find out what kinds and categories of data they were keeping away from her, that would tell her something. Something, but not much. Do what you can, she said. I'll luxuriate out here in the middle of nowhere. Get back to me. She didn't wait fifty seconds for a round of etiquette and farewell. Life was too short for that shit. Her private quarters on the Guanxi Yin were gorgeous. The bed and couch matched the deep carpet in tones of gold and green that should have clashed but didn't. The light was the best approximation of mid-morning sunlight that she'd ever seen, and the air recyclers were scented to give everything just a note of turned earth and fresh-cut grass. Only the low-thrust gravity spoiled the illusion of being in a private country club somewhere in the green belt of South Asia. The low gravity and the goddamn lag. She hated low gravity. Even if the acceleration were perfectly smooth and the yacht never had to shift or move to avoid debris, her guts were used to a full G pulling things down. She hadn't digested anything well since she'd come on board, and she always felt short of breath. Her system chimed. A new report from Venus. She popped it open. The preliminary analysis of the wreckage from the Arbogast was underway. There was some ionizing in the metal that was apparently consistent with someone's theory of how the protomolecule functioned. It was the first time a prediction had been confirmed, the first tiny toehold toward a genuine understanding of what was happening on Venus. There was an exact timing of the three energy spikes. There was a spectral analysis of the upper atmosphere of Venus that showed more elemental nitrogen than expected. Avasarala felt her eyes glazing over. The truth was, she didn't care. She should. It was important, possibly more important than anything else that was happening. But just like Aaron Wright and Nguyen and all the others, she was caught up in this smaller human struggle of war and influence and the tribal division between Earth and Mars. The outer planets, too, if you took them seriously. Hell, at this point, she was more worried about Bobby and Kotyar than she was about Venus. Kotiar was a good man, and his disapproval left her feeling defensive and pissed off. And Bobby looked like she was about to crack. And why not? The woman had watched her friends die around her, had been stripped of her context, and was now working for her traditional enemy. The Marine was tough in more ways than one, and having someone on the team with no allegiance or ties to anyone on Earth was a real benefit, especially after fucking Sorin. She leaned back in her chair, unnerved by how different it felt when she weighed so little. Sorin still smarted. Not the betrayal itself. Betrayal was an occupational hazard. If she started getting her feelings hurt by that, she really should retire. No, it was that she hadn't seen it. She'd let herself have a blind spot, and Aaron Wright had known how to use it, how to disenfranchise her. She hated being outplayed. And more than that, she hated that her failure was going to mean more war, more violence, more children dying. That was the price for screwing up. More dead children. So she wouldn't screw up any more. She could practically see Arjun, the gentle sorrow in his eyes. It isn't all your responsibility, he would say. It's everyone's fucking responsibility, she said out loud. But I'm the one who's taking it seriously. She smiled. Let Mao's monitors and spies make sense of that. She let herself imagine them searching her room for some other transmission device, trying to find who she'd been speaking to. Or they just think the old lady was losing her beans. Let him wonder. She closed out the Venus report. Another message had arrived while she was in her reverie, flagged as an issue she'd requested follow-up on. When she read the intelligence summary, her eyebrows rose. I'm James Holden, and I'm here to ask for your help. Avasarala watched Bobby watching the screen. 
She looked exhausted and restless both. Her eyes weren't bloodshot so much as dry-looking, like bearings without enough grease. If she'd needed an example to demonstrate the difference between sleepy and tired, it would have been the Marine. So he got out then, Bobby said. Him and his pet botanist and the whole damn crew, Avasarada said. So now we have one story about what they were doing on Ganymede that got your boys and ours so excited they started shooting each other. Bobby looked up at her. Do you think it's true? What is truth? Avasarada said. I think Holden has a long history of blabbing whatever he knows or thinks he knows all over creation. True or not, he believes it. And the part about the protomolecule? I mean, he just told everyone that the protomolecule is loose on Ganymede. He did? People have got to be reacting to that, right? Avasarala flipped to the intelligence summary, then to feeds of the riots on Ganymede. Thin, frightened people, exhausted by tragedy and war and fueled by panic. She could tell that the security forces arrayed against them were trying to be gentle. These weren't thugs enjoying the use of force. These were orderlies, trying to keep the frail and dying from hurting themselves and each other, walking the line between necessary violence and ineffectiveness. Fifty dead so far, Avasarala said. That's the estimate, anyway. That place is so ass-fucked right now, they might have been going to die of sickness and malnutrition anyway, but they died of this instead. I went to that restaurant, Bobby said. Avasarala frowned, trying to make it into a metaphor for something. Bobby pointed at the screen. The one they're dying in front of? I ate there just after I arrived at the deployment. They had good sausage. Sorry, Avasarala said. But the Marine only shook her head. So, that cat's out of the bag, she said. Maybe, Avasarala said. Maybe not. James Holden just told the whole system that the protomolecules on Ganymede. In what universe is that maybe not? Avasarala pulled up a mainstream news feed, checked the flags, and pulled the one with the listed expert she wanted. The data buffered for a few seconds while she lifted her finger for patience. Totally irresponsible, a grave-cheeked man in a lab coat and koofy cap said. The contempt in his voice could have peeled paint. The interviewer appeared beside him. She was maybe twenty years old, with hair cut short and straight, and a dark suit that said she was a serious journalist. So you're saying the protomolecule isn't involved? It isn't. The images James Holden and his little group are sending have nothing to do with the protomolecule. That webbing is what happens when you have a binding agent leak. It happens all the time. So there isn't any reason to panic. Alice, the expert said, turning his condescension to the interviewer, within a few days of exposure, Eros was a living horror show. In the time since hostilities opened, Ganymede hasn't shown one sign of a live infection, not one. But he has a scientist with him, the botanist Dr. Praxidiki Mung, whose daughter... I don't know this Mung fellow, but playing with a few soybeans makes him as much an expert on the protomolecule as it makes him a brain surgeon. I'm very sorry, of course, about his missing daughter, but no, if the protomolecule were on Ganymede, we'd have known long ago. This panic is over literally nothing. He can go on like that for hours, Avasarala said, shutting down the screen. And we have dozens like him. Mars is going to be doing the same thing, saturating the news feeds with a counter-story. Impressive, Bobby said, pushing herself back from the desk. It keeps people calm. That's the important thing. Holden thinks he's a hero. Power to the people. Information wants to be free, blah, blah, blah. But he's a fucking moron. He's on his own ship. Avasarala crossed her arms. What's your point? He's on his own ship, and we're not. So we're all fucking morons, Avasarala said. Fine. Bobby stood up and started pacing the room. She turned well before she reached the wall. The woman was used to pacing in smaller quarters. What do you want me to do about it? 
Bobby asked. Nothing, Avasarla said. What the hell could you do about it? You're stuck out here with me. I can hardly do anything, and I've got friends in high places. You've got nothing. I only wanted to talk to someone I didn't have to wait two minutes to let interrupt me. She'd taken it too far. Bobby's expression eased, went calm and closed and distant. She was shutting down. Avasarala lowered herself to the edge of the bed. That wasn't fair, Avasarala said. If you say so. I fucking say so. The Marine tilted her head. Was that an apology? As close to one as I'm giving right now. Something shifted in Avasarala's mind. Not about Venus or James Holden and his poor lost girl appeal, or even Aaron Wright. It had to do with Bobby and her pacing and her sleeplessness. Then she got it, and laughed once mirthlessly. Bobby crossed her arms, her steady silence a question. It isn't funny, Avasarla said. Try me. You remind me of my daughter. Yeah? She'd pissed Bobby off, and now she was going to have to explain herself. The air recyclers hummed to themselves. Something far off in the bowels of the yacht groaned like they were on an ancient sailing ship made from timber and tar. My son died when he was fifteen, Avasarla said. Skiing. Did I tell you this? He was on a slope that he'd run twenty, thirty times before. He knew it, but something happened and he ran into a tree. They guessed he was going something like sixty kilometers an hour when he hit. Some people survive an impact like that, but not him. For a moment, she was there again, in the house with the medic on the screen giving her the news. She could still smell the incense Arjun had been burning at the time. She could still hear the raindrops against the window, tapping like fingertips. It was the worst memory she had, and it was perfect and clear. She took a long, deep, shuddering breath. I almost got divorced three times in the next six months. Arjun was a saint, but saints have their limits. We fought about anything, about nothing. Each of us blamed ourselves for not saving Charanpal, and we resented it when the other one tried to take some responsibility. And so, of course, my daughter suffered the worst. There was a night when we were out at something, Arjun and I. We got home late, and we'd been fighting. Ashanti was in the kitchen, washing dishes, washing clean dishes by hand, scrubbing them with a cloth in this terrible abrasive cleanser. Her fingers were bleeding, but she didn't seem to notice, you know. I tried to stop her, pull her away, but she started screaming, and she wouldn't be quiet until I let her resume her washing. I was so angry I couldn't see. I hated my daughter. For that moment, I hated her. And I remind you of her how, exactly. Avasarala gestured to the room, its bed with real linen sheets, the textured paper on the walls, the scented air. You can't compromise. You can't see things the way I tell you that they are. And when I try and make you... You go away. Is that what you want? Bobby said. Her voice was crawling up to a higher energy level. It was anger, but it brought her back to being present. You want me to agree with whatever you say, and if I don't, you're going to hate me for it? Of course I want you to call me on my bullshit. That's what I pay you for. I'm only going to hate you for the moment, Avasarala said. I love my daughter very much. I'm sure you do, ma'am. I'm not her. Avasarala sighed. I didn't call you in here and show you all of this because I was tired of the lag. I'm worried. Fuck it, I'm scared. About what? You want a list? Bobby actually smiled. Avasarala felt herself smiling back. I'm scared that I've been outplayed already, she said. I'm afraid that I won't be able to stop the hawks and their cabal from using their pretty new toys. And 
and I'm afraid that I might be wrong. What happens, Bobby? What happens if whatever the hell that is on Venus rises up and finds us as divided and screwed up and ineffective as we are right now? I don't know. Avasarla's terminal chimed. She glanced at the new message. A note from Admiral Souther. Avasarla had sent him an utterly innocuous note about having lunch when they both got back to Earth, then coded it for high security clearance with a private encryption schema. It would take her handlers a couple of hours at least to crack it. She tabbed it open. The reply was plain text. Love to. The eagle lands at midnight. Petting zoos are illegal in Rome. Avasarla laughed. It was real pleasure this time. Bobby loomed up over her shoulder and Avasarla turned the screen so that the big marine could peer down at it. What's that mean? Avasarala motioned her down close enough that her lips were almost against Bobby's ear. At that intimate distance, the big woman smelled of clean sweat and the cucumber-scented emollient that was in all Mao's guest quarters. Nothing, Avasarala whispered. He's just following my lead, but they'll chew their livers out guessing at it. Bobby stood up. Her expression of incredulity was eloquent. This really is how government works, isn't it? Welcome to the monkey house, Avasarla said. I think I might go get drunk, and I'll get back to work. At the doorway, Bobby paused. She looked small in the wide frame. The door frame on a spaceship that left Roberta Draper looking small. There was nothing about the yacht that wasn't tastefully obscene. So what happened with her? Who? Your daughter. Avasarala closed her terminal. Arjun sang to her until she stopped. It took about three hours. He sat on the counter and went through all the songs we'd sung to them when they were little. Eventually Ashanti let him lead her to her room and tuck her into bed. You hated him too, didn't you? For being able to help her when you couldn't. You're catching on, Sergeant. Bobby licked her lips. I want to hurt someone, she said. I'm afraid if it's not them, it's going to wind up being me. We all grieve in our own ways, Avasarla said. For what it's worth, you'll never kill enough people to keep your platoon from dying. No more than I can save enough people that one of them will be Cherenpal. For a long moment... Bobby weighed the words. Avasarala could almost hear the woman's mind turning the ideas one way and then another. Saren had been an idiot to underestimate this woman. But Saren had been an idiot in a lot of ways. When at length she spoke, her voice was light and conversational, as if her words weren't profound. No harm trying, though. It's what we do, Avasarala said. The Marine nodded curtly. For a moment, Avasarala thought she might be going to salute, but instead she lumbered out toward the complimentary bar in the wide common area. There was a fountain out there with sprays of water drifting down fake bronze sculptures of horses and underdressed women. If that didn't make someone want a stiff drink of something, then nothing would. Avasarala thumbed on the video feed again. This is James Holden. She turned it off again. At least you lost that fucking beard, she said to no one. Chapter 36 Prax Prax remembered his first epiphany, or possibly he thought the one he remembered as his first. In the absence of further evidence, he went with it. He'd been in second form, just seventeen, and in the middle of a genetic engineering lab. Sitting there among the steel tables and micro-centrifuges, he'd struggled with why exactly his results were so badly off. He'd rechecked his calculations, read through his lab notes. The error was more than sloppy technique could explain, and his technique wasn't even sloppy. And then he'd noticed that one of the reagents was chiral. 
and he knew what had happened. He hadn't figured anything wrong, but he had assumed that the reagent was taken from a natural source rather than generated de novo. Instead of being uniformly left-handed, it had been a mix of chiralities, half of them inactive. The insight had left him grinning from ear to ear. It had been a failure, but it was a failure he understood, and that made it a victory. The only thing he regretted was that seeing what should have been clear had taken him so long. The four days since he had sent the broadcast, he'd hardly slept. Instead, he'd read through the comments and messages pouring in with the donations, responding to a few, asking questions of people all over the system whom he didn't know. The goodwill and generosity pouring out to him was intoxicating. For two days he hadn't slept, borne up on the euphoria of feeling effective. When he had slept, he'd dreamed of finding May. When the answer came, he only wished he'd found it before. The time they had, they could have taken her anywhere, Doc, Amos said. I mean, not to bust your balls or nothing. They could, Prax said. They could take her anywhere as long as they had a supply of her medications. But she's not the limiting factor. The question is where they were coming from. Prax had called the meeting without a clear idea of where to have it. The crew of the Rossi was small, but Amos's rooms were smaller. He'd considered the galley of the ship, but there were still technicians finishing the repairs, and Prax wanted privacy. In the end, he'd checked the incoming stream of contributions from Holden's broadcast and taken enough to rent a room from a station club. Now they were in a private lounge. Outside the wall screen window, the great construction Waldo shifted by tiny degrees, attitude rockets flaring and going still in patterns as complex as language. Another thing Prax had never thought about before coming here. The station Waldos had to fire attitude rockets to keep their movements from shifting the station they were attached to. Everything, everywhere, a dance of tiny movements and the ripples they made. Inside the room, the music that floated between the wide tables and crash gel chairs was soft and lyrical, the singer's voice deep and soothing. From? Alex said. I thought they were from Ganymede. The lab on Ganymede wasn't equipped to deal with serious research, Prax said. And they arranged things so that Ganymede would turn into a war zone. That'd be a bad idea if they were doing their primary work in the middle of it. That was a field lab. I try not to shit where I eat, Amos said, agreeing. You live in a spaceship, Holden said. I don't shit in the galley, though. Fair point. Anyway, Prax said, we can safely assume they were working from a better protected base. And that base has to be somewhere in the Jovian system, somewhere nearby. You lost me again, Holden said. Why does it need to be close? Transport time. May can go anywhere if there's a good supply of medications, but she's more robust than the... the things. Holden raised his hand like a schoolboy asking a question. Okay, I could be hearing you wrong, but did you just say that the thing that ripped its way into my ship threw a 500-kilo storage pallet at me and almost chewed a path straight to the reactor core is more delicate than a four-year-old girl with no immune system? Prax nodded. A stab of horror and grief went through him. She wasn't four anymore. May's birthday had been the month before, and he'd missed it. She was five. But grief and horror were old companions by now. He pushed the thought aside. I'll be clearer, he said. May's body isn't fighting its situation. That's her disease, if you think about it. There's a whole array of things that happen in normal bodies that don't happen in hers. Now, you take one of the things, one of the creatures, like the one from the ship. That bastard was pretty active, Amos said. No. Prax said. I mean, yes, but no. I mean active on a biochemical level. 
If Strickland or Marion or whoever is using the protomolecule to re-engineer a human body, they're taking one complex system and overlaying another one. We know it's unstable. Okay, Naomi said. She was sitting beside Amos and across the table from Holden. How do we know that? Prax frowned. When he'd practiced making the presentation, he hadn't expected so many questions. The things he'd thought were obvious from the start hadn't even occurred to the others. This is why he hadn't gone in for teaching. Looking at their faces now, he saw blank confusion. All right, he said. Let me take it from the top. There was something on Ganymede that started the war. There was also a secret lab staffed with people who, at the very least, knew about the attack before it happened. Check, Alex said. Okay, Prax said. In the lab, we had signs of the protomolecule. A dead boy and a bunch of people getting ready to leave. And when we got there, we only had to fight halfway in. After that, something else was going ahead of us and killing everyone. Hey, Amos said. You think that was the same fucker that got into the Rossi? Prax stopped the word obviously just before it fell from his lips. Probably, he said instead. And it seems likely that the original attack involved more like that one. So two got loose? Naomi asked. But he could see that she already sensed the problem with that. No, because they knew it was going to happen. One got loose when Amos threw that grenade back at them. One was released intentionally. But that doesn't matter. What matters is that they're using the protomolecule to remake human bodies, and they aren't able to control it with perfect fidelity. The programming they're putting in fails. Prax nodded, as if by doing it he could will them to follow his chain of reasoning. Holden shook his head, paused, and then nodded. The bomb, he said. The bomb, Prax agreed. Even when they didn't know that the second thing was going to get loose, they'd outfitted it with a powerful incendiary explosive device. Ah, Alex said. I get it. You figure they knew it was going to go off the rails eventually, so they wired it to blow if it got out of hand. In the depths of space, a construction welder streaked across the hull of the half-built ship, the light of its flare casting a sudden, sharp light across the pilot's eager face. Yes, Prax said. But it could also be an ancillary weapon, or a payload that the thing was supposed to deliver. I think it's a failsafe. It probably is, but it could be any number of other things. Okay, but it left it behind. Alex said. Given time, it ejected the bomb, Prax said. You see, it chose to reconfigure itself to remove the payload. It didn't place it to destroy the Rossi, even though it could have. It didn't deliver it to a preset target. It just decided to pop it loose. And it knew to do that. It's smart enough to recognize threat, Prax said. I don't know the mechanism yet. It could be cognitive or networked or some kind of modified immune response. Okay, Prax, so if the protomolecule can eventually get out of whatever constraints they're putting on it and go rogue, where does that get us? Naomi asked. Square one, Prax thought, and launched in on the information he'd intended to give them in the first place. It means that wherever the main lab is the place they didn't release one of those things on, it has to be close enough to Ganymede to get it there before it slipped its leash. I don't know how long that is, but I'm betting they don't either. So closer is better. A Jovian moon or a secret station, Holden said. You can't have a secret station in the Jovian system, Alex said. There's too much traffic. Someone would see something. Shit, it's where most of the extrasolar astronomy was going on until we got out to Uranus. Put something close, the observatories are going to get pissed because it's stinking up their pictures, right? Naomi tapped her fingers against the tabletop. 
the sound like the ticking of condensate falling inside sheet metal vents. Well, the obvious choice is Europa, she said. It's Io, Prax said, impatience slipping into his voice. I used some of the money to get a tariff search on the kinds of aralamines and nitroarenes that you use for mutagenetic research. He paused. It's all right I did that, isn't it? Spent the money. That's what it's there for, Holden said. Okay, so mutagens that only start functioning after you activate them are very tightly controlled, since you can use them for bioweapons research. But if you're trying to work with that kind of biological cascade and constraint systems, you'd need them. Most of the supplies went to Ganymede, but there was a steady stream to Europa, too. And when I looked at that, I couldn't find a final receiver listed, because they shipped back out of Europa about two hours after they landed. Bound for Io, Holden said. It didn't list a location, but the shipping containers for them have to follow Earth and Mars safety specifications. Very expensive. And the shipping containers from the Europa shipment were returned to the manufacturer for credit on a transport bound from Io. Prax took a breath. It had been like pulling teeth, but he was pretty sure he'd made all the points he needed to for the evidence to be, if not conclusive, at least powerfully suggestive. So, Amos said, drawing the word out to almost three syllables, the bad guys are probably on Io. Yes, Prax said. Well, shit, Doc, could have just said so. The thrust gravity was a full G but without the subtle Coriolis of Tycho Station. Prax sat in his bunk, bent over his hand terminal. There had been times on the journey to Tycho Station when being half-starved and sick at heart were the only things that distracted him. Nothing physical had changed. The walls were still narrow and close. The air recycler still clicked and hummed. Only now, rather than feeling isolated, Prax felt he was in the center of a vast network of people, all bent toward the same end that he was. Mr. Mung, I saw the report on you, and my heart and prayers are with you. I'm sorry I can't send money because I'm on basic, but I have included the report in my church newsletter. I hope you can find your daughter safe and healthy. Prax had composed a form letter for responding to all the general well-wishers, and he'd considered trying to find a filter that could identify those messages and reply automatically with the canned response. He held off, because he wasn't sure how well he could define the conditions set, and he didn't want anyone to feel that their sentiments were being taken for granted. After all, he had no duties on the Rosinante. I'm writing you because I may have information that will help with the quest to reclaim your daughter. Since I was very young... I have had powerful premonitions in my dreams, and three days before I saw James Holden's article about you and your daughter, I saw her in a dream. She was on Luna, in a very small place without light, and she was scared. I tried to comfort her, but I feel sure now that you are meant to find her on Luna, or in a nearby orbit. Prax didn't respond to everything, of course. The journey to Io wouldn't take much more time than the one to Tycho had. Probably less, since they were unlikely to have the chaos of a stowaway protomolecule construct blowing out the cargo bay this time. If Prax thought about it too long, it made his palm itch. He knew where she was, or where she had been. Every hour was bringing him closer, and every message flowing into his charitable account gave him a little more power. Someone else who might know where Carlos Marion was, and what he was doing. There were a few he'd set up conversations with, mostly video conversations sent back and forth. He'd spoken with a security broker based out of Ceres Station, who'd run some of his tariff searches and seemed like a genuinely nice man. He'd exchanged a few video recordings with a grief counselor on Mars before he started to get an uncomfortable feeling that she was hitting on him. An entire school of children, at least a hundred of them, had sent him a recording of them singing a song in mixed Spanish and French in honor of May and her return. 
Intellectually, he knew that nothing had changed. The chances were still very good that May was dead, or at least that he would never see her again. But to have so many people, and in such a steady stream, telling him that it would be all right, that they hoped it would be all right, that they were pulling for him, made despair less possible. It was probably something like a group reinforcement effect. It was something common to some species of crop plant. An ill or suffering plant could be moved into a community of well members of the species and, through proximity, improve, even if soil and water were supplied separately. Yes, it was chemically mediated, but humans were social animals, and a woman smiling up from the screen, her eyes seeming to look deeply into your own and saying what you wanted to believe, was almost impossible to wholly disbelieve. It was selfish, and he knew that, but it was also addictive. He'd stopped paying attention to the donations that were coming in once he knew there was enough to fund the ship as far as Io. Holden had given him an expense report and a detailed spreadsheet of costs, but Prax didn't think Holden would cheat him, so he'd barely glanced at anything other than the total at the bottom. Once there was enough money, he'd stopped caring about money. It was the commentary that took his time and attention. He heard Alex and Amos in the galley, their voices calm and conversational. It reminded him of living in the group housing at university. The awareness of other voices, other presences, and the comfort that came from those familiar sounds. It wasn't that different from reading the comment threads. I lost my son four years ago, and I still can't imagine what you are going through right now. I wish there was more I could do. He had the list down to only a few dozen. It was mid-afternoon in the arbitrary world of ship time, but he was powerfully sleepy. He debated leaving the remaining messages until after a nap, and decided to read through them without requiring himself to respond to each one. Alex laughed. Amos joined him. Prax opened the fifth message. You are a sick, sick, sick motherfucker. And if I ever see you, I swear to God, I will kill you myself. People like you should be raped to death, just so you know what it feels like. Prax tried to catch his breath. The sudden ache in his body was just like the aftermath of being punched in the solar plexus. He deleted the message. Another came in. And then three more. And then a dozen. With a sense of dread, Prax opened one of the new ones. I hope you die. I don't understand, Prax said to the terminal. The vitriol was sudden and constant and utterly inexplicable. At least, it was until he opened one of the messages that had the link to a public news feed. Prax put in a request, and five minutes later his screen went blank. The logo of one of the big, earth-based news aggregators glowed briefly in blue, and the title of the feed series, The Raw Feed, appeared. When the logo faded out, Nicola was looking out at him. Prax reached for the controls part of his mind insisting that he'd somehow slipped into his private messages, even as the rest of him knew better. Nicola licked her lips, looked away, then back at the camera. She looked tired, exhausted. My name's Nicola Molko. I used to be married to Praxitiki Mung, the man who put out a call for help finding our daughter. My daughter, May. A tear dripped down her cheek and she didn't wipe it away. What I want you to know, what no one knows, is that Praxitiki Mung is a monster of a human being. Ever since I got away from him, I've been trying to get May back. I thought his abuse of me was between us. I didn't think he'd hurt her. But information has come back to me from friends who stayed on Ganymede after I left that... Nicola, Prax said, don't. Don't do this. Praxitiki Mung is a violent and dangerous man, Nicola said. As May's mother, I believe she has been emotionally, physically, and sexually abused by him since I left, and that her alleged disappearance during the troubles on Ganymede 
are to hide the fact that he's finally killed her. The tears were flowing freely down Nicola's cheeks now, but her voice and eyes were dead as last week's fish. I don't blame anyone but myself, she said. I should never have left when I couldn't get my little girl away too. Chapter 37 of Asarala I don't blame anyone but myself, the teary-eyed woman said, and Avasarala stopped the feed, sitting back in her chair. Her heart was beating faster than usual, and she could feel thoughts swimming just under the ice of her conscious mind. She felt like someone could press an ear to her skull and listen to her brain humming. Bobby was sitting on the four-poster. She made the thing look small, which was impressive in itself. She had one leg tucked up under her and a pack of real playing cards laid out in formation on the crisp golden-green bedspread. The game of solitaire was forgotten, though. The Martian's gaze was on her, and Avasarala felt a slow grin pulling at her lips. Well, I'll be fucked, she said. They're scared of him. Who's scared of who? Aaron Wright is moving against Holden and this Mung bastard, whoever he is. They actually forced him to take action. I couldn't get that out of him. You don't think the botanist was diddling his kid? Might have been. But that... She tapped on the still, tearful face of the botanist's sex wife. Is a smear campaign. I'll bet you a week's pay that I've had lunch with the woman coordinating it. Bobby's skeptical look only made Avasarala smile more broadly. This, Avasarala said, is the first genuinely good thing that's happened since we got on this floating whorehouse. I've got to get to work. God damn, I wish I was back at the office. You want some tea? Gin, she said, engaging the camera on her terminal. We're celebrating. In the focus window, she looked smaller than she felt. The rooms had been designed to command attention whatever angle she put herself in, like being trapped in a postcard. Anyone who rode in the yacht would be able to brag without saying a word, but in the weak gravity, her hair stood out from her head like she'd just gotten out of bed. More than that, she looked emotionally exhausted and physically diminished. Put it away, she told herself. Find the mask. She took a deep breath, made a rude gesture into the camera, and then started recording. Admiral Souther, she said, thank you so much for your last message. Something's come to my attention that I thought you might find interesting. It looks like someone's taken a fresh dislike to James Holden. If I were with the fleet instead of floating around the fucking solar system, I'd take you out for a cup of coffee and talk this over. But since that's not happening... I'm going to open some of my private files for you. I've been following Holden. Take a look at what I've got and tell me if you're seeing the same things I am. She sent the message. The next thing that would have made sense would be contacting Aaron Wright. If the situation had been what they were both pretending it was, she'd have kept him involved and engaged. For a long moment, she considered following the form, pretending. Bobby loomed up on her right, putting the glass of gin on the desk with a soft click. Avasarala picked it up and sipped a small taste of it. Mao's private-label gin was excellent, even without the lime twist. Nah, fuck Erin Wright, she thought. She pulled up her address book and started leafing through entries until she found what she wanted and pressed record. Ms. Kolinowski. I've just seen the leaked video accusing Praxidiki Mung of screwing his cute little five-year-old daughter. When exactly did UN media relations turn into a fucking divorce court? If it gets out that we were behind that, I would like to know whose resignation I'm going to hand to the news feeds, and right now I'm thinking it's yours. Give my love to Richard, and get back to me before I fire your incompetent ass out of spite. She ended the recording and sent it. She was the one that arranged it? Bobby asked. Might have been. 
Avasarala said, taking another bite of gin. It was too good. If she wasn't careful, she'd drink a lot of it. If it wasn't, she'll find who it was and serve them up on a plate. Emma Kolinowski is a coward. It's why I love her. Over the next hour, she sent a dozen more messages out. Performance after performance after performance. She started a liability investigation into Mung's ex-wife and whether the UN could be held responsible for slander. She put the Ganymede Relief Coordinator on high alert, demanding everything she could get about Mei Mung and the search for her. She put in high-priority requests to have the doctor and the woman from Holden's broadcast identified and then sent a twenty-minute rambling message to an old colleague in data storage with a small, tacit request for the same information made in the middle of it all. Aaron Wright had changed the game. If she'd had freedom, she'd have been unstoppable. As it was, she had to assume that every move she made would be catalogued and acted against almost as soon as she made it. But Aaron Wright and his allies were only human, and if she kept a solid flow of demands and requests, screeds and wheedling, they might overlook something. Or someone on a news feed might notice the uptick in activity and look into it. Or, if nothing else, her efforts might give Aaron Wright a bad night's sleep. It was what she had. It wasn't enough. Long years of practice with the fine dance of politics and power had left her with expectations and reflexes that couldn't find their right form there. The lag was killing her with frustration, and she took it out on whomever she was recording for at the moment. She felt like a world-class musician standing before a full auditorium and handed a kazoo. She didn't notice when she finished her gin. She only put the glass to her mouth, found it empty, and realized it wasn't the first time she'd done it. Five hours had passed. She'd had only three responses so far out of almost fifty messages she'd sent out. That was more than lag. That was someone else's damage control. She didn't realize that she was hungry until Kotya came with a plate, the smell of curried lamb and watermelon wafting in with him. Avasarala's belly woke with a roar, and she turned off her terminal. You've just saved my life, she told him gesturing at the desk. It was Sergeant Draper's idea, he said. After the third time you ignored her asking. I don't remember that, she said as he put the dish in front of her. Don't they have servants on this thing? Why are you bringing the food? They do, ma'am. I'm not letting them in here. That seems extreme. Feeling jumpy, are you? As you say. She ate too quickly. Her back was aching, and her left leg was tingling with the pins and needles she got now from sitting too long in one position. As a young woman, she'd never suffered that. On the other hand, she hadn't had the ability to pepper every major player in the United Nations and be taken seriously. Time took her strength, but it gave her power in exchange. It was a fair trade. She couldn't wait to finish her meal turning on the terminal while she gulped the last of it down. Four waiting messages. Souther, God bless his shriveled little heart. One from someone at the legal council whose name she didn't recognize, and another from someone she did. One from Michael John, which was probably about Venus. She opened the one from Souther. The admiral appeared on her screen, and she had to stop herself from saying hello. It was only a video recording, not a real conversation. She hated it. Christian, the Admiral said, you're going to have to be careful with all this information you're sending me. Our June's going to get jealous. I wasn't aware of our friend Jimmy's part in instigating this latest brouhaha. Our friend Jimmy. He wasn't saying the name Holden out loud. That was interesting. He was expecting some kind of filtering to be sniffing out Holden's name. She tried to guess whether he thought the filter would be on his outgoing messages or her incoming. If Aaron Wright had half a brain, which he did, he'd be watching the traffic both ways for both of them. 
Was he worried about someone else? How many players were there at the table? She didn't have enough information to work with, but it was interesting, at least. I can see where your concerns might lead you, Souther said. I'm making some inquiries, but you know how these things are. Might find something in a minute, might find something in a year. You don't be a stranger, though. There's more than enough going on out here that I can wish I could take you up on that lunch. We're all looking forward to seeing you again. That was a barefaced lie, Avasarala thought. Still, nice of him to say it. She scraped her fork along the bottom of the plate, a thin residue of curry clinging to the silver. The first message was some young man with a Brazilian accent explaining to her that the UN had nothing to do with the video footage released of Nicola Molko, and therefore could not be held responsible for it. The second was the boy's supervisor, apologizing for him and promising a fully formed brief by the end of the day, which was considerably more like it. The smart people were still afraid of her. That thought was more nourishing than the lamb. As she reached for the screen, the ship shifted under her, gravity pulling her slightly to the side. She put her hand on the desk. The curry and the remnants of gin churned her gut. Were we expecting that? she shouted. Yes, ma'am. Kotya called from the next room. Scheduled course correction. Never happens at the fucking office, she said. And Michael John appeared on her screen. He looked mildly confused, but that could have been just the angle of his face. She felt a sick dread. For a moment, the arbogast floated before her again, coming apart. Without intending it, she paused the feed. Something in the back of her mind wanted to turn away, not to know. It wasn't hard to understand how Ehrenreich and Nguyen and their cabal would turn their backs on Venus, on the alien chaos that was becoming order and more than order. She felt it, too, the atavistic fear lurking at the back of her mind. How much easier to turn to the old games, the old patterns, the history of warfare and conflict, deception and death. For all its horror, it was familiar. It was known. As a girl, she'd seen a film about a man who saw the face of God. For the first hour of the film, he had gone through the drab life of someone living on basic on the coast of southern Africa. When he saw God, the film switched to ten minutes of the man wailing, then another hour of slowly building himself back up to do the same idiot life he'd had at the beginning. Avasarala had hated it. Now, though, she almost understood. Turning away was natural. Even if it was moronic and self-destructive and empty, it was natural. War, slaughter, death. All the violence that Aaron Wright and his men, and she felt certain they were almost all of the men, were embracing, they were drawn to because it was comforting. And they were scared. Well, so was she. Pussies, she said and restarted the playback. Venus can think, Michael John said instead of hello or any other social pleasantry. I've had the signal analysis team running the data we saw from the network of water and electrical currents, and we found a model. It's only about a 60% correlation, but I'm comfortable putting that above chance. It's got different anatomy, of course, but its functional structure is most like a cetacean doing spatial reasoning problems. I mean, there's still the problem of the explanatory gap, and I can't help with that part. But with what we've seen, I'm fairly sure that the patterns we saw were it thinking. They were the actual thoughts, like neurons firing off. He looked into the camera as if expecting her to answer, and then looked mildly disappointed when she didn't. I thought you'd want to know, he said, and ended the recording. Before she could formulate a response, a new message from Souther appeared. She opened it with a sense of gratitude and relief that she was slightly ashamed of. Christian, he said, we have a problem. 
You should check the force assignments on Ganymede and let me know if we're seeing the same things. Avasarala frowned. The lag now was over twenty-eight minutes. She put in a standard request, expedited it, and stood up. Her back was a solid knot. She walked to the common area of the suite. Bobby, Kotiar, and three other men were sitting in a circle, the deck of cards distributed among them. Poker. Avasarala walked toward them, rolling through the hips where movement hurt. Something about lower gravity made her joints ache. She lowered herself to Bobby's side. Next hand, you can deal me in, she said. The order had come from Nguyen, and at first glance it made no sense at all. Six UN destroyers had been ordered off the Ganymede patrol, sent out at high burn on a course that seemed to lead, essentially, to nowhere. Initial reports showed that after a decent period of wondering what the fuck, a similar detachment of Martian ships matched course. Nguyen was up to something, and she didn't have the first clue what it could be. But Souther had sent it and thought she would see something. It took another hour to find it. Holden's Rosinante had departed Tycho Station on a gentle burn for the Jovian system. He might have filed a flight plan with the OPA, but he hadn't informed Earth or Mars of anything, which meant Nguyen was watching him, too. They weren't just scared. They were going to kill him. Avasarala sat quietly for a long moment before she stood up and went back toward the game. Kotiar and Bobby were at the end of a high-stakes round, which meant the pile of little bits of chocolate candy they were using for chips was almost five centimeters deep. Mr. Kotiar, Avasarala said. Sergeant Draper, with me, please. The cards all vanished. The men looked at each other nervously as she walked back into her bedroom. She closed the door behind them carefully. It didn't even click. I'm about to do something that may pull a trigger, she said. If I do this, the complexion of our situation may change. Kotiar and Bobby exchanged looks. I have some things I'd like to get out of storage, Bobby said. I'll brief the men, Kotiar said. Ten minutes. The lag between the Guanxi Yin and the Rosinante was still too long for conversation, but it was less than it took to get a message back to Earth. The sense of being so far from home left her a little light-headed. Kotiar stepped into the room and nodded once. Avasarala opened her terminal and requested a tight-beam connection. She gave the transponder code for the Rosinante. Less than a minute later, the connection came back refused. She smiled to herself and opened a channel to ops. This is Assistant Undersecretary Avasarala, she said, as if there were anyone else on board who it might be. What the fuck is wrong with your tight beam? I apologize, Madam Secretary, a young man with bright blue eyes and close-cut blonde hair said. That communication channel isn't available right now. Why the fuck isn't it available? It's not available, ma'am. Fine. I didn't want to do this on the radio, but I can broadcast if I have to. I'm afraid that won't be possible, the boy said. Avasarala took a long breath and let it out through her teeth. Put the captain on, she said. A moment later, the image jumped. The captain was a thin-faced man with the brown eyes of an Irish setter. The set of his mouth and his bloodless lips told her that he knew what was coming, at least an outline. For a moment, she just looked into the camera. It was a trick she'd learned when she'd just started off. Looking at the screen image let the other person feel they were being seen. Looking into the tiny black pinpoint of the lens itself left them feeling stared down. Captain. I have a high-priority message I need to send. I am very sorry. We're having technical difficulties with the communication array. Do you have a backup system? A shuttle we can power up? Anything? Not at this time. You're lying to me, she said. 
Then, when he didn't answer, I am making an official request that this yacht engage its emergency beacon and change course to the nearest aid. I'm not going to be able to do that, ma'am. If you will just be patient, we'll get you to Ganymede safe and in one piece. I'm sure any repairs we need can be done there. Avasarala leaned close to the terminal. I can come up there and we can have this conversation personally, she said. Captain, you know the laws as well as I do. Turn on the beacon, or give me communications access. Ma'am, you are the guest of Jules Pierre Mao, and I respect that. But Mr. Mao is the owner of this vessel, and I answer to him. No, then. I'm very sorry. You're making a mistake, shithead, Avasarala said, and dropped the connection. Bobby came into the room. Her face was bright, and there was a hunger about her like a running dog straining at the leash. Gravity shifted a degree. A course correction, but not a change. How'd it go? Bobby asked. I'm declaring this vessel in violation of laws and standards, Avasarala said. Kotya, you're witness to that. As you say, ma'am. All right, then. Bobby, get me control of this fucking ship. Chapter 38 Bobby What else do you need from us? Kotyar asked. Two of his people were moving the big crate marked formal wear into Avasarala's room. They were using a large furniture dolly and grunting with effort. Even in the gentle quarter G of the Guanxi Yin's thrust, Bobby's armor weighed over a hundred kilos. We're sure this room isn't under surveillance? Bobby said. This is going to work a lot better if they have no idea what's about to happen. Kotyar shrugged. It has no functioning eavesdropping devices I've been able to detect. Okay, then, Bobby said, rapping on the fiberglass crate with her knuckle. Open it up. Kotyar tapped something on his hand terminal and the crate's locks opened with a sharp click. Bobby yanked the opened panel off and leaned it against the wall. Inside the crate, suspended in a web of elastic bands, was her suit. Kotyar whistled. A Goliath three? Can't believe they let you keep it. Bobby removed the helmet and put it on the bed, then began pulling the various other pieces out of the webbing and setting them on the floor. They gave it to your tech guys to verify some video stored in the suit. When Avasarala tracked it down, it was in a closet collecting dust. No one seemed to care when she took it. She pulled out the suit's right arm. She hadn't expected them to get her any of the two-millimeter ammo the suit's integrated gun used, but was surprised to find that they'd completely removed the gun from the housing. It made sense to remove all the weapons before handing the suit off to a bunch of civilians, but it still annoyed her. Shit, she said. Won't be shooting anyone, I guess. If you did... Kotyar said with a smile. Would the bullets even slow down as they went through both of the ship's hulls and let all the air out? Nope, Bobby said, laying the last piece of the suit on the floor, then pulling out the tools necessary to put it all back together again. But that might be a point in my favor. The gun on this rig is designed to shoot through other people wearing comparable armor. Anything that will shoot through my suit here will probably also hold a ship, which means... None of the security personnel on this vessel will have weapons capable of penetrating your armor, Kotyar finished. As you say, how many of my people will you want with you? None, Bobby said, attaching the fresh battery pack Avasarla's techs had provided to the back of the armor and getting a lovely green, fully charged light from the panel. Once I get started, the obvious counterplay will be to grab the undersecretary and hold her hostage. Preventing that is your job. Kotyar smiled again. There was no humor in it. As you say. It took Bobby just under three hours to assemble and field prep her suit. It should have taken only two, but she forgave herself the extra hour by remembering that she was out of practice. 
The closer the suit got to completion, the tighter the knot in her stomach grew. Some of it was the natural tension that came before combat, and her time in the Marines had taught her to use it, to let the stress force her to recheck everything three times. Once she was in the thick of it, it would be too late. But deep down, Bobby knew that the possibility of violence wasn't the only thing twisting up her insides. It was impossible to forget what had happened the last time she'd worn this suit. The red enamel of her Martian camouflage was pitted and scraped from the exploding monster, and her high-speed skid across Ganymede's ice. A tiny bit of fluid leakage on the knee reminded her of Private Hillman, Hilly, her friend. Wiping off the helmet's faceplate made her think of the last time she'd spoken to Lieutenant Givens, her CO, just before the monster had ripped him in two. When the suit was finished and lying on the floor, opened up and waiting for her to climb inside, she felt a shudder run up her spine. For the first time ever, the inside looked small, sepulchral. No, she said to no one but herself. No? Kotyar asked, sitting on the floor next to her, holding the tools he thought she might need next. He'd been so quiet during the assembly procedure she'd sort of forgotten he was there. I'm not afraid of putting this back on, she said. Ah, Kotyar replied with a nod, then put the tools into the toolbox. As you say. Bobby pushed herself to her feet and yanked the black unitard she wore under the armor out of the crate. Without thinking about it, she stripped down to her panties and pulled the skin-tight garment on. She was pulling the wire leads out of her armor and connecting them to the various sensors on the bodysuit when she noticed that Kotyar had turned his back to her, and that his usually light brown neck was turning beet red. Oh, she said, sorry. I've stripped down and put this on in front of my squaddies so many times I don't even think about it anymore. No reason to apologize, Kotyar said without turning around. I was only taken by surprise. He risked a peek over his left shoulder, and when he saw that she was fully covered by the bodysuit, he turned back to help her wire it up to the armor. You are, he said, then paused for a beat. Lovely. It was her turn to blush. Aren't you married? Bobby asked with a grin, happy for the distraction. The simple humanity in discomfort with mating signals made the monster in her head seem very far away. Yes, Kochar replied, attaching the final lead to a sensor at the small of her back. Very, but I'm not blind. Thank you, Bobby said, and gave him a friendly pat on the shoulder. After a few moments' struggle with the tight spaces, she sat down into the suit's open chest and slid down until her legs and arms were fully inside. Button me up. Kotyar sealed up the chest as she'd shown him, then put the helmet on her and locked it in place. Inside the suit, her HUD flashed through the boot routine. A gentle, almost subliminal hum surrounded her. She activated the array of micro-motors and pumps that powered the exomusculature, and then sat up. Kotyar was looking at her, his face a question. Bobby turned on the external speaker and said, Yeah, it all looks good in here. Green across the board. She pushed herself to her feet effortlessly and felt the old sensation of barely restrained power running through her limbs. She knew if she pushed off hard with her legs, she'd hit the ceiling with enough force to severely damage it. A sudden motion of her arm could hurl the heavy four-poster bed across the room or shatter Kotyar's spine. It made her move with the deliberate gentleness of long training. Kotyar reached under his jacket and pulled out a sleek black pistol of the slug-throwing variety. Bobby knew the security team had loaded them with high-impact plastic rounds, guaranteed not to knock holes in the ship. It was the same kind of round Mao's security team would be using. He started to hold it out to her, but then looked at the thickness of her armored fingers and at the much smaller opening of the trigger guard, and shrugged apologetically. I won't need it, she said. 
Her voice sounded harsh, metallic, inhuman. Kotyar smiled again. As you say. Bobby punched the button to call the keel elevator, then walked back and forth in the lounge, letting her reflexes get used to her armor. There was a nanosecond delay between attempting to move a limb and having the armor react. It made walking around feel vaguely dreamlike, as if the act of wanting to move your limbs and the moving of the limbs themselves were separate events. Hours of training and use had mostly overcome the sensation when Bobby wore her armor, but it always took a few minutes of moving around to get past the oddness of it. Avasarala walked into the lounge from the room they were using as the communications center and sat down at the bar. She poured herself a stiff shot of gin, then squeezed a piece of lime into it almost as an afterthought. The old lady had been drinking a lot more lately, but it wasn't Bobby's place to point it out. Maybe it was helping her sleep. When the elevator didn't arrive after several minutes, she thumped over to the panel and hit the button a few more times. A small display said, Out of service. Damn, Bobby said to herself. They really are kidnapping us. She'd left the external speakers on, and the harsh voice coming out of her suit echoed around the room. Avasarala didn't look up from her drink, but said, Remember what I said. Huh? Bobby said, not paying attention. She climbed awkwardly up the crew ladder to the deck hatch above her and hit the button. The hatch slid open. That meant that everyone was still pretending that this wasn't a kidnapping. They could explain away the elevator. Explaining why the undersecretary was locked out of the rest of the ship would be harder. Maybe they figured a woman in her seventies would be reluctant to climb around the ship on ladders, so killing the lift was good enough. They might have been right. Avasarala certainly didn't look like she was up to a two-hundred-foot climb, even in low gravity. None of these people were on Ganymede, Avasarala said. Okay, Bobby replied to the seeming non-sequitur. You won't be able to kill enough of them to bring your platoon back, Avasarala finished, tossing off the last of her gin, then pushing away from the bar and heading off to her room. Bobby didn't reply. She pulled herself up to the next deck and let the hatch slide shut behind her. The armor had been designed for exactly this sort of mission. The original Goliath-class scout suits had been built for marine boarding parties in ship-to-ship -ship engagements. That meant they were designed for maximum maneuverability in tight spaces. No matter how good the armor was, it was useless if the soldier wearing it couldn't climb ladders, slip through human-sized hatches, and maneuver gracefully in microgravity. Bobby climbed the ladder to the next deck hatch and hit the button. The console responded with a red warning light. A few moments of looking at the menus revealed why. They'd parked the crew elevator just above the hatch and then disabled it, creating a barricade. And that meant they knew something was up. Bobby looked around the room she was in, another relaxation lounge, nearly identical to the one she'd just left, until she found the likeliest place for them to have hidden their cameras. She waved. This won't stop me, guys. She climbed back down and went into the luxurious bathroom space. On a ship this nice, it couldn't properly be called the head. A few moments probing found the fairly well-hidden bulkhead service hatch. It was locked. Bobby tore it off the wall. On the other side were a tangle of piping and a narrow corridor barely large enough to stuff her armor into. She climbed in and pulled herself along the pipes for two decks, then kicked the service hatch into the room and climbed in. The compartment turned out to be a secondary galley, with a bank of stoves and ovens along one wall, several refrigeration units, and lots of counter space, all in gleaming stainless steel. Her suit warned her that she was being targeted, and changed the HUD so that the normally invisible infrared beams aimed at her became faint red lines. Half a dozen were painting her chest, 
all coming from compact black weapons held by Mao Quick security personnel at the other end of the room. Bobby stood up. To their credit, the security goons didn't back up. Her HUD ran through the weapons database and informed her that the men were armed with 5mm submachine guns with a standard ammo capacity of 300 rounds and a cyclic rate of 10 rounds per second. Unless they were using high-explosive armor-piercing rounds, unlikely with the ship's hull right behind her, the suit rated their danger level as low. Bobby made sure her external speakers were still on and said, Okay, fellas, let's... They opened fire. For one long second, the entire galley was in chaos. High-impact plastic rounds bounced off her armor, deflected off the bulkheads, and skipped around the room. They blew apart containers of dried goods, hurled pots and pans off their magnetic hooks, and flung smaller utensils into the air in a cloud of stainless steel and plastic shards. One round took a particularly unlucky bounce and hit one of the security guards in the center of his nose, punching a hole into his head and dropping him to the floor with an almost comic look of surprise on his face. Before two seconds could tick by, Bobby was in motion, launching herself across the steel island in the center of the room and plowing into all five remaining guards with her arms outstretched, like a football player going in for a tackle. They were hurled against the far bulkhead with a meaty thud, then slumped to the ground, motionless. Her suit started to put up life sign indicators on her HUD for them, but she shut it off without looking. She didn't want to know. One of the men stirred, then started to raise his gun. Bobby gently shoved him, and he flew across the room to crumple against the far bulkhead. He didn't move again. She glanced around the room, looking for cameras. She couldn't find one, but hoped it was there anyway. If they'd seen this, maybe they wouldn't throw any more of their people at her. At the keel ladder, she'd discovered that they'd blocked the elevator by jamming the floor hatch open with a crowbar. Basic ship safety protocols wouldn't allow the elevator to move to another deck unless the deck above was sealed. Bobby yanked out the crowbar and threw it across the room, then hit the call button. The lift climbed up the ladder shaft to her level and stopped. She jumped on and hit the button that would take her to the bridge, eight decks up. Eight more pressure hatches. Eight more possible ambushes. She tightened her hands into fists until the knuckles stretched painfully inside her gauntlets. Bring it. Three decks up, the elevator stopped the panel informing her that all the pressure hatches between her and the bridge had been overridden and forced open. They were willing to risk a hole in the ship, emptying out half the ship's air, rather than let her up to the bridge. It was sort of gratifying to be scarier than sudden decompression. She climbed off the lift onto a deck that appeared to be mostly crew quarters, though it must have been evacuated. There wasn't a soul in sight. A quick tour revealed twelve small crew cabins and two bathrooms that could reasonably be called heads. No gold plating on the fixtures for the crew. No open bar. No twenty-four-hour-a-day food service. Looking at the fairly spartan living conditions of the average crew member on the Guanxi Yin brought home Avasarla's last words to her. These were just sailors. None of them deserved to die for what had happened on Ganymede. Bobby found herself glad she didn't have a gun. She found another access hatch in the head and tore it open. But to her surprise, the service corridor ended just a few feet above her head. Something in the structure of the ship was cutting her off. Having never seen the Guanxi Yin from the outside, she had no idea what it might be. But she needed to get another five decks up and she wasn't about to let this stop her. A ten-minute search turned up a service hatch through the outer hull. She'd torn off two inner hull hatches on two different decks, so if she got it open, those two decks would lose their air. But the central ladder corridor was sealed at Avasarla's deck, so her people would be fine. 
and the whole reason she was doing this was the sealed hatch to the upper decks, which seemed to be where most of the crew was. She thought about the six men down in the galley and felt a pang. Sure, they'd shot first, but if any of them were still alive, she had no desire to asphyxiate them in their sleep. It turned out not to be a problem. The hatch led into a small airlock chamber about the size of a closet. A minute later, it had cycled through, and she climbed out onto the outer hull of the ship. Triple hulled. Of course. The lord of the Mao Quick Empire wasn't going to trust his expensive skin to anything that wasn't the safest humans could build, and the ostentatious design of the ship extended to her outer hull as well. While most military ships were painted a flat black that made them hard to spot visually in space, most civilian ships either were left in unpainted gray or were painted in basic corporate colors. The Guanxi Yin had a mural painted on it in vivid colors. Bobby was too close to see what it was, but under her feet were what appeared to be grass and the hoof of a giant horse. Mao had the hull of his ship painted with a mural that included horses and grass, when almost no one would ever see it. Bobby made sure her boot and glove mags were set strong enough to handle the quarter-G thrust the ship was still under, and started climbing up the side. She quickly reached the spot where the dead end between the hulls began, and saw that it was an empty shuttle bay. If only Avasarla had let her do this before Mao had run off with the shuttle. Triple hulls, Bobby thought. Maximum redundancy. On a hunch, she crawled across the ship to the other side. Sure enough, there was a second shuttle bay. But the ship in it wasn't a standard short-flight shuttle. It was long and sleek, with an engine housing twice as large as that of a normal ship its size. Written in proud letters across the bow of the ship was the name Razorback, a racing pinnace. Bobby crawled back around to the empty cargo bay and used the airlock there to enter the ship. The military override codes her suit sent to the locked door worked, to her surprise. The airlock led to the deck just below the bridge, the one used for shuttle supply storage and maintenance. The center of the deck was taken up by a large machine shop. Standing in it were the captain of the Guanxi Yin and his senior staff. There were no security personnel or weapons in sight. The captain tapped his ear in an ancient, can you hear me, gesture. Bobby nodded one fist at him, then turned the external speakers back on and said, Yes. We are not military personnel, the captain said. We can't defend ourselves from military hardware. But I'm not going to turn this vessel over to you without knowing your intentions. My XO is on the deck above us, prepared to scuttle the ship if we can't come to terms. Bobby smiled at him, though she didn't know if he could see it through her helmet. You've illegally detained a high-level member of the UN government. Acting in my role as a member of the security team, I have come to demand that you deliver her immediately to the port of her choosing at best possible speed. She shrugged with her hands in the belter way. Or you can blow yourselves up. Seems like a drastic overreaction to having to give the undersecretary her radio privileges back. The captain nodded and relaxed visibly. Whatever happened next, it wasn't like he had any choice. And since he didn't have any choice, he didn't have any responsibility. We were following orders. You'll note that in the log when you take command. I'll see that she knows. The captain nodded again. Then the ship is yours. Bobby opened her radio link to Kotiar. We win. Put Her Majesty on, will you? While she waited for Avasarala, Bobby said to the captain, There are six injured security people down below. Get a medical team down there. Bobby, Avasarala said over the radio. The ship is yours, madam. Great. Tell the captain we need to make best possible speed to intercept Holden. We are getting to him before Nguyen does. Uh, this is a pleasure yacht, 
It's built to run at low G for comfort. I'd bet it can do a full G if it needs to, but I doubt it does much more than that. Admiral Nguyen is about to kill everyone that actually might know what the fuck is going on. Avasarola didn't quite yell. We don't have time to cruise around like we're trying to pick up fucking rent, boys. Huh, Bobby said. Then a moment later, If this is a race, I know where there's a racing ship. Chapter 39 Holden Holden pulled himself a cup of coffee from the galley coffee pot, and the strong smell filled the room. He could feel the eyes of the crew on his back with an almost physical force. He'd called them all there, and once they'd assembled and taken their seats, he'd turned his back on them and started making coffee. I'm stalling for time because I forgot how I wanted to say this, he thought. He put some sugar in his coffee, even though he always drank it black, just because stirring took a few more seconds. So, who are we? he said as he stirred. His question was met with silence, so he turned around and leaned back against the countertop, holding his unwanted cup of coffee and continuing to stir. Seriously, he said. Who are we? It's the question I keep coming back to. Uh... Amos said and shifted in his seat. My name's Amos, Cap. You feeling okay? No one else spoke. Alex was staring at the table in front of him, his dark scalp shining through his thinning hair under the harsh white of the galley lights. Prax was sitting on the counter next to the sink and looking at his hands. He flexed them periodically as though trying to figure out what they were for. Only Naomi was looking at him. Her hair was pulled up into a thick tail, and her dark, almond-shaped eyes were staring right into his. It was fairly disconcerting. I've recently figured out something about myself, Holden continued, not letting Naomi's unblinking stare throw him off. I've been treating you all like you owe me something, and none of you do. And that means I've been treating you like shit. No, Alex started without looking up. Yes, Holden said, and stopped until Alex looked up at him. Yes. You may be more than anyone else. Because I've been scared to death, and cowards always look for an easy target. And you're about the nicest person I know, Alex, so I treated you badly because I could get away with it. And I hope you forgive me for that, because I really hate that I did it. Sure I forgive you, Cap, Alex said with a smile and his heavy drawl. I'll try to earn it. Holden answered, bothered by the easy reply. But Alex said something else to me recently that I've been thinking about a lot. He reminded me that none of you are employees. We're not all in the Canterbury. We don't work for pure and clean anymore. And I don't own this ship any more than any of you do. We took contracts from the OPA in exchange for pocket money and ship expenses, but we never talked about how to handle the excess. You opened that account, Alex said. Yeah, there's a bank account with all of the extra money in it. Last I checked, there was just under eighty grand in there. I said we keep it for ship expenses, but who am I to make that decision for the rest of you? That's not my money. It's our money. We earned it. But you're the captain, Amos said, then pointed at the coffee pot. While Holden fixed him a cup, he said, Am I? I was the XO on the Canterbury. It made sense for me to be the captain after the cant got nuked. He handed the cup to Amos and sat down at the table with the rest of the crew. But we haven't been those guys for a long time now. Who we are now is four people who don't actually work for anyone. Prax cleared his throat at this, and Holden nodded an apology to him. Anyone long term, let's say. There is no corporation or government granting me authority over this crew. We're just four people who sort of own a ship that Mars will probably try to take back the first chance they get. This is legitimate salvage, Alex said. And I hope the Martians find that compelling when you explain it to them, Holden replied. But it doesn't change my point. Who are we? 
Naomi nodded a fist at him. I see where you're going. We've left a lot of this kind of stuff just up in the air because we've been running full tilt since the Canterbury. And this, Holden said, is the perfect time to figure that stuff out. We've got a contract to help Prax find his little girl, and he's paying us so we can afford to run the ship. Once we find May, how do we find the next job? Do we go looking for a next job? Do we sell the Rossi to the OPA and retire on Titan? I think we need to know those things. No one spoke. Prax pushed himself off the counter and started rummaging through the cabinets. After a minute or two, he pulled out a package that read chocolate pudding on the side and said, Can I make this? Naomi laughed. Alex said, Knock yourself out, Doc. Prax pulled a bowl out and began mixing ingredients into it. Oddly enough, because the botanist was paying attention to something else, it created a sense of intimacy for the crew. The outsider was doing outside things, leaving them to talk among themselves. Holden wondered if Prax knew that, and was doing it on purpose. Amos slurped down the last of his coffee and said, So, you called this meeting, Cap. You have something in mind? Yeah, Holden said, taking a moment to think. Yeah, kind of. Naomi put a hand on his arm and smiled at him. We're listening. I think we get married, he said with a wink at Naomi. Make it all nice and legal. Wait, she said. The look on her face was more horrified than Holden would have hoped. No, no, that's sort of a joke, Holden said. But only sort of. You see, I was thinking about my parents. They formed their initial collective partnership because of the farm. They were all friends. They wanted to buy the property in Montana, so they made a group large enough to afford it. It wasn't sexual. Father Tom and Father Caesar were already sexual partners and monogamous. Mother Tamara was single. Fathers Joseph and Anton and Mothers Elise and Sophie were already a polyamorous civil unit. Father Dmitri joined a month later when he started dating Tamara. They formed a civil union to own the property jointly. They wouldn't have been able to afford it if they were all paying taxes for separate kids, so they had me as a group. Earth... Alex said, is a weird freaking place. Eight parents to a baby ain't exactly common, Amos said. But it makes a lot of economic sense with a baby tax, Holden said. So it's not unheard of, either. What about people making babies without paying the tax, Alex said. It's tougher to get away with than you think, Holden said. Unless you never go to a doctor or only use black markets. Amos and Naomi shared a quick look that Holden pretended not to see. Okay, Holden continued. Forget babies for a minute. What I'm talking about is incorporating. If we plan to stick together, let's make it legal. We can draft up incorporation papers with one of the independent outer planet stations like Ceres or Europa and become joint owners of this enterprise. What, Naomi said, does our little company do? Exactly, Holden said in triumph. Uh, Amos said again. No, I mean, that's exactly what I've been asking, Holden continued. Who are we? What do we want to do? Because when this contract with Prax is over, the bank account will be well padded, we'll own a high-tech warship, and we'll be free to do whatever we damn well want to do. Jesus, Cap. Amos said. I just got to have a heart on. I know, right? Holden replied with a grin. Prax stopped mixing things in his bowl and stuck it in the refrigerator. He turned and looked at them with the careful movements of someone who feared he'd be asked to leave if anyone noticed him. Holden moved over to him and put an arm around his shoulder. Our friend Prax here can't be the only guy who needs to hire a ship like this, right? We're faster and meaner than just about anything a civvy can dig up, Alex said with a nod. And when we find May, it will be as high profile as you could hope for, Holden said. What better advertising could we get than that? Admit it, Cap, Amos said. You just kind of like being famous. If it gets us jobs, sure. 
We're much more likely to wind up broke, out of air, and drifting through space dead, Naomi said. That's always a possibility, Holden admitted. But man, aren't you ready to be your own boss for a change? If we find we can't make it on our own, we can always sell the ship for a giant sack of money and go our separate ways. We have an escape plan. Yeah, Amos said. Fuck yeah, let's do this. How do we start? Well, Holden said, that's another new thing. I think we have to vote. No one of us owns the ship, so I think we vote on important stuff like this from now on. Amos said, All in favor of making ourselves into a company to own the ship, raise your hand. To Holden's delight, they all raised their hands. Even Prax started to, realized he was doing it, and then put it back down. I'll get us an attorney on series and start the paperwork, Holden said. But that leads to something else. A company can own a ship, but a company can't be the registered captain. We'll need to vote for whoever holds that title. Amos started laughing. Give me a fucking break. Raise your hand if Holden isn't the captain. No hands went up. See? Amos said. Holden started to speak, but stopped when something uncomfortable happened in his throat and behind his sternum. Look, Amos said, his face kind. You're just that guy. Naomi nodded and smiled at Holden, which only made the ache in his chest pleasantly worse. I'm an engineer, she said. There isn't a program on this ship I haven't tweaked or rewritten, and I could probably take her apart and put her back together by myself at this point. But I can't bluff at cards. And I'm never going to be the one that stares down the joint navies of the inner planets and says back the hell off. Roger that, Alex said. And I just want to fly my baby. That's all, and that's it. If I get to do that, I'm happy. Holden started to speak, but to her surprise and embarrassment, the minute his mouth opened, his eyes teared up. Amos saved him. I'm just a grease monkey, he said. I push tools, and mostly wait for Naomi to tell me when and where to push them. I got no desire to run anything bigger than that machine shop. You're the talker. I've seen you face down Fred Johnson, UN naval captains, OPA cowboys, and drugged up space pirates. You talk out your ass better than most people do using their mouth and sober. Thank you, Holden finally said. I love you guys. You know that, right? Plus which, Amos continued, no one on this ship will try harder to jump in front of a bullet from me than you will. I find that appealing in a captain. Thanks, Holden said again. Sounds settled to me, Alex said, getting up and heading toward the ladder. Gonna go make sure we're not aimed at a rock or something. Holden watched him go and was gratified to see him wiping his eyes as soon as he got out of the room. It was okay to be a weepy little kid as long as everyone else was being a weepy little kid. Prax gave him an awkward pat on the shoulder and said, Come back to the galley in an hour. Pudding will be ready. Then he wandered out and into his cabin. He was already reading messages on his hand terminal as he closed the door. Okay, Amos said. What now? Amos, Naomi said, getting up and walking over to stand in front of Holden. Please take ops for me for a while. Roger that, Amos said, the grin existing only in his voice. He climbed the ladder up and out of sight, the pressure hatch opening for him, then slamming behind him when he went. Hi, Holden said. Was that right? She nodded. I feel like I got you back. I was worried I'd never see you again. If you hadn't yanked me out of that hole I was digging for myself, neither of us would have. Naomi leaned forward to kiss him and he wrapped his arms around her and pulled her tight. When they stopped to breathe, he said, Is this too soon? She said, Shut up, and kissed him again. Without breaking the kiss, she pulled her body away from his and began fumbling with the zipper of his jumpsuit. Those ridiculous Martian military jumpsuits that had come with the ship, 
Tachi stenciled across the back. Now that they were going to have their own company, they'd need to get something better. Jumpsuits made a lot of sense for shipboard life, with changing gravities and oily mechanical parts, but something actually tailored to fit them all, and in their own colors. Rocinante, on the back. Naomi's hand got inside the jumpsuit and under his T-shirt, and he lost all thought of fashion choices. My bunk are yours, he said. You have your own bunk? Not anymore, he thought. Making love to Naomi had always been different than with anyone else. Some of it was physical. She was the only belter he'd ever been with, and that meant she was physiologically different in some ways. But that wasn't the most notable part for him. What made Naomi different was that they'd been friends for five years before they'd slept together. It wasn't a flattering testament to his character, and it made him cringe when he thought about it now, but he'd always been pretty shallow when it came to sex. He'd picked out potential sexual partners within minutes of meeting a new woman, and because he was pretty and charming, he usually got the ones he was interested in. He'd always been quick to allow himself to mistake infatuation for genuine affection. One of his most painful memories was the day Naomi had called him on it. Exposed for him the little game he played in which he convinced himself he genuinely cared for the woman he was sleeping with so that he wouldn't feel like a user. But he had been. The fact that the women were using him in turn didn't make him feel better about it. Because Naomi was so physically different from the ideal that growing up on Earth had created, he had just not seen her as a potential sexual partner when they'd first met and that meant he'd grown to know her as a person without any of the sexual baggage he usually carried. When his feelings for her grew beyond friendship, he was surprised. And somehow, that changed everything about sex. The movements might all be the same, but the desire to communicate affection rather than demonstrate prowess changed what everything meant. After their first time together, He'd lain in bed for hours, feeling like he'd been doing it wrong for years, and only just realized. He was doing that again now. Naomi slept on her side next to him, her arm thrown across his chest and her thigh across his, her belly against his hip and her breast against his ribs. It had never been like this with anyone before her, and this was what it was supposed to be like the sense of complete ease and contentment. He could imagine a future in which he hadn't been able to prove he'd changed, and in which she never came back to him. He could see years and decades of sexual partners, always trying to recapture this feeling and never being able to, because, of course, it wasn't really about the sex. Thinking about it made his stomach hurt. Naomi talked in her sleep. Her mouth whispered something mysterious into his neck, and the sudden tickle woke him up enough to realize he'd been drifting off to sleep. He hugged her head to his chest and kissed the top of it, then rolled over onto his side and let himself fade. The wall monitor over the bed buzzed. Who is it? he said, suddenly as tired as he could remember ever having been. He'd just closed his eyes a second earlier, and he knew he'd never be able to open them now. Me, Cap, Alex said. Holden wanted to shout at him, but couldn't find the energy. Okay. You need to see this, was all Alex said. But something in his voice woke Holden up. He sat up, moving Naomi's arm out of the way. She said something in sleep talk, but didn't wake. Okay he said again, turning on the monitor. A white-haired, older woman with very strange facial features looked out at him. It took his addled mind a second to recognize that she wasn't deformed, just being crushed by a heavy burn. With a voice distorted by G-forces mashing down on her throat, she said, My name is Christian Avasarala. I'm the UN Assistant Undersecretary of Executive Administration, 
A UN Admiral has dispatched six Monroe-class destroyers from the Jupiter system to destroy your ship. Truck this transponder code and come meet me or you and everyone on your ship will die. This is not a fucking joke. Chapter 40 Prax Thrust pressed him into the crash couch. It was only 4G, but even a single full G called for nearly the full medical cocktail. He had lived in a place that kept him weak. He'd known that, of course, but mostly in terms of xylem and phloem. He had taken the normal low-G medical supplements to encourage bone growth. He had exercised as much as the guidelines asked, usually. But always in the back of his mind, he'd thought it was idiocy. He was a botanist. He'd live and die in the familiar tunnels with their comfortable low gravity, less than a fifth of Earth's. An Earth he would never have reason to go to. There was even less reason he would ever need to suffer through a high-G burn. And yet, here he lay in the gel like he was at the bottom of an ocean. His vision was blurred, and he fought for every inhalation. When his knee hyperextended, he tried to scream but couldn't catch his breath. The others would be better. They'd be used to things like this. They knew that they'd survive. His hind brain wasn't at all sure. Needles dug into the flesh of his thigh, injecting him with another cocktail of hormones and paralytics. Cold like the touch of ice spread from the injection points, and a paradoxical sense of ease and dread filled his mind. At this point... It was a balancing act between keeping his blood vessels elastic enough that they wouldn't burst and robust enough that they wouldn't collapse. His mind slid out from under him, leaving something calculating and detached in its place. It was like pure executive function without a sense of self. What had been his mind knew what he had known, remembered the things he remembered, but wasn't him. In this altered state of consciousness, he found himself taking inventory. Would it be okay to die now? Did he want to live? And if he did, on what terms? He considered the loss of his daughter as if it were a physical object. Loss was the soft pink of crushed seashell, where once it had been the red of old, scabby blood. The red of an umbilical cord, waiting to drop free. He remembered May, what she had looked like, the delight in her laugh. She wasn't like that anymore, if she was alive, but she was probably dead. In his gravity-bent mind, he smiled. Of course, his lips couldn't react. He'd been wrong. All along, he'd been wrong. The hours of sitting by himself, telling himself that May was dead. He'd thought he was toughening himself preparing himself for the worst. That wasn't right at all. He'd said it. He'd tried to believe it, because the thought was comforting. If she was dead, she wasn't being tortured. If she was dead, she wasn't scared. If she was dead, then the pain would be all his, entirely his, and she would be safe. He noticed without pleasure or pain that it was a pathological mental frame. But he'd had his life and his daughter taken from him, had survived a near starvation while the cascade effect ate what was left of Ganymede, had been shot at, had faced a half-alien killing machine, and was now known throughout the solar system as a wife-beater and pedophile. He had no reason to be sane. It wouldn't help him. And on top of that... His knee really hurt. Somewhere far, far away, in a place with light and air, something buzzed three times, and the mountain rolled off his sternum. Coming back to himself was like rising from the bottom of a pool. Okay, y'all, Alex said across the ship's system. We're calling this dinner. Take a couple minutes for your livers to crawl up off your spinal cords, and we'll meet up in the galley. We've only got fifty minutes, so enjoy it while you can. Prax took a deep breath, 
blowing it out between his teeth, and then sat up. His whole body felt bruised. His hand terminal claimed the thrust was at one-third G, but it felt like more and less than that. He swung his legs over the edge, and his knee made a wet, grinding pop. He tapped at his terminal. Um, I'm not sure I can walk, he said. My knee. Hang tight, Doc. Amos's voice came from the speaker. I'll come take a look at it. I'm pretty much the closest thing we've got to a medic unless you want to hand it over to the med bay. Just don't try to weld them back together, Holden said. It doesn't work. The link went silent. While he waited, Prax checked his incoming messages. The list was too long for the screen, but that had been true since the initial message had gone out. The message titles had changed. Baby rapers should be tortured to death. Don't listen to the haters. I believe you. My father did the same thing to me. Turn to Jesus before it's too late. He didn't open them. He checked the news feeds under his own name and May's and had 7,000 active feeds with those key words. Nicola's only had 50. There had been a time that he'd loved Nicola, or thought that he had. He'd wanted to have sex with her as badly as he'd wanted anything before in his life. He told himself there had been good times, nights they'd spent together. May had come from Nicola's body. It was hard to believe that something so precious and central to his life had also been part of a woman who, by the evidence, he'd never really known. Even as the father of her child, he hadn't known the woman who could have made that recording. He opened the hand terminal's recording fields, centered the camera on himself, and licked his lips. Nicola. Twenty seconds later, he closed the field and erased the recording. He had nothing to say. Who are you? And who do you think I am? Came closest. And he didn't care about the answer to either one. He went back to the messages filtering on the names of the people who'd been helping him investigate. There was nothing new since the last time. Hey, Doc, Amos said, lumbering into the small room. I'm sorry, Prax said, putting his terminal back into its holder beside the crash couch. It was just during that last burn. He gestured to his knee. It was swollen, but not as badly as he'd expected. He'd thought it would be twice its normal size, but the anti-inflammatories that had been injected into his veins were doing their job. Amos nodded, put a hand on Prax's sternum, and pushed him back into the gel. I got a toe that pops out sometimes, Amos said. Little tiny joint, but get it at the wrong angle and the fast burn hurts like a bitch. Try not to tense up, Doc. Amos bent the knee twice, feeling the joint grind. This ain't that bad. Here, straighten it out. Okay. Amos wrapped one hand around Prax's ankle, braced the other on the frame of the couch, and pulled slowly and irresistibly. Prax's knee bloomed with pain, and then a deep, wet pop and a nauseating sensation of tendon shifting against bone. There you go, Amos said. We go back into burn and make sure you got that leg in the proper place. Hyperextend that again right now, we'll pop your kneecap off, okay? Right, Prax said, starting to sit up. I'm sorry as hell to do this, Doc, Amos said, putting a hand on his chest, pushing him back down. I mean, you're having a lousy day and all, but you know how it is. Prax frowned. Every muscle in his face felt bruised. What is it? All this bullshit they're saying about you and the kid. That's all just bullshit, right? Of course, Prax said. Because, you know, sometimes things happen. You didn't even mean them to. Have a hard day, lose your temper maybe, or shit, you get drunk. Some of the things I've done when I've really tied one on, I don't even know about until later. Amos smiled. I'm just saying, if there's a grain of truth, something that's getting all exaggerated, it'd be better if we knew it now, right? I never did anything that she said. It's okay to tell me the truth, Doc. I understand. Sometimes guys do stuff. 
Doesn't make him bad. Prax pushed Amos's hand aside and brought himself up to sitting. His knee felt much better. Actually, he said, it does. That makes them bad. Amos's expression relaxed. His smile changed in a way Prax couldn't quite understand. All right, Doc. Like I said, I'm sorry as hell. But I did have to ask. It's okay, Prax said, standing up. For a moment, the knee seemed like it might give, but it didn't. Prax took a tentative step, then another. It would work. He turned toward the galley, but the conversation wasn't finished. If I had, if I had done those things, that would have been okay with you? Oh, fuck no. I'd have broken your neck and thrown you out the airlock, Amos said, clapping him on the shoulder. Ah, Prax said, a gentle relief loosening in his chest. Thank you. Anytime. The other three were in the galley when Prax and Amos got there, but it still felt half full. Less. Naomi and Alex were sitting across the table from each other. Neither of them looked as ruined as Prax felt. Holden turned from the wall with a formed foam bowl in either hand. The brown slurry in them smelled of heat and earth and cooked leaves. As soon as it caught his nose, Prax was ravenous. Lentil soup? Holden asked as Prax and Amos sat on either side of Alex. That would be wonderful, Prax said. I'll just take a tube of goo, Amos said. Lentils give me gas, and I can't see popping an intestine next time we accelerate being fun for anyone. Holden put a fresh bowl in front of Prax and handed a white tube with a black plastic nipple to Amos, then sat beside Naomi. They didn't touch, but the connection between them was unmistakable. He wondered whether May had ever wanted him to reconcile with Nicola. Impossible now. Okay, Alex, Holden said. What have we got? Same thing we had before, Alex said. Six destroyers burning like hell towards us a matching force burning after them, and a racing pinnace heading away from us on the other side. Wait, Prax said. Away from us? They're matching our course. Already did the turnaround, and they're getting up speed to join us. Prax closed his eyes, picturing the vectors. We're almost there, then? He said. Very nearly, Alex said. Eighteen, twenty hours. How's it going to play out? Are the Earth ships going to catch us? They're going to catch the hell out of us, Alex said. But not before we get that pinnace. Call it four days after, maybe. Prax took a spoonful of the soup. It tasted just as good as it smelled. Green, dark leaves were mixed in with the lentils, and he spread one open with his spoon, trying to identify it. Spinach, maybe. The stem margin didn't look quite right, but it had been cooked, after all. How sure are we this isn't a trap? Amos asked. We aren't, Holden said. But I don't see how it would work. If they want us in custody instead of dead, Naomi suggested. We're talking about opening our airlock for someone way high up in the Earth government. So she is who she says she is? Prax asked. Looks like it, Holden said. Alex raised a hand. Well, if it's to talk to some little grandma from the U.N. or get my ass shot off by six destroyers, I'm thinking we can break out the cookies and tea, right? It would be late in the game to go for another plan, Naomi said. It makes me damn uncomfortable having Earth saving me from Earth, though. Structures are never monolithic, Prax said. There's more genetic variation within Belters or Martians or Earthers than there is between them. Evolution would predict some divisions within the group's structures and alliances without members. You see the same thing in ferns. Ferns? Naomi asked. Ferns can be very aggressive, Prax said. A soft chime interrupted them. Three rising notes, like bells, gently struck. Okay, suck it down, Alex said. That's the fifteen-minute warning. 
Amos made a prodigious sucking sound, the white tube withering at his lips. Prax put down his spoon and lifted the soup bowl to his lips, not wanting to leave a drop of it. Holden did the same, then started gathering up the used bowls. Anyone needs to hit the head, this is the time, he said. We'll talk again in... Eight hours, Alex said. Eight hours, Holden repeated. Prax felt his chest go tight. Another round of crushing acceleration. Hours of the couch's needles propping up his failing metabolism. It sounded like hell. He rose from the table, nodded to everyone, and went back to his bunk. His knee was much better. He hoped it would still be when he next got up. The ten-minute chime sounded. He lay down on the couch, trying to align his body perfectly, then waited. Waited. He rolled over and grabbed his hand terminal. Seven new incoming messages. Two of them supportive, three hateful, one addressed to the wrong person, and one a financial statement from the charity fund. He didn't bother reading them. He turned on the camera. Nicola, he said, I don't know what they told you. I don't know if you really think all those things that you said, but I know I never touched you in anger, even at the end. And if you really felt afraid of me, I don't know why it was. May is the one thing that I love more than anything in life. I'd die before I let anyone hurt her, and now half the solar system thinks I hurt her. He stopped the recording and began again. Nicola, honestly, I didn't think we had anything left between us to betray. He stopped. The five-minute warning chimed as he ran his fingers through his hair. Each individual follicle ached. He wondered if this was why Amos kept his head shaved. There were so many things about being on a ship that didn't occur to you until you were actually there. Nicola. He erased all the recordings and logged into the charity bank account interface. There was a secure request format that could encrypt and send an authorized transfer as soon as Lightspeed delivered it to the bank's computers. He filled it all out quickly. The two-minute warning sounded, louder and more insistent. With thirty seconds left, he sent her money back. There was nothing else for them to say. He put the hand terminal in place and lay back. The computer counted backward from twenty, and the mountain rolled back over him. How's the knee? Amos asked. Pretty good, Prax said. I was surprised. I thought there'd be more damage. You didn't hyperextend this time, Amos said. Did okay with my toe, too. A deep tone rang through the ship, and the deck shifted under Prax. Holden, standing just to Prax's right, moved the rifle to his left hand and touched a control panel. Alex? Yeah, it was a little rough. Sorry about that, but hold on. Yeah, Cap, we've got seal, and they're knocking. Holden shifted the rifle back to his other hand. Amos also had a weapon at the ready. Naomi stood beside him, nothing in her hands but a terminal linked to ship's operations. If something went wrong, being able to control ship functions might be more useful than a gun. They all wore the articulated armor of the Martian military that had come with the ship. The paired ships were accelerating at a third of a G. The Earth destroyers still barreled down toward them. So, I'm guessing the firearms mean you're thinking trap, Captain? Amos asked. Nothing's wrong with an honor guard, Holden said. Prax held up his hand. You don't ever get one again, Holden said. No offense. No, I was just... I thought honor guards were usually on the same side as the people they're guarding. We may be stretching the definitions a little here, Naomi said. Her voice had just a trace of tension in it. She's just a little old politician, Holden said, and that pinnace can't hold more than two people. We've got her outnumbered, and if things get ugly, Alex is watching from the pilot's seat. You are watching, right? 
Oh, yeah, Alex said. So, if there are any surprises, Naomi can pop us loose and Alex can get us out of here. That won't help with the destroyers, though, Prax said. Naomi put a hand on his arm, squeezing him gently. I'm not sure you're helping, Prax. The outer airlock cycled open with a distant hum. The lights clicked from red to green. Whoa, Alex said. Problem? Holden snapped. No, it's just... The inner door opened, and the biggest person Prax had seen in his entire life stepped into the room, wearing a suit of some sort of strength-augmenting armor. If it weren't for the transparent faceplate, he would have thought it was a two-meter-tall bipedal robot. Through the faceplate, Prax saw a woman's features, large, dark eyes and coffee-with-cream skin. Her gaze raked them with a palpable threat of violence. Beside him, Amos took an unconscious step back. You're the captain, the woman said, the suit speakers making her voice sound artificial and amplified. It didn't sound like a question. I am, Holden said. I've got to say, you looked a little different on screen. The joke fell flat, and the giant stepped into the room. Planning to shoot me with that? she asked, pointing toward Holden's gun with a massive gauntleted fist. Would it work? Probably not, the giant said. She took another small step forward, her armor whining when she moved. Holden and Amos took a matching step back. Call it an honor guard, then, Holden said. I'm honored. Will you put them away now? Sure. Two minutes later, the guns were stowed, and the huge woman, who still hadn't given her name, tapped something inside the helmet with her chin and said, Okay, you're clear. The airlock cycled again, red to green, then the hum of the opening doors. The woman who came in this time was smaller than any of them. Her gray hair was spiking out in all directions, and the orange sari she wore hung strangely in the low-thrust gravity. Under Secretary Avasarla, Holden said. Welcome aboard. If there's anything I can... You're Naomi Nagata, the wizened little woman said. Holden and Naomi exchanged glances, and Naomi shrugged. I am? How the fuck do you keep your hair like that? I look like a hedgehog's been humping my skull. Um, looking the part is half of what's going to keep you all alive. We don't have time to screw around. Nagata, you get me looking pretty and girlish. Holden? I'm an engineer, not a damned hairstylist, Naomi said, anger creeping into her voice. Ma'am, Holden said, this is my ship and my crew. Half of us aren't even Earth citizens, and we don't just take your commands. All right. Miss Nagata, if we're going to keep this ship from turning into an expanding ball of hot gas, we need to make a press statement, and I'm not prepared to do that. Would you please assist me? Okay, Naomi said. Thank you. And Captain, you need a fucking shave. Chapter 41 of Asarala After the Guanxi Yin, the Rosinante seemed dour, mean, and utilitarian. There was no plush carpeting only fabric-covered foam to soften corners and angles where soldiers might be thrown when the ship maneuvered violently. Instead of cinnamon and honey, the air had the plastic and heat smell of military air recyclers. And there was no expansive desk, no wide, solitaire-ready bed, and no private space apart from a captain's lounge the size of a public toilet stall. Most of the footage they'd taken had been in the cargo bays, angled so that no ammunition or weaponry was in the image. Someone who knew Martian military vessels could tell where they were. To everyone else, it would be an open space with cargo crates in the background. Naomi Nagata had helped put the release together. She was a surprisingly good visual editor, and when it became clear that none of the men could manage a professional-sounding voiceover, she'd done that too. The crew assembled in the medical bay where the mechanic, Amos Burton, had changed the feed to display from her hand terminal. 
Now he was sitting on one of the patient beds, his legs crossed, smiling amiably. If Afasarala hadn't seen the intelligence files on Holden's crew, she'd never have guessed what the man was capable of. The others were spread out in a rough semicircle. Bobby was sitting beside Alex Kamal, the Martians unconsciously grouping together. Praxidiki Mung stood at the back of the room. Avasarala couldn't tell if her presence made him uncomfortable or if he was always like that. Okay, she said. Last chance for feedback. We shared some popcorn, Amos said, and the medical scanners flashed once, showing a broadcast code and then white block letters for immediate release. Avasarala and Holden appeared on the screen. She was speaking, her hands out before her as if illustrating a point. Holden looked sober, leaned toward her. Naomi Nagata's voice was calm, strong, and professional. In a surprising development, the deputy to Undersecretary of Executive Administration, Sadavir Aranwright, met with OPA Representative James Holden and a representative of the Martian military today to address concerns over the potentially earth-shattering revelations surrounding the devastating attack on Ganymede. The image cut to Avasarala. She was leaning forward to make her neck longer and hide the loose skin under her chin. Long practice made her look natural, but she could almost hear Arjun laughing. A runner at the bottom of the screen identified her by name and title. I expect to be traveling with Captain Holden to the Jovian system, Avasarala said. The United Nations of Earth feel very strongly that a multilateral investigation into this is the best way to restore balance and peace to the system. The image shifted to Holden and Avasarala sitting in the galley with the botanist. This time, the little scientist was talking, and she and Holden pretended to listen. The voiceover came again. When asked about the accusations leveled against Praxidike Mung, whose search for his daughter has become the human face of the tragedy on Ganymede, the Earth delegation was unequivocal. Then, back to Avasarala, her expression now sorrowful her head shaking in an almost subliminal negation. Nicola Mulko is a tragic figure in this, and I personally condemn the irresponsibility of these raw news feeds that allow statements from mentally ill people to be presented as if they were verified fact. Her abandonment of her husband and child is beyond dispute, and her struggles with her psychological issues deserve a more dignified and private venue. From off-camera, Nagata asked, So you blame the media? Absolutely, Avasarala said as the image shifted to a picture of a toddler with smiling black eyes and dark pigtails. We have absolute faith in Dr. Mung's love and dedication to May, and we are pleased to be part of the effort to bring her safely home. The recording ended. All right, Avasarala said. Any comments? I don't actually work for the OPA anymore, Holden said. I'm not authorized to represent the Martian military, Bobby said. I'm not even sure I'm still supposed to be working with you. Thank you for that. Are there any comments that matter? Avasarala asked. There was a moment's silence. Worked for me, Praxidiki Mung said. There was one way that the Rosinante was infinitely more expansive than the Guan Chi Yin, and it was the only one that she cared about. The tight beam was hers. Lag was worse, and every hour took her farther from Earth, but knowing that the messages she sent were getting off the ship without being reported to Nguyen and Aaronwright gave her the feeling of breathing free. What happened once they reached Earth, she couldn't control. But that was always true. That was the game. Admiral Souther looked tired. But on the small screen, it was hard to tell much more than that. You've kicked the beehive, Christian, he said. It's looking an awful lot like you just made yourself a human shield for a bunch of folks that don't work for us. And I'm guessing that was the plan. I did what you asked, and yes, Nguyen took meetings with Jules Pierre Mao. First one was just after his testimony on Protogen. And yes, Aaron Wright knew about them. 
but that doesn't mean very much. I've met with Mao. He's a snake. But if you stopped dealing with men like him, you wouldn't have much left to do. The smear campaign against your scientist friend came out of the executive office, which, I've got to say, makes a damn lot of us over here in the armed forces a bit twitchy. Starts looking like there's divisions inside the leadership, and it gets a little murky whose orders we're supposed to be following. If it gets there, our friend Aaron Wright still outranks you. Him or the Secretary General comes to me with a direct order, I'm going to have to have a hell of a good reason to think it's illegal. This whole thing smells like skunk, but I don't have that reason yet. You know what I'm saying? The recording stopped. Avasarala pressed her fingers to her lips. She understood. She didn't like it, but she understood. She levered herself up from her couch. Her joints still ached from the race to the Rocinante and the way the ship would sometimes shift beneath her. Course corrections, moving gravity a degree or two, left her vaguely nauseated. She'd made it this far. The corridor that led to the galley was short, but it had a bend just before it entered. The voices carried well enough that Avasarala walked softly. The low Martian drawl was the pilot, and Bobby's vowels in timbre were unmistakable. That telling the captain where to stand and how to look. I thought Amos was going to toss her in the airlock a couple of times. He could try, Bobby said. And you work for her? I don't know who the hell I work for anymore. I think I'm still pulling a salary from Mars, but all my dailies are out of her office budget. I've pretty much been playing it all as it comes. Sounds rough. I'm a Marine, Bobby said. And Avasarala paused. The tone was wrong. It was calm, almost relaxed, almost at peace. That was interesting. Does anyone actually like her? The pilot asked. No. Bobby said, almost before the question was done being asked. Oh, hell no. And she keeps it like that. That shit she pulled with Holden, marching on his ship and ordering him around like she owned it? She's always like that. The Secretary General? She calls him a bobblehead to his face. And what's with the potty mouth? Part of her charm, Bobby said. The pilot chuckled, and there was a little slurp as he drank something. I may have misunderstood politics, he said. And a moment later, You like her? I do. Mind if I ask why? We care about the same things, Bobby said. And the thoughtful note in her voice made Avasarala feel uncomfortable eavesdropping. She cleared her throat and walked into the galley. Where's Holden? she asked. Probably sleeping, the pilot said. The way we've been keeping the ship cycles about two in the morning. Ah, Avasarala said. For her, it was mid-afternoon. That was going to be a little awkward. Everything in her life seemed to be about lag right now, waiting for the messages to get through the vast blackness of the vacuum. But at least she could prepare. I'm going to want a meeting with everyone on board as soon as they're up, she said. Bobby, you'll need your formal wear again. It took Bobby only a few seconds to understand. You'll show them the monster, she said. And then we're going to sit here and talk until we figure out what exactly it is they know on this ship. But as the bad guys worried enough, they're willing to send their boys to kill them, she said. Yeah, about that, the pilot said. Those destroyers cut back to a cruising acceleration, but they aren't turning back yet. Doesn't matter, Avasarala said. Everybody knows I'm on this ship. No one's going to shoot at it. In the local morning and Avasarala's subjective early evening, the crew gathered again. Rather than bring the whole powered suit into the galley, she'd copied the stored video and given it to Naomi. The crew members were bright and well-rested, apart from the pilot, who had stayed up entirely too late talking to Bobby, and the botanist who looked like he might just be permanently exhausted. I'm not supposed to show this to anyone, Avasarala said, looking pointedly at Holden. But on this ship right now, I think we all need to put our cards on the table, and I'm willing to go first. This 
is the attack on Ganymede. The thing that started it all off. Naomi? Naomi started the playback, and Bobby turned away and stared at the bulkhead. Avasarla didn't watch it either, her attention on the faces of the others. As the blood and carnage played out behind her, she studied them and learned a little more about the people she was dealing with. The engineer, Amos, watched with the calm reserve of a professional killer. No surprise there. At first, Holden, Naomi, and Alex were horrified, and she watched as Alex and Naomi slid into a kind of shock. There were tears in the pilot's eyes. Holden, on the other hand, curled in. His shoulders bent outward from each other, and an expression of banked rage smoldered in his eyes and around the corners of his mouth. That was interesting. Bobby wept openly with her back to the screen, and her expression was melancholy, like a woman at a funeral, a memorial service. Praxitiki, everyone else called him Prax, was the only one who seemed almost happy. When, at the segment's end, the monstrosity detonated, he clapped his hands and squealed in pleasure. That was it, he said. You were right, Alex. Did you see how it was starting to grow more limbs? Catastrophic restraint failure. It was a failsafe. Okay, Avasarala said. Why don't you try that again with an antecedent? What was a failsafe? The other protomolecule form ejected the explosive device from its body before it could detonate. You see, these things, protomolecule soldiers or whatever, are breaking their programming, and I think Marion knows about it. He hasn't found a way to stop it because the constraints fail. Who's Marion? And what does she have to do with anything? Avasarala said. You wanted more nouns, Grandma, Amos said. Let me take this from the top, Holden said and recounted the attack by the stowaway beast, the damage to the cargo door, Prax's scheme to lure it out of the ship and reduce it to its component atoms with the drive's exhaust. Avasarala handed over the data she had about the energy spikes on Venus, and Prax grabbed that data, looking it over while talking about his determination of a secret base on Io where the things were being produced. It left Avasarala's head spinning. And they took your kid there? Avasarala said. They took all of them, Prax said. Why would they do that? Because they don't have immune systems, Prax said. And so they'd be easier to reshape with the protomolecule. There would be fewer physiological systems fighting against the new cellular constraints, and the soldiers would probably last a lot longer. Jesus, Doc, Amos said. They're going to turn May into one of those fucking things? Probably, Prax said, frowning. I only just figured that out. But why do it at all? Holden said. It doesn't make sense. In order to sell them to a military force is a first strike weapon, Avasarala said. To consolidate power before, well, before the fucking apocalypse. Point of clarification. Alex said, raising his hand. We have an apocalypse coming? Was that a thing we knew about? Venus, Avasarla said. Oh, that apocalypse, Alex said, lowering his hand. Right. Soldiers that can travel without ships, Naomi said. You could fire them off at high G for a little while, then cut engines and let them go ballistic. How would you find them? But it won't work. Prax said. Remember? They escape constraint. And since they can share information, they're going to get harder to hold to any kind of new programming. The room went silent. Prax looked confused. They can share information? Avasarla said. Sure, Prax said. Look at your energy spikes. The first one happened while the thing was fighting Bobby and the other Marines on Ganymede. The second spike came when the other one got loose in the lab. The third spike was when we killed it with the Rosinante. Every time one of them has been attacked, Venus reacted. They're networked. I'd assume that any critical information could be shared, like how to escape constraints. 
If they use them against people, Holden said, there won't be any way to stop them. They'll ditch the fail-safe bombs and just keep going. The battles won't end. Um, no, Prax said. That's not the problem. It's the cascade again. Once the protomolecule gets a little freedom, it has more tools to erode other constraints, which gets it more tools to erode more constraints, and on and on like that. The original program, or something like it, will eventually swamp the new program. They'll revert. Bobby leaned forward. Her head canted a few degrees to the right. Her voice was quiet, but it had a threat of violence that was louder than shouting. So, if they set those things loose on Mars, they stay soldiers like the first one for a while, and then they start dropping the bombs out like your guy did, and then they turn Mars into Eros? Well, worse than Eros, Prax said. Any decent-sized Martian city is going to have an order of magnitude more people than Eros did. The room was quiet. On the monitor, Bobby's suit camera looked up at a star-filled sky while battleships killed each other in orbit. I've got to send some messages out, Avasarala said. These half-human things you've made, they aren't your servants. You can't control them. Avasarada said. Jules Pierre Mao sold you a bill of goods. I know why you kept me out of this, and I think you're a fucking moron for it, but put it aside. It doesn't matter now. Just do not pull that fucking trigger. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't. You will be personally responsible for the single deadliest screw-up in the history of humankind, and I'm on a ship with Jim fucking Holden, so the bar's not low. The full recording clocked in at almost half an hour. The security footage from the Rosinante with its stowaway was attached. A fifteen-minute lecture by Prax had to be scrapped when he reached the part about his daughter being turned into a protomolecule soldier, and this time broke into uncontrollable weeping. Avasarala did her best to recapitulate it, but she wasn't at all certain she had the details right. She'd considered bringing John Michael into it, but decided against it. Better to keep it in the family. She sent the message. If she knew Aaron right, he wouldn't get back to her immediately. There would be an hour or two of evaluation, weighing what she'd said, and then, when she'd been left to stew for a while, he'd reply. She hoped he'd be sane about it. He had to. She needed to sleep. She could feel the fatigue gnawing at the edges of her mind, slowing her. But when she lay down, rest felt as far away as home, as Arjun. She thought about recording a message for him, but it would only have left her feeling more powerfully isolated. After an hour, she pulled herself up and walked through the halls. Her body told her it was midnight, or later, and the activity on board, music ringing out of the machine shop, a loud conversation between Holden and Alex about maintenance of the electronic systems, even Praxitikis sitting in the galley by himself, apparently grooming a box of hydroponics cuttings, had a surreal late-night feeling. She considered sending another message to Souther. The lag time would be much less to him, and she was hungry enough for a response that anything would do. When the answer came, it wasn't a message. Captain, Alex said over the ship-wide comm. You should come up to Ops and look at this. Something in his voice told Avasarala that this wasn't a maintenance question. She found the lift to Ops just as Holden went up and pulled herself up the ladder rather than wait. She wasn't the only one who'd followed the call. Bobby was in a spare seat, her eyes on the same screen as Holden's. The blinking tactical data scrolled down the screen, and a dozen bright red dots displayed changes. She didn't understand most of what she saw, but the gist was obvious. The destroyers were on the move. Okay, Holden said. What are we seeing? All the Earth destroyers hit high burn, 6G, Alex said. Are they going to Io? Oh, hell no. This 
was Aaron Wright's answer. No messages, no negotiations, not even an acknowledgement that she'd asked him to restrain himself. Warships. The despair only lasted for a moment. Then came the anger. Bobby. Yeah? That part where you told me I didn't understand the danger I was in? And you told me that I didn't know how the game was played? That part. I remember. What about it? If you wanted to say, I told you so, this looks like the right time. Chapter 42 Holden Holden had spent a month at the Diamond Head Electronic Warfare Lab on Oahu as his first posting after Officer Candidate School. During that time, he'd learned he had no desire to be a naval intelligence wonk, really disliked poi, and really liked Polynesian women. He'd been far too busy at the time to actively chase one, but he'd thoroughly enjoyed spending his few spare moments down at the beach looking at them. He'd had a thing for curvy women with long black hair ever since. The Martian Marine was like one of those cute little beach bunnies that someone had used editing software on and blown up to 150% normal size. The proportions, the black hair, the dark eyes, everything was the same, only giant. It short-circuited his neural wiring. The lizard living at the back of his brain kept jumping back and forth between mate with it and flee from it. What was worse, she knew it. She seemed to have sized him up and decided he was only worth a tired smirk within moments of their meeting. Do you need me to go over it again? she said, the smirk mocking him. They were sitting together in the galley, where she'd been describing for him the Martian intelligence on the best way to engage the Monroe-class light destroyer. No, he wanted to yell. I heard you. I'm not a freak. I have a lovely girlfriend that I'm totally committed to, so stop treating me like some kind of bumbling teenage boy who's trying to look down your dress. But then he'd look up at her again, and his hind brain would start bouncing back and forth between attraction and fear, and his language centers would start misfiring. Again. No, he said, staring at the neatly organized list of bullet points she'd forwarded to his hand terminal. I think this information is very informative. He saw the smirk widen out of the corner of his eye and focused more intently on the list. Okay, Bobby said. I'm going to catch some rack time. With your permission, of course, Captain. Permission granted, Holden said. Of course. Go, Rack. She pushed herself to her feet without touching the arms of the chair. She'd grown up in Martian gravity. She had to mass a hundred kilos at one G, easy. She was showing off. He pretended to ignore it, and she left the galley. She's something, isn't she? Avasarala said, coming into the galley and collapsing into the recently vacated chair. Holden looked up at her and saw a different kind of smirk. One that said the old lady saw right through him, to the warring lizards at the back of his head. But she wasn't a giant Polynesian woman, so he could vent his frustration on her. Yeah, she's a peach, he said. But we're still going to die. What? When those destroyers catch us, which they will, we are going to die. The only reason they aren't raining torpedoes down on us already is because they know our PDC network can take out anything fired at this range. Avasarala leaned back in her chair with a heavy sigh, and the smirk shifted into a tired but genuine smile. I don't suppose there's any chance you could find an old woman a cup of tea, could you? Holden shook his head. I'm sorry, no tea drinkers on the crew. Lots of coffee, though, if you'd like a cup. I'm actually tired enough to do that. Lots of cream. Lots of sugar. How about, Holden said, pulling her a cup, lots of sugar, lots of powder that's called whitener. Sounds like piss. I'll take it. Holden sat down and pushed the sweetened and whitened cup of coffee across to her. She took it and grimaced through several long swallows. Explain 
she said after another drink. Everything you just said. Those destroyers are going to kill us, Holden repeated. The sergeant says you refuse to believe that UN ships will fire on you, but I agree with her. That's naive. Okay, but what's a PTC network? Holden tried not to frown. He'd expected any number of things from the woman, but ignorance hadn't been one. Point defense cannons. If those destroyers fire torpedoes at us from this distance, the targeting computer for the PDCs won't have any trouble shooting them down. So they'll wait until they get close enough that they can overwhelm us. I give it three days before they start. I see, Avasarala said. And what's your plan? Holden barked out a laugh with no humor in it. Plan? My plan is to die in a ball of superheated plasma. There's literally no way that a single fast-attack corvette, which is us, can successfully fight six light destroyers. We aren't in the same weight class as even one of them. But against one, a lucky shot, maybe. Against six, no chance. We die. I've read your file, Avasarala said. You faced down a UN corvette during the Eros incident. Yeah, one corvette. We were a match for her. And I got her to back down by threatening the unarmed science ship she was escorting. This isn't even remotely the same thing. So, what does the infamous James Holden do at his last stand? He was silent for a while. He rats, Holden said. We know what's going on. We have all the pieces now. Mal Quick, the protomolecule monsters, where they're taking the kids, everything. We put all the data in a file and broadcast it to the universe. They can still kill us if they want to, but we can make it a pointless act of revenge. Keep it from actually helping them. No, Avasarala said. Uh, no? You might be forgetting whose ship you're on. I'm sorry, did I seem to give a fuck that this is your ship? If I did, really, I was just being polite, Avasarala said, giving him a withering glare. You aren't going to fuck up the whole solar system just because you're a one-trick pony. We have bigger fish to fry. Holden counted to ten in his head and said, Your idea is... Send it to these two UN admirals, she said, then tapped something on her terminal. His buzzed with the received file. Souther and Leniki. Mostly Souther. I don't like Leniki, and he hasn't been in the loop on this, but he's a decent backup. You want my last act before being killed by a UN admiral to be sending all of the vital information I have to a UN admiral. Avasarala leaned back into her chair and rubbed her temples with her fingertips. Holden waited. I'm tired, she said after a few minutes, and I missed my husband. It's like an ache in my arms that I can't hold him right now. Do you know what that's like? I know exactly what that ache feels like. So I want you to understand that I'm sitting here right now, coming to terms with the idea that I won't see him again. Or my grandchildren. Or my daughter. My doctor said I probably had a good thirty years left in me. Time to watch my grandkids grow up. Maybe even see a great-grandchild or two. But instead I'm going to be killed by a limp-dick, whiny son-of-a-bitch like Admiral Nguyen. Holden could feel the massive weight of those six destroyers bearing down on them, murder in their hearts. It felt like having a pistol pushed into his ribs from behind. He wanted to shake the old woman and to tell her to hurry up. She smiled at him. My last act in this universe isn't going to be fucking up everything I did right up to now. Holden made a conscious effort to ignore his frustration. He got up and opened the refrigerator. Hey, there's leftover pudding. Want some? I've read your psych profile. I know all about your everyone-should-know-everything naive bullshit. But how much of the last war was your fault, with your goddamn endless pirate broadcasts? Well, none of it, Holden said. Desperate psychotic people do desperate psychotic things when they're exposed. I refuse to grant them immunity from exposure out of fear of their reaction. When you do, the desperate psychos wind up in charge. 
She laughed. It was a surprisingly warm sound. Anyone who understands what's going on is at least desperate and probably psychotic to boot. Dissociative at the least. Let me explain it this way, Avasarala said. You tell everyone, and yeah, you'll get a reaction. And maybe weeks or months or years from now it will all get sorted out. But you tell the right people, and we can sort it out right now. Amos and Prax walked into the galley together. Amos had his big thermos in his hand and headed straight toward the coffee pot. Prax followed him and picked up a mug. Avasarala's eyes narrowed, and she said, Maybe even save that little girl. May? Prax said immediately, putting the mug down and turning around. Oh, that was low, Holden thought, even for a politician. Yes. May, Avasarala replied. That's what this is about, right, Jim? Not some personal crusade, but trying to save a little girl from very bad people? Explain how... Holden started, but Avasarala kept talking right over the top of him. The UN isn't one person. It isn't even one corporation. It's a thousand little petty factions fighting against each other. Their side's got the floor, but that's temporary. That's always temporary. I know people who can move against Nguyen and his group. They can cut off his support, strip him of ships, even recall and court-martial him, given enough time. But they can't do any of that if we're in a shooting war with Mars. And if you toss everything you know into the wind, Mars won't have time to wait and figure out the subtleties. They'll have no choice but to preemptively strike against Nguyen's fleet, Io what's left of Ganymede, everything. Io, Prax said. But May, so you want me to give all the info to your little political cabal back on Earth when the entire reason for this problem is that there are little political cabals back on Earth? Yes, Avasarla said. And I'm the only hope she's got. You have to trust me. I don't, not even a little bit. I think you're part of the problem. I think you see all of this as political maneuvering and power games. I think you want to win. So no, I don't trust you at all. Hey, uh, Cap, Amos said, slowly screwing the top onto his thermos. Ain't you forgetting something? What, Amos? What am I forgetting? Don't we vote on shit like this now? Don't pout, Naomi said. She was stretched out on a crash couch next to the main operations panel on the ops deck. Holden was seated across the room from her at the comm panel. He'd just sent out Avasarla's data file to her two UN admirals. His fingers itched with a desire to dump it into a general broadcast. But they'd debated the issue for the crew, and she'd won the vote. The whole voting thing had seemed like such a good idea when he'd first brought it up. After losing his first vote, not so much. They'd all be dead in two days, so at least it probably wouldn't happen again. If we get killed, and Avasarala's pet admirals don't actually do anything with the data we just sent, this was all for nothing. You think they'll bury it? Naomi said. I don't know, and that's the problem. I don't know what they'll do. We met this UN politician two days ago, and she's already running the ship. So, send it to someone else, too, Naomi said. Someone who you can trust to keep it quiet, but can get the word out if the UN guys turn out to be working for the wrong team. That's not a bad idea. Fred, maybe? No, Holden laughed. Fred would see it as political capital. He'd use it to bargain with. It needs to be someone that has nothing to gain or lose by using it. I'll have to think about it. Naomi got up, then came over to straddle his legs and sit on his lap, facing him. And we're all about to die. That's not making any of this any easier. Not all of us, he thought. Naomi gathered the crew up, the Marine and Avasarla too. The galley, I guess. I have some last business to announce. I'll meet you guys there in ten minutes. She kissed him lightly on the nose. Okay, we'll be there. 
When she disappeared from sight down the crew ladder, Holden opened up the chief of the watch's locker. Inside were a set of very out-of-date code books, a manual of Martian naval law, and a sidearm and two magazines of ballistic gel rounds. He took out the gun, loaded it, and strapped the belt and holster around his waist. Next, he went back to the comm station and put Avasarla's data package into a tight-beam transmission that would bounce from Ceres to Mars to Luna to Earth using public routers all the way. It would be unlikely to send up any red flags. He hit the video record button and said, Hi, Mom. Take a look at this. Show it to the family. I have no idea how you'll know when the right time to use it is, but when that time comes, do with it whatever seems best. I trust you guys, and I love you. Before he could say anything else, or think better of the whole thing, he hit the transmit key and turned the panel off. He called up the ladder lift, because riding it would take longer than climbing the ladder, and he needed time to think out exactly how to play the next ten minutes. When he reached the crew deck, he still didn't have it all figured out, but he squared his shoulders and walked into the galley anyway. Amos, Alex, and Naomi were sitting on one side of the table, facing him. Prax was in his usual perch on the counter. Bobby and Avasarla sat sideways on the other side of the table so that they could see him. That put the Marine less than two meters away, with nothing between her and him. Depending on how this went, that might be a problem. He dropped his hand to the butt of the gun at his hip to make sure everyone saw it, then said, We have about two days before the elements of the UN Navy get close enough to overwhelm our defenses with a torpedo salvo and destroy the ship. Alex nodded, but no one spoke. But we have the Mao racing pinnace that brought Avasarla to us attached to the hull. It holds two. We're going to stick two people on it and get them away. Then we're going to turn around and head straight for those UN ships to buy the pinnace time. Who knows? We may even take one with us. Get ourselves a few servants in the afterlife. Fucking A, Amos said. I can support that, Avasarla said. Who are the lucky bastards? And how do we stop the UN ships from just killing it after they kill this ship? Prax and Naomi. Holden said immediately, before anyone else could speak. Prax and Naomi go on the ship. Okay, Amos said, nodding. Why? Naomi and Avasarla said at the same moment. Prax, because he's the face of this whole thing. He's the guy who figured it all out. And because when someone finally rescues his little girl, it'd be nice if her daddy was there, Holden said. Then, tapping the butt of the gun with his fingers... And Naomi, because I fucking said so. Questions? Nope, Alex said. Works for me. Holden was watching the Marine closely. If someone tried to take the gun from him, it would be her. And she worked for Avasarla. If the old lady decided she wanted to be on the Razorback when it left, the Marine would be the one who tried to make that happen. But to his surprise... She didn't move except to raise her hand. Sergeant? Two of those six Martian ships that are tailing the UN boys are new Raptor-class fast cruisers. They can probably catch the Razorback if they really want to. Would they? Holden asked. It was my impression that they were there to keep an eye on the UN ships and nothing else. Well, probably not, but... She drifted off mid-sentence with a distant look in her eyes. So that's the plan, Holden said. Prax, Naomi, get whatever supplies you need packed up and get on the Razorback. Everyone else, I'd appreciate it if you waited here while they did that. Hold on a minute, Naomi protested, her voice angry. Before Holden could respond, Bobby spoke again. Hey, you know, I just had an idea. Chapter 43 Bobby They were all missing something. It was like someone knocking at the back of her mind, demanding to be let in. Bobby went over it in her head. 
Sure, that prick Nguyen showed every sign he was willing to kill the Rosinante, ranking UN politician on board or not. Avasarla had made a gamble that her presence would back the UN ships off. It seemed she was about to lose that bet. There were still six UN destroyers bearing down on them. But there were six more ships tailing them. Including, as she'd just pointed out to Holden, two Raptor-class fast-attack cruisers, top-of-the-line Martian military hardware and more than a match for any UN destroyer. Along with the two cruisers were four Martian destroyers. They might or might not be better than their UN counterparts, but with the two cruisers in their wing, they had a significant tonnage and firepower advantage. And they were following the UN ships to see that they weren't about to do something to escalate the shooting war. Like killing the one UN politician who wasn't straining at the leash for a war with Mars. Hey, you know, Bobby said before she realized she was going to say anything. I just had an idea. The galley fell silent. Bobby had a sudden and uncomfortable memory of speaking up in the UN conference room and wrecking her military career in the process. Captain Holden, the cute one who was a little too full of himself, was staring at her, a not particularly flattering gape on his face. He looked like a very angry person who'd lost his train of thought mid-rant. And Avasarala was staring at her too, though having learned to read the old lady's expression better, she didn't see anger there, just curiosity. Well, Bobby said, clearing her throat, there are six Martian ships following those UN ships, and the Martian ships outclass them. Both navies are at high alert. No one moved or spoke. Avasarala's curiosity had turned to a frown. So, Bobby continued, they might be willing to back us up. Avasarala's frown had only gotten deeper. Why, she said, would the Martians give a fuck about protecting me from being killed by my own damn navy? Would it hurt to ask? No, Holden said. I'm thinking no. Is everyone else here thinking it wouldn't hurt? Who'd make the call? Avasarala asked. You, the traitor? The words were like a gut punch. But Bobby realized what the old lady was doing. She was hitting Bobby with the worst possible Martian response, gauging her reaction to it. Yeah, I'd open the door, Bobby said. But you're the one that will have to convince them. Avasarala stared at her for a very long minute, then said, Okay. Repeat that, Rosinante, the Martian commander said. The connection was as clear as if they were standing in the room with the man. It wasn't the sound quality that was throwing him. Avasarala spoke slowly, enunciating carefully all the same. This is Assistant Undersecretary Christian Avasarala of the United Nations of Earth, Avasarala said again. I am about to be attacked by a rogue element of the UN Navy while I'm on my way to a peacekeeping mission in the Jupiter system. Fucking save me. I will reward you by talking my government out of glassing your planet. I'm going to have to send this up the chain, the commander said. They weren't using a video link, but the grin was audible in his voice. Call whoever you need to call, Avasarala said. Just make a decision before these cunts start raining missiles down on me, all right? I'll do my best, ma'am. The skinny one her name was Naomi, killed the connection and swiveled to look at Bobby. Why would they help us again? Mars doesn't want a war, Bobby replied, hoping she wasn't talking completely out of her ass. If they find out that the UN's voice of reason is on a ship that's about to be killed by rogue UN warhawks, it only makes sense for them to step in. Kind of sounds like you're talking out of your ass there, Naomi said. Also, Avasarala said, I just gave them permission to shoot at the UN Navy without political repercussions. Even if they help, Holden said, there's no way they can completely stop the UN ships from taking some shots at us. We'll need an engagement plan. We just got this damn thing put back together, 
Amos said. I still say we stick Prax and Naomi on the Razorback, Holden said. I'm starting to think that's a bad idea, Avasarla said. She took a sip of coffee and grimaced. The old lady was definitely missing her five cups of tea a day. Explain, Holden said. Well, if the Martians decide they're on our side, that changes the whole landscape for those UN ships. They can't beat all seven of us, if I understand the math right. Okay, Holden said. That makes it in their interest not to be called a rogue element in the history books. If Nguyen's cabal fails, everyone on his team gets at minimum a court-martial. The best way to make sure that doesn't happen is to make sure I don't survive this fight, no matter who wins. Which means they'll be shooting at the Rossi, Naomi said, not the pinnace. Of course not, Avasarla said with a laugh. Because of course I'll be on the pinnace. You think for a second they'll believe that you're desperately trying to protect an escaped craft that I'm not on? And I bet the Razorback doesn't have those PDCs you were talking about, does it? To Bobby's surprise, Holden was nodding as Avasarla spoke. She'd sort of pegged him as a know-it-all who fell in love only with his own ideas. Yeah, Holden said. You're absolutely right. They'll fling everything they've got at the Razorback as she tries to get away and she'll have no defense. Which means we all live or we all die right here on this ship, Naomi said with a sigh. As usual. So, again, Holden said, we need an engagement plan. This is a pretty thin crew, Bobby said, now that the conversation had moved back to her area of expertise. Where's everyone usually sit? Operations officer? Holden said, pointing at Naomi. She also does electronic warfare and countermeasures. And she's a savant, considering she'd never worked it before we got this ship. Mechanic? Holden started, pointing at Amos. Grease monkey, Amos said, cutting him off. I do my best to keep the ship from falling apart when there's holes in it. I usually man the combat ops board, Holden said. Who's the gunner? Bobby asked. Yo, said Alex, pointing at himself. You fly and do target acquisition? Bobby said. I'm impressed. Alex's already dark skin grew a shade darker. His aw shucks Mariner Valley draw had started to go from annoying to charming, and the blush was sweet. Oh, no. The captain does acquisition from combat ops generally, but I have to manage fire control. Well, there you go. Bobby said, turning to Holden. Give me weps. No offense, Sergeant, Holden said. Gunny, Bobby replied. Gunny, Holden agreed with a nod. But are you qualified to operate fire control on a naval vessel? Bobby decided not to be offended and grinned at him instead. I saw your armor and the weapons you were carrying in the airlock. You found a map in the cargo bay, right? Map? Avasarla asked. Mobile assault package. Marine assault gear. Not as good as my force recon armor, but full kit for a half a dozen ground pounders. Yeah, Holden said. That's where we got it. That's because this is a multi-role fast attack ship. Torpedo bomber is just one of them. Boarding party insertion is another. And gunnery sergeant is a rank with a very specific meaning. Yeah, Alex said. Equipment specialist. I'm required to be proficient in all of the weapon systems my platoon or company might need to operate during a typical deployment, including the weapon systems on an assault boat like this. I see, Holden started, but Bobby cut him off with a nod. I'm your gunner. Like most things in Bobby's life, the weapons officer's chair had been made for someone smaller than her. The five-point harness was digging into her hips and her shoulders. Even at its farthest setting, the fire control console was just a bit too close for her to comfortably rest her arms on the crash couch while using it. All of which would be a problem if they had to do any really high-G maneuvering. Which, of course, they would once the fight started. She tucked her elbows in as close as she could to keep her arms from wrenching out of their sockets at high-G, 
and fidgeted with the harness. It would have to be good enough. From his seat behind and above her, Alex said, This'll be over quick one way or the other. You probably won't have time to get too uncomfortable. That's reassuring. Over the 1MC, Holden said, We're inside the maximum effective weapon range now. They could fire immediately or twenty hours from now, so stay belted in. Only leave your station in life-threatening emergency and at my direct order. I hope everyone got their catheter on right. Mine's too tight, Amos said. Alex spoke behind her, and it was echoed a split second later over the comm channel. It's a condom catheter, partner. It goes on the outside. Bobby couldn't help laughing and held one hand up behind her until Alex slapped it. Holden said, We have greens across the board down here and ops. Everyone check in with go, no-go status. All green at flight control, Alex said. Green at electronic warfare, Naomi said. We'll go down here, Amos said. Weapons are green and hot, Bobby said last. Even strapped into a chair two sizes too small for her, on a stolen Martian warship, captained by one of the most wanted men in the inner planets, it felt really goddamn good to be there. Bobby restrained a whoop of joy and instead pulled Holden's threat display up. He'd already marked the six pursuing UN destroyers. Bobby tagged the lead ship and let the Rosinante try to come up with a target solution on it. The Rossi calculated the odds of a hit at less than 0.1 percent. She jumped from target to target, getting a feel for the response times and controls. She tapped a button to pull up target info and looked over the UN destroyer specs. When reading ship specs bored her, she pulled out of the tactical view. One tiny green dot pursued by six slightly larger red dots, which were in turn pursued by six blue dots. That was wrong. The Earth ships should be blue, and the Martians red. She told the Rossi to swap the color scheme. The Rosinante was oriented toward the pursuing ships. On the map, it looked like they were flying directly at each other. But in reality, the Rosinante was in the middle of a deceleration burn, slowing down to let the UN ships catch up faster. All thirteen of the ships in this particular engagement were hurtling sunward. The Rossi was just doing it as first. Bobby glanced at the time and saw that her noodling with the controls had burned less than fifteen minutes. I hate waiting for a fight. You and me both, sister, Alex said. Got any games on this thing? Bobby asked, tapping on her console. I spy with my little eye, Alex replied. Something that begins with D. Destroyer, Bobby said. Six tubes, eight PDCs, and a keel-mounted rapid-fire railgun. Good guess. Your turn. I fucking hate waiting for a fight. When the battle began, it began all at once. Bobby had expected some early probing shots, a few torpedoes fired from extreme range just to see if the crew of the Rosinante had full control of all the weapon systems and everything was in working order. Instead, the UN ships had closed the distance, the Rossi slamming on the brakes to meet them. Bobby watched the six UN ships creep closer and closer to the red line on her threat display the red line that represented the point at which a full salvo from all six ships would overwhelm the Rossi's point defense network. Meanwhile, the six Martian ships moved closer to the green line on her display that represented their optimal firing range to engage the UN ships. It was a big game of chicken, and everyone was waiting to see who would flinch first. Alex was juggling their deceleration thrust to try to make sure the Martians got in range before the Earthers did. When the shooting started, he would put the throttle down and try to move through the active combat zone as quickly as possible. It was why they were going to meet the UN ships in the first place. Running away would just have kept them in range a lot longer. Then one of the Red Dots, a Martian fast attack cruiser, crossed the green line, and alarms started going off all over the ship. Fast movers, Naomi said. The Martian cruiser has fired eight torpedoes. 
Bobby could see them. Tiny yellow dots shifting to orange as they took off at high G. The UN ships immediately responded. Half of them spun around to face the pursuing Martian ships and opened up with their rail guns and point defense cannons. The space on the tactical display between the two groups was suddenly filled with yellow-orange dots. Incoming, Naomi yelled. Six torpedoes on a collision course. Half a second later, the torpedo's vector and speed information popped up on Bobby's PDC control display. Holden had been right. The skinny belter was good at this. Her reaction times were astonishing. Bobby flagged all six torpedoes for the PDCs, and the ship began to vibrate as they fired in rapid staccato. Juice coming, Alex said, and Bobby felt her couch prick her in half a dozen places. Cold pumped into her veins, quickly becoming white hot. She shook her head to clear the threatening tunnel vision while Alex said, Three, two. He never said one. The Rosinante smashed into Bobby from behind, crushing her into her crash couch. She remembered at the last second to keep her elbows lined up and avoided having her arms broken as every part of her tried to fly backward at ten gravities. On her threat display, the initial wave of six torpedoes fired at them winked out one by one as the Rossi tracked and shot them down. More torpedoes were in the air, but now the entire Martian wing had opened up on the Earthers, and the space around the ships had become a confusion of drive tails and detonations. Bobby told the Rossi to target anything on an approach vector and shoot at it with the point defenses, leaving it up to Martian engineering and the universe's good graces. She switched one of the big displays to the forward cameras, turning it into a window on the battle. Ahead of her, the sky was filled with bright white flashes of light and expanding clouds of gas as torpedoes detonated. The UN ships had decided that the Martians were the real threat, and all six of them had spun to face the enemy ships head-on. Bobby tapped a control to throw a threat overlay onto the video image, and suddenly the sky was full of impossibly fast blobs of light as the threat computer put a glowing outline on every torpedo and projectile. The Rosinante was coming up fast on the UN destroyers, and the thrust dropped to 2G. Here we go, Alex said. Bobby pulled up the torpedo targeting system and targeted the drive cones of two of the ships. Two away, she said, releasing her first two fish into the water. Bright drive tails lit the sky as they streaked off. The ready-to-fire indicator went red as the ship reloaded the tubes. Bobby was already selecting the drive cones for the next two UN ships. The instant the ready indicator went green, she fired them both. She targeted the last two destroyers, then checked on the progress of her first two torpedoes. They were both gone, shot down by the destroyer's aft BDCs. A wave of fast-moving blobs of light hurtled toward them, and Alex threw the ship sideways, dancing out of the line of fire. It wasn't enough. A yellow atmosphere-warning light began rotating in the cockpit, and a ditone klaxon sounded. We're hit. Holden said, his voice calm. Dumping the atmosphere, hope everyone has their hat on tight. As Holden shut down the air system, the sounds of the ship faded until Bobby could hear only her own breathing and the faint hiss of the one MC channel on her headset. Wow, Amos said over the comm. Three hits, small projectiles, probably PDC rounds, managed to go right through us without hitting anything that mattered. It went through my room the scientist Prax said. But that woke you up, Amos said, his voice a grin. I soiled myself, Prax replied without a hint of humor. Quiet, Holden said, but there was no malice in it. Stay off the channel, please. Bobby let the rational, thinking part of her mind listen to the back and forth. She had no use for that part of her brain right now. The part of her mind that had been trained to acquire targets and fire torpedoes at them worked without her interference. The lizard was driving now. She didn't know how many torpedoes she'd fired, 
when there was an enormous flash of light and the camera display blacked out for a second. When it came back, one of the UN destroyers was torn in two, the rapidly separating pieces of hull spinning away from each other, trailing a faint gas cloud and small bits of jetsam. Some of those things flying out of the shattered ship would be UN sailors. Bobby ignored that. The lizard rejoiced. The destruction of the first UN ship tipped the scales, and within minutes the other five were heavily damaged or destroyed. A UN captain sent out a distress call and immediately signaled surrender. Bobby looked at her display. Three UN ships destroyed, three heavily damaged. The Martians had lost two destroyers, and one of their cruisers was badly damaged. The Rocinante had three bullet wounds that had let all her air out, but no other damage. They'd won. Holy shit, Alex said. Captain, we have got to get one of these. It took Bobby a minute to realize he was talking about her. You have the gratitude of the UN government, Avasarla was saying to the Martian commander, or at least the part of the UN government I run. We're going to Io to blow up some more ships and maybe stop the apocalypse. Want to come with? Bobby opened a private channel to Avasarla. We're all traitors now. Ha! the old lady said. Only if we lose. Chapter 44 Holden From the outside, the damage to the Rocinante was barely noticeable. The three point-defense cannon rounds fired by one of the UN destroyers had hit her just forward of the sick bay, and, after a short diagonal trip through the ship, exited through the machine shop two decks below. Along the way, one of them had passed through three cabins in the crew deck. Holden had expected the little botanist to be a wreck, especially after his crack about soiling himself. But when Holden had checked on him after the battle, he'd been surprised by the nonchalant shrug the scientist had given. It was very startling, was all he'd said. It would be easy to write it off as shell shock. The kidnapping of his daughter, followed by months of living on Ganymede as the social structure collapsed, Easy to see Prax's calm as the precursor to a complete mental and emotional breakdown. God knew the man had lost control of himself half a dozen times, and most of them inconvenient. But Holden suspected there was a lot more to Prax than that. There was a relentless forward motion to the man. The universe might knock him down over and over again, but unless he was dead, he'd just keep getting up and shuffling ahead toward his goal. Holden thought he had probably been a very good scientist, thrilled by small victories, undeterred by setbacks, plodding along until he got to where he needed to be. Even now, just hours after nearly being cut in two by a high-speed projectile, Prax was below decks with Naomi and Avasarala patching holes inside the ship. He hadn't even been asked. He just climbed out of his bunk and pitched in. Holden stood above one of the bullet entry points on the ship's outer hull. The small projectile had left a perfectly round hole and almost no dimpling. It had passed through five centimeters of high-tensile alloy armor so quickly it hadn't even dented it. Found it, Holden said. No light coming out, so it looks like they've already patched it on the inside. Coming, Amos said then clumped across the hull on magnetic boots, a portable welding torch in his hand. Bobby followed in her fancy powered armor, carrying big sheets of patch material. While Bobby and Amos worked on sealing up the outer hull breach, Holden wandered off to find the next hull. Around him, the three remaining Martian warships drifted along with the Rocinante like an honor guard. With their drives off... They were visible only as small black spots that moved across the starfield. Even with the Rossi telling his armor where to look, and with the HUD pointing the ships out, they were almost impossible to see. Holden tracked the Martian cruiser on his HUD until it passed across the bright splash of the Milky Way's ecliptic. For a moment, 
The entire ship was a black silhouette framed in the ancient white of a few billion stars. A faint cone of translucent white sprayed out from one side of the ship, and it drifted back into the star-speckled black. Holden felt a desire to have Naomi standing next to him, looking up at the same sights that bordered on a physical ache. I forget how beautiful it is out here, he said to her over their private channel instead. You daydreaming and letting someone else do all the work? She replied. Yeah. More of these stars have planets around them than don't. Billions of worlds. Five hundred million planets in the habitable zone was the last estimate. Think our great-grandkids will get to see any of them? Our grandkids? When this is over. Also, Naomi said, at least one of those planets has the protomolecule masters on it. Maybe we should avoid that one. Honestly, that's the one I'd like to see. Who made this thing? What's it all for? I'd love to be able to ask. And, at the very least, they share the human drive to find every habitable corner and move in. We might have more in common than we think. They also kill whoever lived there first. Holden snorted. We've been doing that since the invention of the spear. They're just scary good at it. You found that next hole yet? Amos said over the main channel, his voice an unwelcome intrusion. Holden pulled his gaze away from the sky and back to the metal beneath his feet. Using the damage map the Rossi was feeding to his HUD, it took only a moment to find the next entry wound. Yeah, yeah, right here, he said, and Amos and Bobby began moving in his direction. Cap, Alex said, chiming in from the cockpit. The captain of the MCRN cruiser is looking to talk to you. Patch him through to my suit. Roger, Alex said, and then the static on the radio shifted in tone. Captain Holden, I read you, go ahead. This is Captain Richard Sang of the MCRN Sidonia. Sorry we weren't able to speak sooner. I've been dealing with damage control and arranging for rescue and repair ships. I understand, Captain, Holden said, trying to spot the Sidonia again, but failing. I'm out of my hull patching a few holes myself. I saw you guys drive by a minute ago. My XO says you'd ask to speak to me. Yes, and thank her on my behalf for all the help so far, Holden said. Listen, we burned through an awful lot of our stores in that skirmish. We fired fourteen torpedoes and nearly half of our point defense ammunition. Since this used to be a Martian ship, I thought maybe you'd have reloads that would fit our racks. Sure. Captain Sang said, without a moment's hesitation. I'll have the destroyer Sally Ride pull alongside for munitions transfer. Uh, Holden said, shocked by the instant agreement. He'd been prepared to negotiate. Thanks. I'll pass along my intel officer's breakdown of the fight. You'll find it interesting viewing. But the short version is that first kill, the one that broke open the UN defense screen and ended the fight, that was yours. Guess they shouldn't have turned their backs on you. You guys can take credit for it, Holden said with a laugh. I had a Martian Marine gunnery sergeant doing the shooting. There was a pause. Then Sang said, When this is over, I'd like to buy you a drink and talk about how a dishonorably discharged UN naval officer winds up flying a stolen MCRN torpedo bomber crewed by Martian military personnel and a senior UN politician. It's a damn good story, Holden replied. Say, speaking of Martians, I'd like to get one of mine a present. Do you carry a marine detachment on the Sidonia? Yes, why? Got any force recon marines in that group? Yes, again, why? There's some equipment we'll need that you've probably got in storage. He told Captain Sang what he was looking for, and Sang said, I'll have the ride give you one when we do the transfer. The MCRN's Sally Ride looked like she'd come through the fight without a scratch. When she pulled up next to the Rosinante, her dark flank looked as smooth and unmarred as a pool of black water. After Alex and the Ride's pilot had perfectly matched course, a large hatch in her side opened up, 
dim red emergency lighting spilling out. Two magnetic grapples were fired across, connecting the ships with ten meters of cable. This is Lieutenant Graves, a girlish voice said. Prepare to begin cargo transfer on your order. Lieutenant Graves sounded like she should still be in high school, but Holden said, Go ahead, we're ready on this end. Switching channels to Naomi, he said, Pop the hatches, new fish coming aboard. A few meters from where he was standing, a large hatch that was normally flush with the hull opened up into a meter-wide and eight-meter-long gap in the skin of the ship. A complicated-looking system of rails and gears ran down the sides of the opening. At the bottom sat three of the Rosinante's remaining ship-to-ship -ship torpedoes. Seven in here, Holden said, pointing at the open torpedo rack, and seven on the other side. Roger, said Graves. The long, narrow white shape of a plasma torpedo appeared in the ride's open hatch, with sailors wearing EVA packs flanking it. With gentle puffs of compressed nitrogen, they flew the torpedo down along the two guidelines to the Rossi. Then, with the help of Bobby's suit-augmented strength, they maneuvered it into position at the top of the rack. First one in position, Bobby said. Got it, Naomi replied, and a second later the motorized rails came to life and grabbed the torpedo, pulling it down into the magazine. Holden glanced at the elapsed time on his HUD. Getting all fourteen torpedoes transferred and loaded would take hours. Amos, he said, where are you? Just finishing that last patch down by the machine shop, the mechanic replied. You need something? When you're done with that, grab a couple of EVA packs. You and I will go get the other supplies. Should be three crates of PDC rounds and some sundries. I'm done now. Naomi, pop the cargo door for me, would you? Holden watched Bobby and the ride sailors work, and they had two more torpedoes loaded by the time Amos arrived with two EVA packs. Lieutenant Graves, two crew from the Rosinante requesting permission to board and pick up the rest of the supplies. Granted, Rosinante. The PDC rounds came in crates of 20,000, and at full gravity would have weighed more than 500 kilos. In the microgravity of the coasting ships, two people with EVA packs could move one, if they were willing to take their time and recharge their compressed nitrogen after every trip. Without a salvage mech or a small work shuttle available, there wasn't any other choice. Each crate had to be pushed slowly toward the aft of the Rosinante, through a twenty-second long burn from Amos's EVA pack. When it got to the aft of the ship, next to the cargo bay door, Holden would do an equally long thrust from his pack to bring the crate to a stop. Then the two of them would maneuver it inside and lock it to a bulkhead. The process was long, and at least for Holden, each trip had one heart-racing moment when he was firing the brakes to stop the crate. Every time, he had a brief, panicky vision of his EVA pack failing, and him and the crate of ammo drifting off into space while Amos watched. It was ridiculous, of course. Amos could easily grab a fresh EVA pack and come and get him, or the ship could drop back, or the ride could send a rescue shuttle— or any other of a huge number of ways he'd be quickly saved. But humans hadn't been living and working in space nearly long enough for the primitive part of the brain not to say, I'll fall. I'll fall forever. The people from the ride finished bringing over torpedoes about the time Holden and Amos had locked the last crate of PDC ammo into the cargo bay. Naomi, Holden called on the open channel. We all green? Everything looks good from here. All of the new torpedoes are talking to the Rossi and reporting operational. Outstanding. Amos and I are coming in through the cargo bay airlock. Go ahead and seal the bay up. Alex, as soon as Naomi gives the all clear, let the Sedonia know we can do a fast burn to Io at the captain's earliest pleasure. While the crew prepped the ship for the trip to Io, Holden and Amos stripped off their gear and stowed it in the machine shop. Six gray discs, three on each bulkhead across the compartment from each other, showed where the rounds had ripped through this part of the ship. What's in that other box the Martians gave you? 
Amos asked, pulling off one oversized magnetic boot. A present for Bobby, Holden said. I'd like to keep it quiet until I give it to her, okay? Sure, no problem, Captain. If it turns out to be a dozen long-stemmed roses, I don't want to be there when Naomi finds out. Plus, you know, Alex. No, it's a lot more practical than roses, Holden started, then rewound the conversation in his head. Alex? What about Alex? Amos shrugged with his hands like a belter. I think he might have a wee bit of a thing for our ample marine. You're kidding. Holden couldn't picture it. It wasn't as though Bobby were unattractive, far from it. But she was also very big and quite intimidating, and Alex was such a quiet and mild guy. Sure, they were both Martians, and no matter how cosmopolitan a person got, there was something comforting in reminders of home. Maybe just being the only two Martians on the ship was enough. But Alex was pushing fifty, balding without complaint, and wore his love handles with the quiet resignation of a middle-aged man. Sergeant Draper couldn't be more than thirty and looked like a comic book illustration, complete with muscles on her muscles. Unable to stop himself, his mind began trying to figure out how the two of them would fit together. It didn't work. Wow, was all he could say. Is it mutual? No idea, Amos replied with another shrug. The sergeant ain't easy to read, but I don't think she'd do him any deliberate harm, if that's what you're asking. Not that, you know, we could stop her. Scares you too, does she? Look, Amos said with a grin, when it comes to scrapes, I'm what you might call a talented amateur. But I've gotten a good look at that woman in and out of that fancy mechanical shell she wears. She's a pro. We're not playing the same sport. Gravity began to return in the Rosinante. Alex was bringing up the drive, which meant they were beginning their run to Io. Holden stood up and took a moment to let his joints adjust to the sensation of weight again. He clapped Amos on the back and said, Well, you've got a full load of torpedoes and bullets, three Martian warships trailing you, one angry old lady in tea withdrawal, and a Martian marine who could probably kill you with her own teeth. What do you do? You tell me, Captain. You find someone else for them to fight. Chapter 45 Avasarala As I see it, sir, Avasarala said, the die is already cast. We effectively have two courses of policy already in play. The question now is how we move forward. So far... I've been able to keep the information from getting out, but once it does, it will be devastating. And since it is all but certain that the artifact is able to communicate, the chances of an effective military usage of these protomolecule human hybrids is essentially nil. If we use this weapon, we will be creating a second Venus, committing genocide, and removing any moral argument against using weapons like accelerated asteroids against the Earth itself. I hope you will excuse the language, sir, but this was a cock-up from the start. The damage done to human security is literally unimaginable. It seems clear at this point that the protomolecule project underway on Venus is aware of events in the Jovian system. It's plausible that the samples out here have the information gained from the destruction of the Arbogast. To say that makes our position problematic is to radically understate the case. If it had gone through the appropriate channels, we would not be in this position. As it stands, I have done all that is presently within my capabilities, given my situation. The coalition I have built between Mars, elements of the Belt, and the legitimate government of Earth are ready to take action. But the United Nations must distance itself from this plan and move immediately to isolate and defang the faction within the government that has been doing this weasel shit. Again. Excuse the language. I have sent copies of the data included here to Admiral Souther and Leniki, as well as to my team on the Venus problem. They are, of course, at your disposal to answer any questions if I am not available. I'm very sorry to put you in the position, sir, but you are going to have to choose sides in this, and quickly. Events out here have developed a momentum of their own. 
If you're going to be on the right side of history on this, you must move now. If there's any history to be on the right side of, she thought. She tried to come up with something else that she could say, some other argument that would penetrate the layers of old-growth wood that surrounded the Secretary General's brain. There weren't any, and repeating herself in simple storybook rhyme would probably come off as condescending. She stopped the recording, cut off the last few seconds of her looking into the camera in despair, and sent it off with every high-priority flag there was and diplomatic encryption. So this was what it came to. All of human civilization, everything it had managed, from the first cave painting to crawling up the gravity well and pressing out into the antechamber of the stars, came down to whether a man, whose greatest claim to fame was that he'd been thrown in prison for writing bad poetry, had the balls to back down Ehrenreich. The ship corrected under her, shifting like an elevator suddenly slipping its tracks. She tried to sit up, but the gimbaled couch moved. God, but she hated space travel. Is it going to work? The botanist stood in her doorway. He was stick-thin with a slightly larger head than looked right. He wasn't built as awkwardly as a belter, but he couldn't be mistaken for someone who'd grown to maturity living at full gravity. Standing in her doorway trying to find something to do with his hands, he looked awkward and lost and slightly otherworldly. I don't know, she said. If I were there, it would happen the way I want it to happen. I could go squeeze a few testicles until they saw it my way. From here, maybe, maybe not. You can talk to anyone from here, though, can't you? It isn't the same. He nodded, his attention shifting inward. Despite the differences in skin color and build, the man suddenly reminded her of Michael John. He had the same sense of being a half-step back from everything. Only Michael John's detachment verged on autism, and Praxitiki Mung was a little more visibly interested in the people around him. They got to Nicola, he said. They made her say those things about me, about May. Of course they did. That's what they do. And if they wanted to, they'd have papers and police reports to back it all up, backdated and put in the databases of everywhere you ever lived. I hate it that people think I did that. Avasarla nodded, then shrugged. Reputation never has very much to do with reality, she said. I could name half a dozen paragons of virtue that are horrible, small-souled, evil people. And some of the best men I know, you'd walk out of the room if you heard their names. No one on the screen is who they are when you breathe their air. Holden, Prax said. Well, he's the exception, she said. The botanist looked down and then up again. His expression was almost apologetic. May's probably dead, he said. You don't believe that. It's been a long time. Even if they had her medicine, they've probably turned her into one of these things. You still don't believe that, she said. The botanist leaned forward, frowning like she'd given him a problem he couldn't immediately solve. Tell me it's all right to bomb Io. I can have thirty nuclear warheads fired now. Turn off the engines, let them fly ballistic. They won't all get through, but some will. Say the word now, and I can have Io reduced to slag before we even get there. You're right, Prax said. And then a moment later, Why aren't you doing that? Do you want the real reason, or my justification? Both? I justify it this way, she said. I don't know what is in that lab. I can't assume that the monsters are only there, and if I destroy the place, I might be slagging the records that would let me find the missing ones. I don't know everyone involved in this, and I don't have proof against some of the ones I do know. It may be down there. I'll go. I'll find out. 
and then I will reduce the lab to radioactive glass afterward. Those are good reasons. They're good justifications. I find them very convincing. But the reason is that May might still be alive. I don't kill children, she said. Not even when it's the right thing to do. You will be surprised how often it's hurt my political career. People used to think I was weak until I found the trick. The trick. If you can make them blush, they think you're a hard-ass, she said. My husband calls it the mask. Oh, Prax said. Thank you. Waiting was worse than the fear of battle. Her body wanted to move, to get away from her chair and walk through the familiar halls. The back of her mind shouted for action, movement, confrontation. She paced the ship top to bottom and back again. Her mind went through trivia about all the people she met in the halls, the small detritus from the intelligence reports she'd read. The mechanic, Amos Burton. Implicated in several murders, indicted, never tried. Took an elective vasectomy the day he was legally old enough to do so. Naomi Nagata, the engineer. Two master's degrees. Offered full-ride scholarship for a Ph.D. on Ceres Station and turned it down. Alex Kamal, pilot. Seven drunk and disorderlies when he was in his early twenties. Had a son on Mars he still didn't know about. James Holden, the man without secrets. The holy fool who dragged the solar system into war and seemed utterly blind to the damage he caused. An idealist. The most dangerous kind of man there was. And a good man, too. She wondered whether any of it mattered. The only real player near enough to talk to, without lag turning the conversation utterly epistolary, was Souther, and he was still putatively on the same side as Nguyen, and preparing to face battle with the ships protecting her. The opportunities were few and far between. Have you heard anything? he asked from her terminal. No, she said. I don't know what's taking the fucking bobblehead so long. You're asking him to turn his back on the man he's trusted the most. And how fucking long does that take? When I did it, it was over in maybe five minutes. Sorin, I said, you're a douchebag. Get out of my sight. It isn't harder than that. And if he doesn't come through? Souther asked. She sighed. Then I call you back and try talking you into going rogue. Ah, Souther said with a half-smile. And how do you see that going? I don't like my chances, but you never know. I can be damn persuasive. An alert popped up. A new message. From Arjun. I have to go, she said. Keep an ear to the ground, or whatever the hell you do out here where the ground doesn't mean anything. Be safe, Christian, Souther said, and vanished into the green background of a dead connection. Around her, the galley was empty. Still, someone might come in. She lifted the hem of her sari and walked to her little room, sliding her door closed before she gave her terminal permission to open the file. Arjun was at his desk, his formal clothes on, but undone at the neck and sleeves. He looked like a man just returned from a bad party. The sunlight streamed in behind him. Afternoon, then. It had been afternoon when he'd sent it. And it might still be. She touched the screen, her fingertips tracing the line of his shoulder. So, I understand from your message that you may not come home, he said. I'm sorry, she said to the screen. As you imagined, I find the thought distressing, he said. And then a smile split his face. Dancing in eyes she now saw were red with tears. But what can I do about it? I teach poetry to graduate students. I have no power in this world. That has always been you. 
And so I want to offer you this. Don't think about me. Don't take your mind from what you're doing on my account. And if you don't... Arjun took a deep breath. If life transcends death, then I will seek for you there. If not, then there too. He looked down and then up again. I love you, Kiki. And I will always love you, from whatever distance. The message ended. Avasarala closed her eyes. Around her the ship was as close and confining as a coffin. The small noises of it pressed in against her until she wanted to scream, until she wanted to sleep. She let herself weep for a moment. There was nothing else to be done. She had taken her best shot, and there was nothing to be done but meditate and worry. Half an hour later, her terminal chimed again, waking her from troubled dreams. Aaron Wright. Anxiety knotted her throat. She lifted a finger to begin the playback, and then paused. She didn't want to. She didn't want to go back into that world, wear her heavy mask. She wanted to watch Arjun again. Listen to his voice. Only, of course, Arjun had known what she would want. It was why he'd said the things he had. She started the message. Aaron Wright looked angry. More than that, he looked tired. His pleasant demeanor was gone, and he was a man made entirely of salt water and threat. Chris Jen, he said. I know you won't understand this, but I have been doing everything in my power to keep you and yours safe. You don't understand what you've waded into, and you are fucking things up. I wish you had had the moral courage to come to me with this before you ran off like a horny sixteen-year-old with James Holden. Honestly, if there was a better way to destroy any professional credibility you once had, I can't think what it would have been. I put you on the Guan Shi Yin to take you off the board because I knew that things were about to go hot. Well, they are. Only you're in the middle of them, and you don't understand the situation. Millions of people stand in real danger of dying badly because of your egotism. You're one of them. Our June's another, and your daughter. All of them are in threat now because of you. In the image, Aaron Wright clasped his hands together, pressing his knuckles against his lower lip, the platonic ideal of a scolding father. If you come back now, I might, might be able to save you. Not your career, that's gone, forget it. Everyone down here sees that you're working with the OPA and Mars. Everyone thinks you've betrayed us, and I can't undo that. Your life and your family, that's all I can salvage. But you have to get away from this circus you've started, and you have to do it now. Time's short, Christian. Everything important to you hangs in the balance, and I cannot help you if you don't help yourself. Not with this. It's last chance time. Ignore me now, and the next time we talk, someone will have died. The message ended. She started it again, and then a third time. Her grin felt feral. She found Bobby in the ops deck with the pilot Alex. They stopped talking as she came in. A question in Bobby's expression. Avasarala held up a finger and switched the video feed to display on the ship monitors. Aaron Wright came to life. On the big screen, she could see his pores and the individual hairs in his eyebrows. As he spoke, Avasarala saw Alex and Bobby grow sober, leaning in toward the screen as if they were all at a poker table and coming to the end of a high-stakes hand. All right. Bobby said. What do we do? We break out the fucking champagne, Avasarala said. What did he just tell us? There is nothing in that message. Nothing. He is walking around his words like they've got poison spikes on them, and what's he got? Threats. No one makes threats. Wait, Alex said. That was a good sign? That was excellent, Avasarala said. And then something else, something small, fell into place in the back of her mind, and she started laughing and cursing at the same time. What? 
What is it? If life transcends death, then I will seek for you there. If not, then there too, she said. It's a fucking haiku. That man has a one-track mind and one train on it. Poetry. Save me from poetry. They didn't understand, but they didn't need to. The real message came five hours later. It came on a public news feed, and it was delivered by Secretary General Esteban Sorrento Gillis. The old man was brilliant at looking somber and energetic at the same time. If he hadn't been the executive of the largest governing body in the history of the human race, he'd have made a killing promoting health drinks. The whole crew had gathered by now. Amos, Naomi, Holden, Alex, even Prax. They were sandwiched into the ops deck, their combined breaths just slightly overloading the recyclers and giving the deck a feeling of barn heat. All eyes were on the screen as the Secretary General took the podium. I have come here tonight to announce the immediate formation of an investigative committee. Accusations have been made that some individuals within the governing body of the United Nations and its military forces have taken unauthorized and possibly illegal steps in dealing with certain private contractors. If these accusations are true, they must be addressed in the most expedient possible manner. If unfounded, they must be dispelled and those responsible for spreading these lies called to account. I need not remind you all of the years I spent as a political prisoner. Oh, fuck me, Avasarla said, clapping her hands in glee. He's using the outsider speech. That man's asshole must be tight enough right now to bend space. I have dedicated my terms as Secretary General to rooting out corruption, and as long as I have this gavel I shall continue to do so. Our world and the solar system we all share must be assured that the United Nations honors the ethical, moral, and spiritual values that hold us all together as a species. On the feed, Esteban Sorrento Gillis nodded, turned, and strode away in a clamor of unacknowledged questions and the commentators flowed into the space, talking over each other in all the political opinions of the spectrum. Okay, Holden said. So, did he actually say anything? He said Erin Wright is finished, Avasarla said. If he had any influence left at all, that announcement would never have been made. God damn, I wish I was there. Erin Wright was off the board. All that left was Nguyen, Mao, Strickland, or whoever he was, their half-controlled protomolecule warriors, and the building threat of Venus. She let a long breath rattle through her throat and the spaces behind her nose. Ladies and gentlemen, she said, I have just solved our smallest problem. Chapter 46 Bobby one of Bobby's most vivid memories was of the day she got her orders to report to the 2nd Expeditionary Force Spec War Training Facility. Force Recon. The top of the heap for a Martian ground pounder. In boot camp, they'd trained with a Force Recon sergeant. He'd been wearing a suit of gleaming red power armor, and they'd watched him demonstrate its use in a variety of tactical situations. At the end... He'd told them that the top four boots from her class would be transferred to the Spec War facility on the slopes of Hecate's Tholus, and trained to wear the armor and join the baddest fighting unit in the solar system. She decided that meant her. Determined to win one of those four coveted slots, she'd thrown herself into her boot camp training with everything she had. It turned out that was quite a lot. Not only did she make it into the top four, she was number one by an embarrassing margin. And then the letter came, ordering her to report to Hecate Base for recon training, and it was all worth it. She called her father and just screamed for two minutes. When he finally got her to calm down and tell him what she was calling about, he screamed back for even longer. You're one of the best now, baby, he'd said at the end and the warmth those words put in her heart had never really faded. 
Even now, sitting on the grey metal deck in the dirty machine shop on a stolen Martian warship. Even with all her mates torn into pieces and scattered across the frozen surface of Ganymede. Even with her military status in limbo and her loyalty to her nation justifiably in question. Even with all that, you're one of the best now, baby, made her smile. She felt an ache to call her father and tell him what had happened. They'd always been close, and when neither of her brothers had followed in his footsteps by choosing a military career, she had. It had just strengthened the connection. She knew he'd understand what it was costing her to turn her back on everything she held sacred to avenge her team. And she had a powerful premonition she would never see him again. Even if they made it through to Jupiter with half the UN fleet hunting them, and even if, when they got there, Admiral Nguyen and the dozen or more ships he controlled didn't immediately blow them out of the sky, and even if they managed to stop whatever was happening in orbit around Io with the Rosinante intact, Holden was still planning to land and save Prax's daughter. The monsters would be there. She knew it as surely as she'd ever known anything in her life. Each night she dreamed of facing it again the thing flexing its long fingers and staring at her with its two large, glowing blue eyes, ready to finish what it had started all those months earlier on Ganymede. In her dream, she raised a gun that grew out of her hand and started shooting it as it ran toward her, black spider webs spilling from holes that closed like water. She always woke before it reached her, but she knew how the dream would end with her shattered body left cooling on the ice. She also knew that when Holden led his team down to the laboratories on Io where the monsters were made, she'd go along with him. The scene from her dream would play out in real life. She knew it like she knew her father's love. She welcomed it. On the floor around her lay the pieces of her armor. With weeks of travel on the way to Io... She had time to completely strip and refit it. The Rosinante's machine shop was well stocked, and the tools were of Martian make. It was the perfect location. The suit had seen a lot of use without much maintenance, but if she was being honest with herself, the distraction was the payoff. A suit of Martian reconnaissance armor was an incredibly complex machine, finely tuned to its wearer. Stripping and reassembling it wasn't a trivial task. It required full concentration. Every moment she spent working on it was another moment when she didn't think about the monster waiting to kill her on Io. Sadly, that distraction was over now. She'd finished with the maintenance, even finding the micro-fracture and a tiny valve that was causing the slow but persistent leak of fluid in the suit's knee actuator. It was time to just put it all back together. It had the feeling of ritual, a final cleansing before going out to meet death on the battlefield. I've watched too many Kurosawa movies, she thought, but couldn't quite abandon the idea. The imagery was a lovely way of turning angst and suicidal ideation into honor and noble sacrifice. She picked up the torso assembly and carefully wiped it off with a damp cloth, removing the last bits of dust and machine oil that clung to the outside. The smell of metal and lubricant filled the air. And while she bolted armor plating back onto the frame, the red enameled surface covered with a thousand dings and scratches, she stopped fighting the urge to ritualize the task and just let it happen. She was very likely assembling her death shroud. Depending on how the final battle went, this ceramic and rubber and alloy might house her corpse for the rest of eternity. She flipped the torso assembly over and began working on the back. A long gouge in the enamel showed the violence of her passage across Ganymede's ice when the monster had self-destructed right in front of her. She picked up a wrench, then put it back down, tapping on the deck with her knuckle. Why then? Why had the monster blown itself up at that moment? She remembered the way it had started to shift new limbs bursting from its body as it watched her. 
If Brax was right, that was the moment the constraint systems that Mao's scientists had installed failed. And they'd set the bomb up to detonate if the creature was getting out of their control. But that just pushed the question one level back. Why had their control over the creature's physiology failed at that precise moment? Prax said that regenerative processes were a good place for constraint systems to fail, and her platoon had riddled the creature with gunfire as it had charged their lines. It hadn't seemed to hurt it at the time, but each wound represented a sudden burst of activity inside the creature's cells, or whatever it had in place of cells, as the monster healed. Each was a chance for the new growth to slip the leash. Maybe that was the answer. Don't try to kill the monster. Just damage it enough that the program starts to break down and the self-destruct kicks in. She wouldn't even have to survive. Just last long enough to harm the monster beyond its ability to safely repair itself. All she needed was enough time to really hurt it. She put down the armor plate she was working on and picked up the helmet. The suit's memory still had the gun camera footage of the fight on it. She hadn't watched it again after Avasarala's presentation to the crew of the Rossi. She hadn't been able to. She pushed herself to her feet and hit the comm panel on the wall. Hey, Naomi? You an ops? Yep, Naomi said after a few seconds. You need something, Sergeant? Do you think you can tell the Rossi to talk to my helmet? I've got the radio on, but it won't talk to civilian stuff. This is one of our boats, so I figure the Rossi has the keys and codes. There was a long pause, so Bobby put the helmet on a work table next to the closest wall monitor and waited. I'm seeing a radio node that the Rossi is calling MCRMR Goliath 32439-7A15. That's me. Bobby said. Can you send control of that node down to the panel in the machine shop? Done, Naomi said after a second. Thanks, Bobby said, and killed the calm. It took her a moment to re-familiarize herself with the Martian military video software and to convince the system to use out-of-date data unpacking algorithms. After a few false starts, the raw gun camera footage from her fight on Ganymede was playing on the screen. She set it to endless loop and sat back down on the deck with her suit. She finished bolting the back armor on and began attaching the torso's power supply and main hydraulic system during the first playthrough. She tried not to feel anything about the images on screen, nor to attach any significance to them or to think of them as a puzzle to be solved. She just concentrated on her work on the suit with her mind and let her subconscious chew on the data from the screen. The distraction caused her to redo things occasionally as she worked, but that was fine. She wasn't on a deadline. She finished attaching the power supply and main motors. Green lights lit up on the hand terminal she had plugged into the suit's brain. On the wall screen by her helmet, a UN soldier was hurled across the surface of Ganymede at her a confusion of images as she dodged away. When the image steadied, both the UN Marine and her friend Tev Hillman were gone. Bobby picked up an arm assembly and began reattaching it to the torso. The monster had picked up a soldier in a suit of armor comparable to her own and then thrown him with enough force to kill instantly. There was no defense against that kind of strength, except not to get hit. She concentrated on putting the arm back together. When she looked up at the screen again, the feed had restarted. The monster was running across the ice, chasing the UN soldiers. It killed one of them. The bobby on the video began firing, followed by her entire platoon opening up. The creature was fast, but when the UN soldiers suddenly turned to open a firing lane for the Martians, the creature didn't react quickly. So maybe fast in a straight line, but not a lot of lateral speed. That might be useful. The video caught up again to the UN soldier being thrown into Private Hillman. The creature reacted to gunfire, to injuries, 
even though they didn't slow it down. She thought back to the video she'd seen of Holden and Amos engaging the creature in the Rosinante's cargo hold. It had largely ignored them until Amos started shooting it, and then it had erupted into violence. But the first creature had attacked the UN troop station, so at least to some degree they could be directed, given orders. Once they no longer had orders, they seemed to lapse into a default state of trying to get increased energy and break the constraints. While in that state, they ignored pretty much everything but food and violence. The next time she ran into one, unless it had specifically been ordered to attack her, she could probably pick her own battleground, draw it to her where she wanted to be. That was useful, too. She finished attaching the arm assembly and tested it, greens across the board. Even if she wasn't sure whom she was working for, at least she hadn't forgotten how to do her job. On the screen, the monster ran up the side of the big mech, Yojimbo, and tore the pilot's hatch off. Saeed, the pilot, was hurled away, again with the ripping and throwing. It made sense. With a combination like enormous strength and virtual immunity to ballistic damage as your tool set, running straight at your opponent, then ripping them in two, was a pretty winning strategy. Throwing heavy objects at lethal speeds went hand in hand with the strength. And kinetic energy was a bitch. Armor might deflect bullets or lasers, and it might help cushion impacts, but no one had ever made armor that could shrug off all the kinetic energy imparted by a large mass moving at high speed. At least, not in something a human could wear. If you were strong enough, a garbage dumpster was better than a gun. So when the monster attacked, it ran straight at its enemy, hoping to get a grip on them, which pretty much ended the fight. If it couldn't do that, it tried to hurl heavy objects at the opponent, the one in the cargo bay had nearly killed Jim Holden by throwing a massive crate. Unfortunately, her armor had a lot of the same restrictions it had. While it made her very fast when she wanted to be, it wasn't particularly good at lateral movement. Most things built for speed weren't. Cheetahs and horses didn't do a lot of sideways running. She was strong in her suit, but not nearly as strong as it was. She did have an advantage with firearms in that she could run away from the creature while continuing to attack from range. The creature couldn't throw a massive object at her without stopping and anchoring itself. It might be ungodly strong, but it still only weighed what it weighed, and Newton had a few things to say about a light object throwing a heavy one. By the time she'd finished assembling her suit, she'd watched the video over a hundred times and the tactics of the fight were starting to take shape in her head. In hand-to-hand -hand combat training, she'd been able to overpower most of her opponents. But the small and quick fighters, the ones who knew how to stick and move, gave her trouble. This was who she'd be in this fight. She'd have to hit and run, never stopping for a moment. And even then she'd need a lot of luck because she was fighting way out of her weight class, and one shot from the monster was a guaranteed knockout. Her other advantage was that she really didn't have to win. She just had to do enough damage to make the monster kill itself. By the time she'd climbed into her newly refurbished suit and let it close around her for a final test, she was pretty sure she could do that. Bobby thought her newfound peace about the battle to come would finally let her sleep. But after three hours of tossing and turning in her rack, she gave up. Something still itched at the back of her head. She was trying to find her Bushido, and there were still too many things she couldn't let go of. Something wasn't giving her permission yet. So she pulled on a large fuzzy bathrobe she'd stolen from the Guanxi Yin and rode the ladder lift up toward the ops deck. It was third watch, so the ship was deserted. Holden and Naomi had a cabin together, and she found herself envying that human contact right now. Something certain to cling to amid all the other uncertainty. Avasarala was in her borrowed cabin, probably sending messages to people back on Earth. 
Alex would be asleep in his room. And for a brief moment she considered waking him. She liked the gregarious pilot. He was genuine in a way she hadn't seen much of since leaving active duty. But she also knew that waking a man up at 3 a.m. while in her bathrobe sent signals she didn't intend. Rather than try to explain that she just needed to talk to someone, she passed the crew deck by and kept going. Amos was sitting at a station in Ops with his back to her, taking the late watch. To avoid startling him, she cleared her throat. He didn't move or react, so she walked to the comm station. Looking back at him, she saw that his eyes were closed and his breathing was very deep and regular. Sleeping on a duty watch would get you captain's mast at the least on an MCRN ship. It seemed Holden had let discipline lapse a bit since his Navy days. Bobby opened up the comms and found the closest relay for tight beam traffic. First, she called her father. Hi, Pop. Not sure you should try and answer this. The situation here is volatile and evolving rapidly. But you may hear a lot of crazy shit over the next few days. Some of it might be about me. Just know that I love you guys, and I love Mars. Everything I did was to try to protect you and my home. I might have lost my way a little bit because things got complicated and hard to figure out, but I think I see a clear path now, and I'm going to take it. I love you and Mom. Tell the boys they suck. Before she turned off the recording, she reached out and touched the screen. Bye, Dad. She pressed send, but something still felt incomplete. Outside her family... Anyone who'd tried to help her in the last three months was sitting on the same ship she was. So it didn't make sense. Except, of course, that it did. Because not everyone was on this ship. Bobby punched up another number from memory and said, Hi, Captain Martins. It's me. I think I know what you were trying to help me see. I wasn't ready for it then, but it stuck with me. So you didn't waste your time. I get it now. I know this wasn't my fault. I know I was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm going back to the start now because I understand. Not angry, not hurt, not blaming myself. Just my duty to finish the fight. Something loosened in her chest the moment she hit the send button. All the threads had been neatly tied up, and now she could go to Io and do what she needed to do without regret. She let out a long sigh and slid down on the crash couch until she was almost prone. She suddenly felt bone-tired, like she could sleep for a week. She wondered if anyone would get mad if she just crashed out in ops instead of going all the way back down the lift. She didn't remember having fallen asleep, but here she was, stretched out in the comm station's crash couch, a small puddle of drool next to her head. To her relief, her robe seemed to have remained mostly in place, so at least she hadn't bare-assed everyone walking through. Gunny, Holden said in a tone of voice that meant he was saying it again. He was standing over her, a concerned look on his face. Sorry, sorry, she said sitting up and pulling her robe more tightly around her middle. I needed to send out some messages last night. Must have been more tired than I thought. Yeah, Holden said. It's no problem. Sleep wherever you like. Okay, Bobby said, backing toward the crew ladder. With that, I think I'll go down and take a shower and try to turn back into a human. Holden nodded as she went, a strange smile on his face. Sure. Meet me in the machine shop when you're dressed. Roger that, she said, and bolted down the ladder. After a decadently long shower and a change into her clean red and gray utility uniform, she grabbed a cup of coffee from the galley and made her way back down to the machine shop. Holden was already there. He had a crate the size of a guitar case sitting on one of the workbenches and a larger square crate next to his feet on the deck. When she entered the compartment, he patted the crate on the table. This is for you. 
I saw when you came on board that you seemed to be missing yours. Bobby hesitated a moment, then walked over to the crate and flipped it open. Inside sat a two-millimeter electrically fired three-barrel Gatling gun, of the type the Marines designated a Thunderbolt Mark V. It was new and shiny, and exactly the type that would fit into her suit. This is amazing, Bobby said after catching her breath. But it's just an awkward club without ammo. Holden kicked the crate on the floor. Five thousand rounds of two-millimeter caseless, incendiary tipped. Incendiary? You forget I've seen the monster up close, too. Armor piercing doesn't help at all. If anything, it reduces soft tissue damage. But since the lab stuck an incendiary bomb into all of them, I figure that means they aren't fireproof. Bobby lifted the heavy weapon out of the crate and put it on the floor next to her newly reassembled suit. Oh, hell yes. Chapter 47 Holden Holden sat at the combat control console on the operations deck and watched Ragnarok gather. Admiral Souther, who Avasarala had assured everyone was one of the good guys, had joined his ships with their small but growing fleet of Martians as they sped toward Io. Waiting for them in orbit around that moon were the dozen ships in Admiral Nguyen's fleet. More Martian and UN ships sped toward that location from Saturn and the Belt. By the time everyone got there, there would be something like thirty-five capital ships in the kill zone and dozens of smaller interceptors and corvettes like the Rosinante. Three dozen capital ships. Holden tried to remember if there had ever been a fleet action of this size, and couldn't think of one. Including Admiral Nguyen's and Admiral Souther's flagships, there would be four Truman-class UN dreadnoughts in the final tally, and the Martians would have three Doniger-class battleships of their own, any one of which could depopulate a planet. The rest would be a mix of cruisers and destroyers. Not quite the heavy hitters the battleships were, but plenty powerful enough to vaporize the Rosinante, which, if he was being honest, was the part Holden was most worried about. On paper, his team had the most ships. With Souther and the Martians joining forces, they outnumbered the Nguyen contingent two to one. But how many Earth ships would be willing to fire on their own, just because one admiral and a banished politician said so? It was entirely possible that if actual shooting started, a lot of UN ships might have unexplained calm failures and wait to see how it all came out. And that wasn't the worst case. The worst case was that a number of Souther ships would switch sides once Martians started killing Earthers. The fight could turn into a whole lot of people pointing guns at each other with no one knowing whom to trust. It could turn into a bloodbath. We have twice as many ships, Avasarla said from her constant perch at the comm station. Holden almost objected, but changed his mind. In the end, it wouldn't matter. Avasarla would believe what she wanted to believe. She needed to think all her efforts had been worthwhile, that they were about to pay off when the fleet arrived, and this Nguyen clown surrendered to her obviously superior force. The truth was... Her version wasn't any more or less a fantasy than his. No one would know for sure until everyone knew for sure. How long now? Avasarla said, then sipped at the bulb of weak coffee she'd started making for herself in place of tea. Holden considered pointing out the navigation information the Rossi made available at every console, and then didn't. Avasarla didn't want him to show her how to find it herself. She wanted him to tell her. She wasn't accustomed to pressing her own buttons. In her mind, she outranked him. Holden wondered what the chain of command actually looked like in this situation. How many illegal captains of stolen ships did it take to equal one disgraced UN official? That could tie a courtroom up for a few decades. He also wasn't being fair to Abasarla. It wasn't about making him take her orders, not really. It was about being in a situation that she was utterly untrained for, 
where she was the least useful person in the room and trying to assert some control, trying to reshape the space around her to fit with her mental image of herself. Or maybe she just needed to hear a voice. Eighteen hours now, Holden said. Most of the other ships that aren't part of our fleet will beat us there, and the ones that don't won't show up until it's over, so we can ignore them. Eighteen hours, Avasarla said. There was something like awe in her voice. Space is too fucking big. It's the same old story. He'd guessed right. She just wanted to talk, so he let her. What story? Empire. Every empire grows until its reach exceeds its grasp. We started out fighting over who got the best branches in one tree, then we climb down and fight over a few kilometers worth of trees. Then someone starts riding horses and you get empires of hundreds or thousands of kilometers. Ships open up empire expansion across the oceans. The Epstein Drive gave us the outer planets. She trailed off and tapped out something on the comm panel. She didn't volunteer who she was sending messages to, and Holden didn't ask. When she was done, she said, But the story is always the same. No matter how good your technology is, at some point you'll conquer territory that you can't hold on to. You're talking about the outer planets? Not specifically, she said her voice growing soft and thoughtful. I'm talking about the entire fucking concept of empire. The Brits couldn't hold on to India or North America because why should people listen to a king who's 6,000 kilometers away? Holden tinkered with the air circulation nozzle on his panel, aiming it at his face. The cool air smelled faintly of ozone and oil. Logistics is always a problem. No kidding. Taking a dangerous trip 6,000 kilometers across the Atlantic so you can fight with colonists gives the enemy one hell of a home court advantage. At least, Holden said, we Earthers figured that out before we picked a fight with Mars. It's even further. And sometimes the sun is in the way. Some people have never forgiven us for not humbling Mars when we had the chance, Avasara said. I work for a few of them. Fucking idiots. I thought the point of your story was that those people always lose in the end. Those people, she said, pushing herself to her feet and slowly heading toward the crew ladder, are not the real problem. Venus might be housing the advance party of the First Empire whose grasp is as long as its reach, and this fucking proto-molecule has exposed us for the petty small-town bosses we are. We're getting ready to trade our solar system away because we thought we could build airports out of bamboo and summon the cargo. Get some sleep, Holden said to her while she crawled up the ladder lift. We'll defeat one empire at a time. Maybe, she said, as she dropped out of sight, and the deck hatch banged shut behind her. Why isn't anyone shooting? Prax said. He'd come up to the operations deck, trailing after Naomi like a lost child. Now he was sitting at one of the many unused crash couches. He stared up at the main screen, his face a mix of fear and fascination. The big tactical display showed a muddled mass of red and green dots representing the three dozen capital ships parked in orbit around Io. The Rossi had marked all the Earth ships green and the Martian ships red. It created a confusing simplicity out of what was in actuality a far more complex situation. Holden knew that friend or foe identification was going to be a problem if anyone started shooting. For now, the various ships drifted quietly above Io, their enormous threat merely implied. They made Holden think of the crocodiles he'd seen at the zoo as a child, huge, armored, filled with teeth, but drifting on the surface of the water like statues, not even their eyes blinking. When food had been thrown into the pen, they'd exploded out of the water with frightening speed. We're just waiting for some blood to hit the water, he thought. Why isn't anyone shooting? 
Prax repeated. Hey, Doc, Amos said. He was lounging in one of the crash couches next to Prax. He projected a calm laziness that Holden wished he himself felt. Remember how on Ganymede we were facing down those guys with guns and no one was shooting right up until you decided to cock your gun? Prax blanched. Holden guessed he was remembering the bloody aftermath of that fight. Yes, Prax said. I remember. This is like that, Amos said. Only no one's cocked their gun just yet. Prax nodded. Okay. If someone finally did break the whole situation loose, Holden knew that figuring out who was shooting whom would be their first problem. Avasarala. Any word yet on the political landscape? There's a whole lot of green on that board. How many of those dots belong to us? Avasarala shrugged and went on listening to the ship-to-ship -ship crosstalk. Naomi, Holden said. Any ideas? So far, Nguyen's fleet is targeting only Martian ships, she replied, marking ships on the main tactical board for everyone to see. The Martian ships are targeting back, Souther's ships aren't targeting anyone, and Souther hasn't even opened his tubes. I'm guessing he's still hoping for a peaceful resolution. Please send the intel officer on Souther's ship my compliments, Holden said to Naomi, and ask him to get us some new IFF data so this doesn't turn into the solar system's biggest clusterfuck. Done, Naomi said, and made the call. Get everyone buttoned up in their suits, Amos, Holden continued. Do a hat check here before you go below. I hope we don't start shooting, but what I hope will happen and what actually happens are almost never the same. Roger, Amos said, then climbed out of his couch and began clumping around the deck on magnetic boots, checking the seals on everyone's helmets. Test, 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 Holden said over the crew radio. One by one, everyone on the ship responded with the affirmative until someone with a higher pay grade than his decided which way things were going to go, there wasn't much else he could do. Wait, Avasarla said, then hit a button on her console and an outside channel started playing on their suit radios. Launch immediately against targets on Mars. We have a battery of missiles carrying a lethal biological weapon ready to fire. You have one hour to leave Io orbit or we will launch immediately against targets on Mars. We have a... Avasarala turned the channel off again. Seems a third party has joined the circle jerk, Amos said. No, Avasarala replied. It's Nguyen. He's outnumbered, so he's ordered his Mao cronies on the surface to make the threat to back us off. He'll... Oh, shit. She hit her panel again, and a new voice spoke over the radio. This one was a woman's voice with a cultured Martian accent. Ayo? This is Admiral Muhan of the Martian Congressional Republic Navy. You fire anything bigger than a bottle rocket and we will glass the whole fucking moon. Do you read me? Amos leaned over to Prax. Now, you see, all this is them cocking their guns. Prax nodded. Got it. This, Holden said, listening to the barely restrained fury in the Martian Admiral's voice, is about to get seriously out of hand. This is Admiral Nguyen aboard the UNN Agatha King, a new voice said. Admiral Souther is here illegally at the behest of a civilian UN official with no military authority. I hereby order all ships under Admiral Souther's command to immediately stand down. I further order that the captain of Souther's flagship place the Admiral under arrest for treason and... Oh, do shut up, Souther replied over the same channel. I'm here as part of a legal fact-finding mission regarding improper use of UN funds and material for a secret biological weapon project on Io, a project which Admiral Nguyen is directly responsible for in contravention of UN directives. Avasarala cut the link. Oh, this ain't good, Alex said. Well, Avasarala said, then opened the faceplate on her helmet and let out a long sigh. She opened her purse and pulled a pistachio out of it. She cracked it and thoughtfully ate the meat, then put the shell in the nearby recycling chute. A tiny bit of the skin floated away in the microgravity. No, actually, it should be fine. This is all posturing. 
As long as they keep comparing dicks, no one will shoot. But we can't just wait here, Prax said, shaking his head. Amos was floating in front of him, checking his helmet. Prax shoved him away and tried to get to his feet. He drifted away from his crash couch, but didn't think to turn on his boot mags. If May is down there, we have to go. They're talking about glassing the moon. We have to get there before they do it. There was a high violin string whine at the back of Prax's voice. The tension was getting to him. It was getting to all of them, but Prax was the one who was going to show it worst and first. Holden shot a look at Amos, but the big man just looked surprised at having been pushed away by the much smaller scientist. They're talking about destroying the base. We have to go down there, Prax continued, the panic in his voice starting to shine through. We're not doing anything, Holden said. Not until we have a better idea how this is going to shake out. We came all this way so that we can't do anything? Prax demanded. Doc, we don't want to be the ones to move first, Amos said, and put a hand on Prax's shoulder, pulling him back down to the deck. The little botanist violently shrugged it off without turning around, then shoved off his couch toward Avasarla. Give me the channel. Let me talk to them, Prax said, reaching for her comm panel. I can... Holden launched himself out of his crash couch, catching the scientist mid-flight and hurling them both across the deck and into the bulkhead. The thick layer of anti-spalling padding absorbed their impact, but Holden felt the air go out of Prax when his hip slammed into the smaller man's belly. Gah, Prax said, and curled up into a floating fetal ball. Holden kicked on his boot mags and pushed himself down to the deck. He grabbed Prax and pushed him across the compartment to Amos. Take him below. Stuff him in his bunk and sedate the shit out of him. Then get to engineering and get us ready for a fight. Amos nodded and grabbed the floating Prax. Okay. A moment later, the two of them disappeared down the deck hatch. Holden looked around the room, seeing the shocked looks from Avasarla and Naomi, but ignoring them. Prax's need for his daughter to take precedence over everything else had almost put them all in danger again. And while Holden intellectually understood the man's drive, having to stop him from killing them all every time May's name came up was stress he didn't need right then. It left him angry and needing to snap at someone. Where the hell's Bobby? He said to no one in particular. He hadn't seen her since they had put into orbit around Io. Just saw her in the machine shop. Amos replied over the radio. She was field-stripping my shotgun. I think she's doing all the guns in armor. That's... Holden started, ready to yell about something. That's actually really helpful. Tell her to button up her suit and turn her radio on. Things might be going south in a hurry here. He took a few seconds to breathe and calm himself down, then returned to the combat operations station. You okay? Naomi asked over their private channel. No, he said, chinning the button to make sure only she heard his reply. No, I'm actually scared to death. I thought we were past that. Past being scared? No, she said, the smile audible in her voice. Past blaming yourself for it. I'm scared too. I love you, Holden said feeling that same electric thrill he always got when he told her. Part fear, part boast. You should probably keep your eye on your station, she said, her tone teasing. She never told him she loved him when he said it first. She'd said that when people did it too often, it made the word lose all its power. He understood the argument, but he'd kind of hoped she'd break her rule this once. He needed to hear it. Avasarala was hunched over the comm station like an ancient mystic peering into a murky crystal ball. The spacesuit hung on her like a scarecrow's oversized coveralls. Holden considered ordering her to button up her helmet, then shrugged. She was old enough to decide for herself the relative risks and rewards of eating during a battle. Periodically, she reached into her purse and pulled out another nut. The air around her was a growing cloud of tiny pieces of pistachio skin. 
It was annoying to watch her cluttering up his ship, but no warship was built so fragile that a little airborne waste would break anything. Either the tiny pieces of shell would be sucked into the air recycling system and trapped by the filters, or they'd go under thrust and all the garbage would fall to the floor, where they could sweep it up. Holden wondered if Avasarala had ever had to clean anything in her life. While he watched her, the old lady cocked her head to one side, listening with sudden interest to something only she could hear. Her hand darted forward, bird quick, to tap at the screen. A new voice came over the ship's radios, this one with the faint hiss transmissions picked up when traveling for millions of kilometers through space. This is General Esteban Sorrento Gillis. Some time ago, I announced the formation of an exploratory committee to look into possible misuse of UN resources for illegal biological weapon research. While that investigation is ongoing, and the committee is not prepared to bring charges at this time, in the interests of public safety and to better facilitate a thorough and comprehensive investigation, certain UN personnel in key positions are to be recalled to Earth for questioning. First, Admiral Augusto Nguyen of the United States Navy. Second, Avasarla hit the panel to shut off the feed and stared at the console with her mouth open for several seconds. Oh, fuck me. All over the ship, alarms started blaring. Chapter 48 Avasarla I've got fast movers. Naomi said over the blaring alarms. The UN flagship is firing. Avasarla closed her helmet, watching the in-suit display confirm the seal, then tapped at the communications console, her mind moving faster than her hands. Aaron Wright had cut a deal, and now Nguyen knew it. The Admiral had just been hung out to dry, and he was taking it poorly. A flag popped up on the console. Incoming high-priority broadcast. She thumbed it, and Souther appeared on her terminal and every other one in the ops deck. This is Admiral Souther. I am hereby taking command of... Okay, Naomi said. I need my real screen back now. Got some work to do. Sorry, sorry, Avasarla said, tapping at the console. Wrong button. This task force, Admiral Nguyen, is relieved of duty. Any hostilities will be... Avasarla switched the feed to her own screen and, in the process, switched to a different broadcast. Nguyen was flushed almost purple. He was wearing his uniform like a boast. Illegal and unprecedented seizure. Admiral Souther is to be escorted to the brig until... Five incoming comm requests lit up, each listing a name and short-form transponder ID. She ignored them all for the broadcast controls. As soon as the live button went active... She looked into the camera. This is Assistant Undersecretary Chris Jen Avasarala, representing the civilian government of Earth, she said. Legal and appropriate command of this force is given to Admiral Souther. Anyone rejecting or ignoring his orders will be subject to legal action. I repeat, Admiral Souther is in legally authorized command of... Naomi made a low, grunting sound. Avasarala stopped the broadcast and turned. Okay, Holden said. That was bad. What? Avasarla said. What was bad? One of the Earth ships just took three torpedo hits. Is that a lot? The PDCs aren't stopping them, Naomi said. Those UN torpedoes all have transponder codes that mark them as friends, so they're sailing right through. They typically don't expect to be getting shot at by other UN ships. Three is a lot, Holden said strapping into the crash couch. She didn't see him touch any of the controls, but he must have, because when he spoke, it echoed through the ship as well as the speakers in her helmet. We have just gone live. Everyone has to the count of twenty to get strapped in someplace safe. Solid copy on that, Bobby replied from wherever she was on the ship. Just got the dock strapped in and happy, Amos said. I'm on my way to engineering. Are we heading into this? Alex asked. We've got something like 35 capital ships out there, all of them much, much bigger than us. 
How about we just try to keep anyone from shooting us full of holes? Yes, sir, Alex said from the pilot's deck. Any vestige of democracy and vote-taking was gone. That was a good thing. At least Holden had control when there had to be a single voice in command. I have two fast movers coming in, Naomi said. Someone still thinks we're the bad guys. I blame Avasarala, Bobby said. Before Avasarala could laugh, gravity ticked up and slewed to the side, the Rosinante taking action beneath her. Her couch shifted and creaked. The protective gel squeezed her and let her go. Alex? On him, Alex said. I wouldn't mind getting a real gunner, sir. Are we going to have enough time to get her up here safely? Nope, Alex said. I've got three more incoming. I can take PDC control from here, sir, Bobby said. It's not the real thing, but it's something the rest of you won't have to do. Naomi, give the PDCs to the sergeant. PDC control transferred. It's all yours, Bobby. Taking control, Bobby said. Avasarala's screen was a tangle of incoming messages in a flickering array. She started going through them. The Kennedy was announcing that Souther's command was illegal. The Triton's first officer was reporting that the captain had been relieved of duty and requested orders from Souther. The Martian destroyer INI Chaos was trying to reach Avasarala for clarification of which Earth ships it was permitted to shoot at. She pulled up the tactical display. Circles in red and green marked the swarm of ships. Tiny silver threads showed what might have been streams of PDC fire or the paths of torpedoes. Are we red or green? Avasarla asked. Who's who on this fucking thing? Mars is red, Earth is green, Naomi said. And which Earth ones are on our side? Find out. Holden said as one of the green dots suddenly vanished. Alex? The Darius took the safeties off its PDCs, and now it's spraying down everything in range, whether it's friend or foe. And... shit. Avasarala's chair shifted again, seeming to rise from under her, pressing her back into the gel until it was hard to lift her arms. On the tactical screen, the cloud of ships, enemy and friendly and ambiguous, shifted slightly, and two golden dots grew larger, proximity notations beside them counting quickly down. Madam Assistant, whatever you are, Holden said, you could respond to some of those comm requests now. Avasarala's gut felt like someone was squeezing it from below. The taste of salt and stomach acid haunted the back of her tongue. She was beginning to sweat in a way that had less to do with temperature than nausea. She forced her hands out to the control panel, just as the two golden dots vanished. Thank you, Bobby, Alex said. I'm heading up. Gonna try to get the Martians between us and the fighting. She started making calls. In the heat of a battle, all she had to offer was this. Making calls. Talking. The same thing she always did. Something about it was actually reassuring. The Greenville was accepting Souther's command. The Tanaka wasn't responding. The Dyson opened the channel, but the only sound was men shouting at each other. It was Bedlam. A message came in from Souther, and she accepted it. It included a new IFF code, and she manually accepted the update. On the tactical, most of the green dots shifted to white. Thank you, Holden said. Avasarala swallowed her, you're welcome. The anti-nausea drug seemed to be working for everyone else. She really, really didn't want to throw up inside her helmet. One of the six remaining green dots blinked out of existence, and another turned suddenly to white. Oh, right in the back, Alex said. That was cold. Souther's ID showed up again on Avasarala's console, and she hit accept just as the Rossi shifted again. The immediate surrender of the flagship king and Admiral Augusto Nguyen, Souther was saying. His shock of white hair was standing up off his head as if the low-thrust gravity was letting it expand like a peacock's tail. His smile was sharp as a knife, 
Any vessel that still refuses to acknowledge my orders as legal and legitimate will forfeit this amnesty. You have thirty seconds from this mark. On the tactical display, the threads of silver and gold had, for the most part, vanished. The ships shifted positions, each moving along its own complex vectors. As she watched, all the remaining green dots turned to white. All except one. Don't be an asshole, Nguyen, Avasarla said. It's over. The ops deck was silent for a long moment, the tension almost unbearable. Naomi's voice was the one to break it. I've got more fast movers. Oh, I've got a lot of them. Where? Holden snapped. From the surface. Avasarla didn't do anything, but her tactical display resized, pulling back until the cluster of ships, red and white and the single defiant green, were less than a quarter of their original size and the massive curve of the moon's surface impinged on the lower edge of the display. Rising like a solid mass, hundreds of fine yellow lines. Get me a count, Holden said. I need a count here. 219. No, wait, 230. What the hell are they? Are those torpedoes? Alex asked. No, Bobby said. They're monsters. They launched the monsters. Avasarla opened a broadcast channel. Her hair probably looked worse than Souther's, but she was well past vanity. That she could speak without fear of vomiting was blessing enough. This is Avasarala, she said. The launch you are all seeing right now is a new protomolecule-based weapon that is being used as an unauthorized first strike against Mars. We need to shoot those fuckers out of the sky and do it now. Everyone. We've got a coordination override request coming through from Souther's flagship. Naomi said. Surrender control? The hell I will, Alex said. No, but track requests, Holden said. I'm not handing control of my ship to a military fire control computer, but we still need to be part of the solution here. The king's starting a hard burn, Alex said. I think he's trying to hightail it. On the display, the attack from the surface of Io was beginning to bloom. Individual threads coming apart at unexpected angles, some corkscrewing, some reaching out in bent paths like an insect's articulated legs. Any one of them was the death of a planet, and the acceleration data put them at ten, fifteen, twenty Gs. Nothing human survived at a sustained twenty G. Nothing human had to. Golden flickers of light appeared from the ships, drifting down to meet the threads of Io. The slow, stately pace of the display was undercut by the data. Plasma torpedoes burning full out, and yet it took long seconds for them to reach the main stem. Avasarla watched the first of them detonate, saw the column of protomolecule monsters split into a dozen different streams. Evasive action. Some of those are coming toward us, Cap, Alex said. I don't think they're designed to hold a ship's hull, but I'm pretty damn sure they do it anyway. Let's get in there and do what we can. We can't let any of these... Okay, where'd they go? On the tactical display, the attacking monsters were blinking out of existence, the threads vanishing. They're cutting thrust, Naomi said, and the RF transponders are going dark. They must have radar-absorbing hull materials. Do we have tracking data? Can we anticipate where they're going to be? The tactical display began to flicker. Fireflies. The monsters shifting in and out, thrusting in what looked like semi-random directions, but the bloom of them always expanding. This is going to be a bitch, Alex said. Bobby? I've got some target locks. Get us in PDC range. Hang on, kids, Alex said. We're going for a ride. The Rossi bucked hard, and Avasarla pressed back into her seat. The shuddering rhythm seemed to be her own trembling muscles, and then the firing PDCs, and then her body again. On the display, the combined forces of Earth and Mars spread out, running after the near-invisible foes. 
Thrust gravity shifted, spinning her couch one way and then another without warning. She tried closing her eyes, but that was worse. Hmm. What, Naomi? Holden said. Hmm, what? The king was doing something strange there. Huge activity from the maneuvering thrusters and... Oh. Oh, what? Nouns. I need nouns. She's hold, Naomi said. One of the monsters hold her. Told you they could do that, Alex said. Hate to be on the ship right now. Still, couldn't have happened to a nicer fella. His men aren't responsible for his actions, Bobby said. They may not even know Southers in command. We've got to help them. We can't, Holden said. They'll shoot at us. Would you all please shut the fuck up, Avasarla said, and stop moving the goddamn ship around. Just pick a direction and calm down for two minutes. Her calm request went ignored for five minutes, then ten. When the king's distress beacon kicked in, she still hadn't answered. A broadcast signal came in just after. This is Admiral Nguyen of the United Nations battleship Agatha King. I am offering to surrender to UN ships with a condition of immediate evacuation. Repeat, I am offering surrender to any United Nations military vessel on the condition of immediate evacuation. Souther answered on the same frequency. This is the Okimbo. What's your situation? We have a possible biohazard, Nguyen said. His voice was so tight and high it sounded like someone was strangling him. On the tactical display, several white dots were already moving toward the green. Hold tight, King, Souther said. We're on our way. Like hell you are, Avasarla said, then cursed quietly as she opened a broadcast channel. Like hell you are. This is Avasarla. I'm declaring a quarantine and containment order on the Agatha King. No vessel should dock with her or accept transfer of materiel or personnel. Any ship that does will be placed under a quarantine and containment order as well. Two of the white dots turned aside. Three others continued on. She opened the channel again. Am I the only one here who remembers Eros? What the fuck do you people think is loose on the king? Do not approach. The last of the white dots turned aside. When Nguyen answered her calm request, she'd forgotten she still had it open. He looked like shit. She didn't imagine she looked much better. How many wars had ended this way, she wondered. Two exhausted, nauseated people staring at each other while the world burned around them. What more do you want from me? Nguyen said. I've surrendered. I lost. My men shouldn't have to die for your spite. It's not spite. Avasarada said. We can't do it. The protomolecule gets loose. Your fancy control programs don't work. It's infectious. That's not proven, he said. But the way he said it told her everything. It's happening, isn't it? She said. Turn on your internal cameras. Let us see. I'm not going to do that. She felt the air go out of her. It had happened. I am so sorry, Avasarla said. Oh, I am so sorry. Nguyen's eyebrows rose a millimeter. His lips pressed, bloodless and thin. She thought there were tears in his eyes, but it might have been only a transmission artifact. You have to turn on the transponders, Avasarla said. And then, when he didn't reply, We can't weaponize the protomolecule. We don't understand what it is. We can't control it. You just sent a death sentence to Mars. I can't save you. I cannot. But turn those transponders back on and help me save them. The moment hung in the air. Avasarla could feel Holden's and Naomi's attention on her like warmth radiating from the heating grate. Nguyen shook his head, his lips twitching lost in conversation with himself. Nguyen, she said. What's happening? On your ship? How bad is it? Get me out of here and I'll turn the transponders on, he said. Throw me into the brig for the rest of my life, I don't care, but get me off this ship. 
Avasarla tried to lean forward, but it only made her crash couch shift. She looked for the words that would bring him back, the ones that would tell him that he had been wrong and evil, and now he was going to die badly at the hands of his own weapon and somehow make it all right. She looked at this angry, small, short-sighted, frightened little man and tried to find the way to pull him back to simple human decency. She failed. I can't do that, she said. Then stop wasting my time, he said, and cut the connection. She lay back, her palm over her eyes. I'm getting some mighty strange readings off that battleship, Alex said. Naomi, you seeing this? Sorry, give me a second. What have you got, Alex? Holden asked. Reactor activity's down. Internal radiation through the ship spiking huge. It's like they're venting the reactor into the air recycling. That don't sound healthy, Amos said. The ops deck went silent again. Avasarla reached to open a channel to Souther, but stopped. She didn't know what she'd say. The voice that came over the ship channel was slushy and drugged. She didn't recognize Prax at first, and then he had to repeat himself twice before she could make out the words. Incubation chamber, Prax said. It's making the ship an incubation chamber, like on Eros. It knows how to do that? Bobby said. Apparently so, Naomi said. We're going to have to slag that thing, Bobby said. Do we have enough firepower for that? Avasarla opened her eyes again. She tried to feel something besides great oceanic sorrow. There had to be hope in there somewhere. Even Pandora got that much. Holden was the one who said what she was thinking. Even if we can, it won't save Mars. Maybe we got them all, Alex said. I mean, there were a shitload of those things, but maybe, maybe we got them. Hard to tell when they're running ballistic, Bobby said. If we miss just one, and it gets to Mars. It was all slipping away from her. She'd been so close to stopping it, and now here she was, watching it all slip past. Her gut was a solid knot. But they hadn't failed. Not yet. Somewhere in all this there had to be a way. Something that could still be done. She forwarded her last conversation with Nguyen to Souther. Maybe he'd have an idea. A secret weapon that could come out of nowhere and force the codes out. Maybe the great brotherhood of military men would draw some vestige of humanity out of Nguyen. Ten minutes later, a survival pod came loose from the king. Souther didn't bother contacting her before they shot it down. The ops deck was like a mourning chamber. Okay, Holden said. First things first. We've got to get down to the base. If May's there, we need to get her out. I'm on that, Amos said. And we got to take the doc. He ain't going to outsource that one. That's what I was thinking, Holden said. So you guys take the Rossi down to the surface. Us guys? Naomi asked. I'll take the pinnace over to the battleship, Holden said. The transponder activation codes are going to be in the CIC. You? Avasarla asked. Only two people got off Eros, Holden said with a shrug. And I'm the one that's left. Chapter 49 Holden Don't do this, Naomi said. She didn't beg or cry or make demands. All the power of her request lay in its quiet simplicity. Don't do it. Holden opened the suit locker just outside the main airlock and reached for his Martian-made armor. A sudden and visceral memory of radiation sickness on Eros stopped him. They've been pumping radiation into the king for hours now, right? Don't go over there, Naomi said again. Bobby, Holden said over the comm. Here, she replied with a grunt. She was helping Amos prep their gear for the assault on the Mao science station, 
After his one encounter with the Mao protomolecule hybrid, he could only imagine they were going loaded for bear. What are these standard Martian armor suits rated for radiation-wise? Like mine? Bobby asked. No, not a powered suit. I know they harden you guys for close proximity blasts. I'm talking about this stuff we pulled out of the map crate. About as much as a standard vacuum suit. Good enough for short walks outside the ship. Not so much for constant exposure to high radiation levels. Shit, Holden said. Then, thanks. He killed the comm panel and closed the locker. I'll need a full-on hazard suit, which means I'll be better in the radiation and not bullet-resistant at all. How many times can you get yourself massively irradiated before it catches up with you? Naomi said. Same as last time. At least one more. Holden replied with a grin. Naomi didn't smile back. He hit the comm again and said, Amos, bring me up a hazard suit from engineering. Whatever's the hardest thing we've got on board. Okay, Amos replied. Holden opened his equipment locker and took out the assault rifle he kept there. It was large, black, and designed to be intimidating. It would immediately mark anyone who carried it as a threat. He put it back and decided on a pistol instead. The hazmat suit would make him fairly anonymous. It was the sort of thing any member of the damage control team might wear during an emergency. If he was wearing only a service pistol and a hip holster, it might keep anyone from singling him out as part of the problem. And with the protomolecule loose on the king and the ship flooded with radiation, there would be a big problem. Because if Prax and Avasarla were right and the protomolecule was linked even without a physical connection, then the goo on the king knew what the goo on Venus knew. Part of that was how human spaceships were put together, ever since it had disassembled the Arbogast. But it also meant it knew a lot about how to turn humans into vomit zombies. It had performed that trick a million times or so on Eros. It had practice. It was entirely possible that every single human on the King was now a vomit zombie. And sadly, that was the best-case scenario. Vomit zombies were walking death to anyone with exposed skin. But to Holden, in his fully sealed and vacuum-rated hazmat suit, they would be at worst a mild annoyance. The worst-case scenario was that the protomolecule was so good at changing humans now the ship would be full of lethal hybrids like the one he'd fought in the cargo bay. That would be an impossible situation, so he chose to believe it wasn't true. Besides, the protomolecule hadn't made any soldiers on Eros. Miller hadn't really taken the time to describe what he'd run into there, but he'd spent a lot of time on the station looking for Julie, and he'd never reported being attacked by anything. The protomolecule was incredibly aggressive and invasive. It would kill a million humans in hours and turn them into spare parts for whatever it was working on. But it invaded at the cellular level. It acted like a virus, not an army. Just keep telling yourself that, Holden thought. It made what he was about to do seem possible. He took a compact semi-automatic pistol and holster out of the locker. Naomi watched while he loaded the weapons magazine and three spares, but she didn't speak. He had just pushed the last round into the final magazine when Amos floated into the compartment, dragging a large red suit behind him. This is our best, Cap, he said, for when shit has gone truly wrong. Should be plenty for the levels they've got on that ship. Max exposure time is six hours, but the air supply only lasts two, so that's not an issue. Holden examined the bulky suit. The surface was a thick, flexible, rubbery substance. It might deter someone attacking with their fingernails or teeth, but it wouldn't stop a knife or a bullet. The air supply was contained under the suit's radiation-resistant skin, so it made for a big, awkward lump on the wearer's back. The difficulty he had pulling the suit to himself and then stopping it told him its mass was considerable. Won't be moving fast in this, will I? No, Amos said with a grimace. They're not made for a firefight. 
If the bullets start flying, you're fucked. Naomi nodded, but said nothing. Amos, Holden said, grabbing the mechanic's arm as he turned to leave. The gunny's in charge once you hit the surface. She's a pro, and this is her show. But I need you to keep Prax safe, because he's kind of an idiot. The only thing I ask you to do is to get that man and his little girl safely off the moon and back to this ship. Amos looked hurt for a moment. Of course I will, Captain. Anything that gets to him or that baby will already have killed me. And that ain't easy to do. Holden pulled Amos to him and gave the big man a quick hug. I feel sorry for anything that tries. No one could ask for a better crewman, Amos. Just want you to know that. Amos pushed him away. You act like you're not coming back. Holden shot a look at Naomi, but her expression hadn't changed. Amos just laughed for a minute, then clapped Holden on the back hard enough to rattle his teeth. That's bullshit, Amos said. You're the toughest guy I know. Without waiting for Holden to reply, he headed out to the crew ladder and then down to the deck below. Naomi pushed lightly against the bulkhead and drifted over to Holden. Air resistance brought her to a stop half a meter from him. She was still the most agile person in microgravity he'd ever met, a ballerina of null G. He had to stop himself from hugging her to him. The expression on her face told him it wasn't what she wanted. She just floated in front of him for a moment, not saying anything then reached out and put one long, slender hand against his cheek. It felt cool and soft. Don't go, she said, and something in her voice told him it would be the last time. He backed up and began shrugging his way into the hazmat suit. Then who? Can you see Avasarla fighting through a mob of vomit zombies? She wouldn't know the CIC from the galley. Amos has to go get that little girl. You know he does, and you know why. Prax has to be there. Bobby keeps them both alive. He got the bulky suit over his shoulders and sealed up the front, but left the helmet lying against his back. The boot mags came on when he hit them with his heels, and he pushed down to the deck and stuck there. You? he asked Naomi. Do I send you? I'd bet on you against a thousand zombies any day of the week. But you don't know the CIC any better than Avasarla does. How does that make sense? We just got right again, she said. That's not fair. But, he said, tell the Martians that me saving their planet makes us even on this whole you stole our warship issue, okay? He knew he was making light of the moment and immediately hated himself for it. But Naomi knew him, knew how afraid he was, and she didn't call him on it. He felt a rush of love for her that sent electricity up his spine and made his scalp tingle. Fine, she said, her face hardening. But you're coming back. I'll be here on the radio the whole time. We'll work through this together, every step. No hero bullshit. Brains instead of bullets. And we work the problems together. You give me that. You better give me that. Holden finally pulled her into his arms and kissed her. I agree. Please, please help me make it back alive. I'd really like that. Flying the razor back to the crippled Agatha King was like taking a race car to the corner market. The King was only a few thousand kilometers from the Rosinante. It seemed close enough for an EVA pack and a really strong push. Instead, he flew what was probably the fastest ship in the Jupiter system in tea kettle mode, at about 5% thrust, through the debris of the recent battle. He could sense the Razorback straining at the leash, responding to his tiny bursts of steam with sullen reproach. The distance to the stricken flagship was short enough and the path treacherous enough that programming in a course would take more time than just flying by stick. But even at his languid pace, the Razorback seemed to have a hard time keeping its nose pointed at the king. You don't want to go there, the ship seemed to be saying. That's an awful place. No, 
No, I really don't, he said, patting the console in front of him. But just get me there in one piece, okay, honey? The massive chunk of what must have once been a destroyer floated past, the ragged edges still glowing with heat. Holden tapped the stick and pushed the razor back sideways to get a bit more distance from the floating wreckage. The nose drifted off course. Fight all you want, we're still going to the same place. Some part of Holden was disappointed that the transit was so dangerous. He'd never flown to Io before, and the view of the moon at the edge of his screens was spectacular. The massive volcano of molten silicate on the opposite side of the moon was throwing particles so high into space he could see the trail it left in the sky. The plume cooled into a spray of silicate crystals, which caught Jupiter's glow and glittered like diamonds scattered across the black. Some of them would drift off to become part of Jupiter's faint ring system, blown right out of Io's gravity well. In any other circumstance, it would have been beautiful. But the hazardous flight kept his attention on his instruments and the screens in front of him, and always the growing bulk of the Agatha King floating alone at the center of the junk cloud. When he was within range, Holden signaled the ship's automated docking system. But, as he'd suspected, the king didn't respond. He piloted up to the nearest external airlock and told the Razorback to maintain a constant distance of five meters. The racing ship was not designed to dock with another ship in space. It lacked even a rudimentary docking tube. His trip to the king would be a short spacewalk. Avasarla had gotten a master override code from Souther, and Holden had the Razorback transmitted. The airlock immediately cycled open. Holden topped off the hazmat suit's air supply in the Razorback's airlock. Once he got on to Nguyen's flagship, he couldn't trust the air, even in the suit recharging stations. Nothing from the King could be allowed inside his suit. Nothing. When his stored air gauge read 100%, he turned on the radio and called Naomi. I'm going in now. He kicked off his boot mags, and a sharp push against the inner airlock door sent him across the short gap to the king. I'm getting a good picture, Naomi said. The video link light on his HUD was on. Naomi could see everything he could see. It was comforting and lonely at the same time like making a call to a friend who lived very far away. Holden cycled the airlock. The two minutes while the king closed the outer door and then pumped air into the chamber seemed to last forever. There was no way to know what would be on the other side of the inner airlock door when it finally opened. Holden put his hand on the butt of his pistol with a nonchalance he didn't feel. The inner door slid open. The sudden screech of his hazmat suit's radiation alarm nearly gave him a heart attack. He chinned the control that killed the audible alarm, though he kept the outside radiation level meter running. It wasn't data that actually did him any good, but the suit was reassuring him that it could handle the current levels, and that was nice. Holden stepped out of the airlock into a small compartment filled with storage lockers and EVA equipment. It looked empty but a small noise from one of the lockers alerted him, and he turned just in time to see a man in a U.N. naval uniform burst out of the locker and swing a heavy wrench at his head. The bulky hazmat suit kept him from moving quickly, and the wrench struck a ringing blow off the side of his helmet. Jim! Naomi yelled over the radio. Die, you bastard! The Navy man yelled at the same time. He took a second swing, but he wasn't wearing mag boots, and without the push off the bulkhead to give him momentum, the swing did little more than start spinning the man around in the air. Holden grabbed the wrench out of his hand and threw it away. He caught the man to stop his spinning with his left hand and drew his pistol with his right. If you cracked my suit, I'm going to throw you out that airlock, Holden said. He began flipping through suit status screens while keeping his pistol pointed at the wrench enthusiast. It looks okay, Naomi said, relief evident in her voice. No reds or yellows. That helmet is tougher than it looks. 
What the hell were you doing in that locker? Holden asked the man. I was here when the... It came on board, the man said. He was a compact-looking earther, with pale skin and flaming red hair cut close to the scalp. A patch on his suit said Larson. All the doors sealed up during emergency lockdown. I was trapped in here, but I could watch what was happening on the internal security system. I was hoping to grab a suit and get out the airlock, but it was sealed too. Say, how'd you get in here? I have admiralty-level overrides, Holden said to him. Quietly to Naomi, he said, At current radiation levels, what's survival odds for our friend here? Not bad, Naomi said, if we get him into sickbay in the next couple of hours. To Larson, he said, Okay, you're coming with me. We're going to CIC. Get me there fast, and you've got a ride off this tub. Yes, sir, Larson said with a salute. He thinks you're an admiral, Naomi laughed. Larson, put on an environment suit. Do it fast. Sir, yes, sir. The suits they had in the airlock storage lockers would at least have their own air supplies. That would cut down on damage from the radiation the young sailor was absorbing. And an airtight suit would reduce the risk of protomolecule infection as they made their way through the ship. Holden waited until Larson had shrugged into a suit, then transmitted the override code to the hatch, and it slid open. After you, Larson. Command Information Center as fast as you can. If we run into anyone, especially if they're throwing up, stay away and let me deal with them. Yes, sir, Larson said, his voice fuzzy over the static-filled radio, then pushed off into the corridor. He took Holden at his word and led him on a fast trip through the crippled Agatha King. They stopped only when a sealed hatch blocked their way, and then only long enough for Holden's suit to convince it to open. The areas of the ship they moved through didn't look damaged at all. The bioweapon pod had hit farther aft, and the monster had headed straight to the reactor room. According to Larson, it had killed a number of people on the way, including the ship's entire contingent of marines when they tried to stop it. But once it had entered engineering, it mostly ignored the rest of the crew. Larson said that shortly after it got into engineering, the ship-wide security camera system had gone offline. With no way to know where the monster was, and no way out of the airlock storage room, Larson had hidden in a locker to wait it out. When you came in, all I could see was this big lumpy red thing, Larson explained. I thought maybe you were another one of those monsters. The lack of visible damage was a good thing. It meant all the hatches and other systems they came across still worked. The lack of a monster rampaging through the ship was even better. The thing that had Holden worried was the lack of people. A ship this size had over a thousand crew persons. At least some of them should be in the areas of the ship they were passing through, but so far they hadn't run across a single one. The occasional puddle of brown goo on the floor was not an encouraging sign. Larson stopped at a locked hatch to let Holden catch his breath. The heavy hazmat suit was not built for long treks, and it was starting to fill up with the stink of his own sweat. While he took a minute to rest and let the suit's cooling systems try to bring his temperature down, Larson said, We'll be going past the forward galley to one of the elevator bays. The CIC is on the deck just above. Five, ten minutes tops. Holden checked his air supply and saw that he had burned nearly half of it. He was rapidly approaching the point of no return. But something in Larson's voice caught his ear. It was the way he said, Galley. Is there something I should know about the galley? Larson said, I'm not sure, but after the cameras went out, I kept hoping someone was going to come get me. So I started trying to call people on the comm. When that didn't work, I started having the king do location checks on people I knew. After a while, no matter who I asked about, the answer was always the forward galley. So, Holden said, there might be upwards of a thousand infected Navy people crammed into that galley? Larson gave a shrug, barely visible in his environment suit. 
Maybe the monster killed them and put them there. Oh, I think that's exactly what happened, Holden said, taking out his gun and working the slide to chamber around. But I seriously doubt they stayed dead. Before Larson could ask what he meant, Holden had his suit unlock the hatch. When I open this door, you head to the elevator as fast as you can. I'll be right behind you. Don't stop no matter what. You have to get me to that CIC. Are we clear? Larson nodded inside his helmet. Good. On three. Holden began counting. One hand on the hatch, the other holding his gun. When he hit three, he shoved the hatch open. Larson put his feet against a bulkhead and pushed off down the corridor on the other side. Tiny blue flickers floated in the air around them like fireflies, like the lights Miller had reported when he was on Eros the second time, the time he didn't come back from. The fireflies were here now, too. At the end of the corridor, Holden could see the elevator door. He began clumping after Larson on his magnetic boots. When Larson was halfway down the corridor, he passed an open hatch. The young sailor started screaming. Holden ran as fast as the clumsy hazmat suit and his magnetic boots would let him go. Larson kept flying down the corridor, but he was screaming and flailing at the air like a drowning man trying to swim. Holden was almost to the open hatch when something crawled out of it and into his path. At first, he thought it was the kind of vomit zombie he'd run into on Eros. It moved slowly, and the front of its navy uniform was covered in brown vomit. But when it turned to look at Holden, its eyes glowed with a faint inner blue, and there was an intelligence in them the Eros zombies hadn't had. The protomolecule had learned some lessons on Eros. This was the new, improved version of the vomit zombie. Holden didn't wait to see what it was going to do. Without slowing his pace, he raised his pistol and shot it in the head. To his relief, the light went out of its eyes, and it spun away from the deck, spraying brown goo in an arc as it rotated. When he passed the open hatch, he risked a glance inside. It was full of the new vomit zombies. Hundreds of them. All their disconcertingly blue eyes were aimed at him. Holden turned back to the corridor and ran. From behind, he heard a rising wave of sounds as the zombies moaned as one and began climbing along the bulkheads and deck after him. Go! Get in the elevator! He screamed at Larson, cursing at how much the heavy hazmat suit slowed him down. God, what was that? Naomi said. He'd forgotten she was watching. He didn't waste breath answering. Larson had come out of his panic-induced fugue and was busily working the elevator doors open. Holden ran up to him and then turned around to look behind. Dozens of the blue-eyed vomit zombies filled the corridor behind him, crawling on the bulkheads, ceiling, and deck like spiders. The floating blue light swirled on air currents Holden couldn't feel. "'Go faster,' he said to Larson sighting down his pistol at the lead zombie and putting a bullet in its head. It floated off the wall, spraying goo as it went. The zombie behind it shoved it out of the way, which sent it spinning down the corridor toward them. Holden moved in front of Larson to protect him, and a spray of brown slime hit his chest and visor. If they hadn't both been wearing sealed suits, it would have been a death sentence. He repressed a shudder and shot two more zombies. The rest didn't even slow down. Behind him, Larson cursed as the partially open doors snapped shut again, pinning his arm. The sailor worked them back open, pushing them with his back and one leg. We're in, Larson yelled. Holden began backing up toward the elevator shaft, emptying the rest of his magazine as he went. Half a dozen more zombies spun away, spraying goo. Then he was in the shaft, and Larson shoved the door shut. Up one level, Larson said, panting with fear and exertion. 
He pushed off the bulkhead and floated up to the next set of doors, then levered them open. Holden followed, replacing the magazine in his gun. Directly across from the elevator was a heavily armored hatch with CIC stenciled in white on the metal. Holden moved toward it, having his suit transmit the override code. Behind him, Larson let the elevator doors slam shut. The howling of the zombies echoed up the elevator shaft. We should hurry, Holden said, hitting the button to open the CIC and bullying his way in before the hatch had finished cycling open. Larson floated through after him. There was a single man still in the CIC, a squat, powerfully built Asian man with an admiral's uniform and a large caliber pistol in one shaky hand. Stay where you are, the man said. Admiral Nguyen, Larson blurted out. You're alive. Nguyen ignored him. You're here for the bioweapon launch vehicle remote codes. I have them here. He held up a hand terminal. They're yours in exchange for a ride off this ship. He's taking us, Larson said, pointing at Holden. He said he'd take me too. No fucking way. Holden said to Nguyen. Not a chance. Either give me those codes because there's a scrap of humanity left in you, or give them to me because you're dead. I don't give a shit either way. You decide. Nguyen looked back and forth from Larson to Holden, clutching the hand terminal and the pistol so tightly that his knuckles were white. No. You have to— Holden shot him in the throat. Somewhere in his brainstem, Detective Miller nodded in approval. Start working on an alternate route back to my ship, Holden said to Larson, as he walked across the room to grab the hand terminal floating by Nguyen's corpse. It took him a moment to find the King's self-destruct switch hidden behind a locked panel. Souther's override code gave him access to that, too. Sorry, Holden said quietly to Naomi as he opened it. I know I sort of agreed not to do that anymore, but I didn't have time to... No, Naomi said, her voice sad. That bastard deserved to die. And I know you'll feel like shit about it later. That's good enough for me. The panel opened, and a simple button lay on the other side. It wasn't even red, just a plain industrial white. This is what blows the ship? No timer, Naomi said. Well, this is an anti-boarding failsafe. If someone opens this panel and presses this button, it's because the ship is lost. They don't want it on a timer someone can just disarm. This is an engineering problem, Naomi said. She already knew what he was thinking, and she was trying to get an answer out before he could say it. We can solve this. We can't, Holden said, waiting to feel the sorrow, but instead feeling a sort of quiet peace. There are a couple hundred very angry zombies trying to get up the elevator shaft right now. We won't come up with a solution that doesn't leave me stranded in here anyway. A hand squeezed his shoulder. He looked up, and Larson said, I'll press it. No, you don't have to. Larson held out his arm. The sleeve of his environment suit had a tiny tear where the elevator doors had closed on it. Around the tear was a palm-sized brown stain. Just rotten fucking luck, I guess. But I watched the Eros feeds like everyone else, Larson said. You can't risk taking me. Pretty soon I might be. He paused and pointed back toward the elevator with his head. Might be one of those. Holden took Larson's hand in his. The thick gloves made it impossible to feel anything. I'm very sorry. Hey, you tried, Larson said with a sad smile. At least now I won't die of thirst in a suit locker. Admiral Souther will know about this, Holden said. I'll make sure everyone knows. Seriously, Larson said, floating next to the button that would turn the Agatha King into a small star for a few seconds. He pulled off his helmet and took a long breath. There's another airlock three decks up. 
If they aren't in the elevator shaft yet, you can make it. Larson, I... You should go away now. Holden had to strip off his suit in the King's airlock. It was covered in the goo, and he couldn't risk taking it onto the Razorback. He absorbed a few rads while he stole another UN vac suit from one of the lockers and put it on instead. It looked exactly like the one Larson was wearing. As soon as he was back on the Razorback, he sent the remote command codes to Souther's ship. He was nearly back to the Rosinante when the king vanished in a ball of white fire. Chapter 50 Bobby The captain just left, Amos said to Bobby when he came back into the machine shop. She floated half a meter above the deck inside a small circle of deadly technology. Behind her sat her cleaned and refitted recon suit, a single barrel of the newly installed gun gleaming inside the port on its right arm. To her left floated the recently reassembled auto shotgun Amos favored. The rest of the circle was formed by pistols, grenades, a combat knife, and a variety of weapon magazines. Bobby took one last mental inventory and decided she'd done all she could do. He thinks maybe he's not coming back from this one, Amos continued, then bent down to grab the auto shotgun. He looked it over with a critical eye, then gave her an appreciative nod. Going into a fight where you know you aren't coming back gives you a sort of clarity, Bobby said. She reached out and grabbed her armor, pulling herself into it. Not an easy thing to do in microgravity. She had to twist and shimmy to get her legs down into the suit before she could start sealing up the chest. She noticed Amos watching her. He had a dopey grin on his face. Seriously, now, she said, we're talking about your captain going off to his death, and all that's going through your head right now is, oh, boobies. Amos continued to grin, not chastened at all. That bodysuit don't leave a lot to the imagination, that's all. Bobby rolled her eyes. Believe me, if I could wear a bulky sweater inside my fully articulated power-assisted combat suit, I still wouldn't, because that would be stupid. She hit the controls to seal the suit, and her armor folded around her like a second skin. She closed the helmet, using the suit's external speakers to talk to Amos, knowing it would make her voice robotic and inhuman. Better put your big boy pants on, she said, the sound echoing around the room. Amos took an unconscious step back. The captain isn't the only one that might not be coming back. Bobby climbed onto the ladder lift and let it take her all the way up to the ops deck. Avasarla was belted into her couch at the comm station. Naomi was in Holden's usual spot at the tactical panel. Alex would be up in the cockpit already. Bobby opened her visor to speak using her normal voice. We cleared? she asked Avasarla. The old lady nodded and held up one hand in a wait gesture while she spoke to someone on her headset mic. The Martians have already dropped a full platoon, she said, pushing the mic away from her face. But their orders are to set up a perimeter and seal the base while someone further up the food chain decides what to do. They're not going to... Bobby started, but Avasarala cut her off with a dismissive wave of her hand. Fuck no, she said. I'm further up the food chain, and I've already decided we're going to glass this abattoir as soon as you're off the surface. I'm letting them think we're still discussing it so you have time to get the kids. Bobby nodded her fist at Avasarala. Recon marines were trained to use the belter's physical idiom when in their combat armor. Avasarala just looked baffled at the gesture and said, So stop playing with your hand and go get the fucking kids. Bobby headed back to the ladder lift, connecting to the ship's one MC as she went. Amos, Prax, meet me in the airlock in five minutes, geared up and ready to go. Alex, put us on the deck in ten. Roger that, Alex replied. Good hunting, soldier. She wondered if they might have become friends, given enough time. It was a pleasant thought. 
Amos was waiting for her outside the airlock when she arrived. He wore his Martian-made light armor and carried his oversized gun. Prax rushed into the compartment a few minutes later, still struggling to get into his borrowed gear. He looked like a boy wearing his father's shoes. While Amos helped him get buttoned up, Alex called down to the airlock and said, Heading down. Hang on to something. Bobby turned her boot mags to full, locking herself to the deck while the ship shifted under her. Amos and Prax both sat down on chairs that pulled out from the wall and belted in. Let's go over the plan one more time, she said, calling up the aerial photos they'd shot of the facility. She patched into the Rossi and threw the pictures onto a wall monitor. This airlock is our entrance. If it's locked, Amos will blast it with explosives to open the outer door. We need to get inside fast. Your armor isn't going to protect you from the vicious radiation belt Io orbits in for long. Prax, you have the radio link Naomi rigged, so once we're inside, you start looking for a network node to plug it into. We have no information about the layout of the base, so the faster we can get Naomi hacking their system, the faster we can find those kits. I like the backup plan better, Amos said. Backup plan? Prax asked. The backup plan is I grab the first guy we see and beat him until he tells us where the kids are. Prax nodded. Okay, I like that one too. Bobby ignored the macho posturing. Everyone dealt with pre-combat jitters in their own way. Bobby preferred obsessive list-making. But flexing and threats were good too. Once we have a location, you guys move with all haste to the kids while I ensure a clear path of egress. Sounds good, Amos said. Make no mistake, Bobby said. Io is one of the worst places in the solar system. Tectonically unstable and radioactive as hell. Easy to see why they hid here, but do not underestimate the peril that just being on this shit moon carries. Two minutes. Alex said over the comm. Bobby took a deep breath. And that isn't the worst. These assholes launched a couple hundred human protomolecule hybrids at Mars. We can hope that they shot their entire wad, but I have a feeling they didn't. We might very well run into one of those monsters once we get inside. She didn't say, I've seen it in my dreams. It seemed counterproductive. If we see one, I deal with it. Amos, you almost got your captain killed blasting away at the one you found in the cargo bay. You try that shit with me, I'll snap your arm off. Don't test me. Okay, chief, Amos replied. Don't get your panties in a twist, I heard you. One minute, Alex said. There are Martian marines controlling the perimeter, but they've been given the okay to let us in. If someone escapes past us, no need to apprehend them. The marines will pick them up before they get far. Thirty seconds. Get ready, Bobby said, then pulled up her HUD suit status display. Everything was green, including the ammo indicator, which showed two thousand incendiary rounds. The air sucked out of the airlock in a long, fading hiss, leaving only a thin wisp of atmosphere that would be the same density as Io's own faint haze of sulfur. Before the ship hit the deck, Amos jumped up out of his chair and stood on his toes to put his helmet against hers. He yelled, Give him hell, Marine! The outer airlock door slid open, and Bobby's suit blatted a radiation alarm at her. It also helpfully informed her that the outside atmosphere was not capable of supporting life. She shoved Amos toward the open lock and then pushed Prax after him. Go! 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 Amos took off across the ground in a weird, hopping run, his breath panting in her ears over the radio link. Prax stayed close behind him and seemed more comfortable in the low gravity. He had no trouble keeping up. Bobby climbed out of the Rossi and then jumped in a long arc that took her about seven meters above the surface at its apex. She visually scanned the area while her suit reached out with radar and EM sensors, trying to pinpoint targets. Neither she nor it found any. She hit the ground next to the lumbering Amos and hopped again, 
beating them both to the airlock door. She tapped the button and the outer door cycled open. Of course. Who locks their door on Io? No one is going to hike across a wasteland of molten silicon and sulfur to steal the family silver. Amos plowed past her into the airlock, stopping for breath only once he was inside. Bobby followed Prax in a second later, and she was about to tell Amos to cycle the airlock when her radio died. She spun around, looking out across the surface of the moon for a moment. Amos came up behind her and put his helmet against her back armor. When he yelled, it was barely audible. What is it? Instead of yelling back, she stepped outside the airlock and pointed to Amos, then pointed to the inner door. She mimed a person walking with her fingers. Amos nodded at her with one hand, then moved back into the airlock and shut the outer door. Whatever happened inside, it was up to Amos and Prax now. She wished them well. She spotted the movement before her suit did, something shifting against the sulfurous yellow background, something not quite the same color. She tracked it with her eyes and had the suit hit it with a targeting laser. She wouldn't lose track of it now. It might gobble radio waves, but the fact that she could see it meant that light bounced off it just fine. It moved again, not quickly, and staying close to the ground. If she hadn't been looking right at it, she'd have missed the motion entirely. Being sneaky. Which probably meant it didn't know she'd spotted it. Her suit's laser rangefinder marked it as just over three hundred meters away. According to her theory, once it realized it had been spotted, it would charge her, moving in a straight line to try and grab and rip. If it couldn't reach her quickly, it would try to throw things at her. All she needed to do was hurt it until its program failed and it self-destructed. Lots of theories. Time to test them out. She aimed her gun at it. The suit helped her correct for deflection based on the range, but she was using ultra-high velocity rounds on a moon with fractional gravity. Bullet drop at 300 meters would be trivial. Even though there was no way the creature could see it through her helmet's darkened visor, she blew it a kiss. I'm back, sweetie. Come say hi to Mama. She tapped the trigger on her gun. Fifty rounds streaked down range, crossing the distance from her gun to the creature in less than a third of a second. All fifty slammed into it, shedding very little of their kinetic energy as they passed through, just enough to burst the tip of each round open and ignite the self-oxidizing flammable gel they carried. Fifty trails of short-lived but very intense flame burned through the monster. Some of the black filament bursting from the exit wounds actually caught fire, disappearing with a flash. The monster launched itself toward Bobby, at a dead run that should have been impossible in low gravity. Each push of its limbs should have launched it high into the air, it stuck to the silicate surface of Io as though it were wearing magnetic boots on a metal deck. Its speed was breathtaking. Its blue eyes blazed like lightning, the long, improbable hands reaching out for her, clenching and grasping at nothing as it ran. It was all just like in her dreams. And for a split second, Bobby just wanted to stay perfectly still and let the scene play out to the conclusion she'd never gotten to see. Another part of her mind expected her to wake up, soaking with sweat, as she had so many times before. Bobby watched it as it ran toward her, and noted with pleasure the burnt black injuries the incendiary bullets had cut through its body. No sprays of black filament and then the wounds closing like water. Not this time. She'd hurt it, and she wanted to go on hurting it. She turned away and took off in a bounding run at a ninety-degree angle to its path. Her suit kept the targeting laser locked on to the monster, so she could track its location even without turning around to look. As she'd suspected, it turned to follow her, but it lost ground. Fast on the straightaways, Bobby said to it, 
but you corner like shit. When the creature realized she wasn't going to just stand still and let it get close to her, it stopped. Bobby stumbled to a stop, turning to watch it. It reached down and tore up a big chunk of ancient lava bed, then reached down to grip the ground with its other hand. Here it comes, Bobby said to herself. She threw herself to the side as the creature's arm whipped forward. The rock missed her by centimeters as she hurtled sideways. She hit the moon's surface and skidded, already returning fire. This time she fired for several seconds, sending hundreds of rounds into and through the creature. Anything you can do, I can do better, she sang under her breath. I can do anything better than you. The bullets tore great flaming chunks out of the monster and nearly severed its left arm. The creature spun around and collapsed. Bobby bounced back to her feet, ready to run again if the monster got back up. It didn't. Instead, it rolled over onto its back and shook. Its head began to swell, and the blue eyes flashed even brighter. Bobby could see things moving beneath the surface of its chitinous black skin. Boom, motherfucker, she yelled at it, waiting for the bomb to go off. Instead, it bounced suddenly to its feet, tore a portion of its own abdomen off, and threw it at her. By the time Bobby realized what had just happened, the bomb was only a few meters from her. It detonated and blew her off her feet. She went skidding across Io's surface, her armor blaring warnings at her. When she finally came to a stop, her HUD was flashing a Christmas display of red and green lights. She tried to move her limbs, but they were as heavy as stone. The suit's motion control processor, the computer that interpreted her body's movements and turned them into commands for the suit's actuators, had failed. The suit was trying to reboot it while simultaneously trying to reroute and run the program in a different location. A flashing amber message on the HUD said, Please stand by. Bobby couldn't turn her head yet, so when the monster leaned down over her, it took her completely by surprise. She stifled a scream. It wouldn't have mattered. The sulfur atmosphere on Io was far too thin for sound waves to travel in. The monster couldn't have hurt her. But while the new Bobby was at peace with the idea of dying in battle, enough of the old Bobby remained that she was not going to go out screaming like a baby. It leaned down to look at her, its overlarge and curiously childlike eyes glowing bright blue. The damage her gun had done seemed extensive but the creature appeared not to notice. It poked at her chest armor with one long finger, then convulsed and vomited a thick spray of brown goo all over her. Oh, that's disgusting, she yelled at it. If her suit had been opened up to the outside, getting that protomolecule shit on her would have been the least of her problems. But still, how the hell was she going to wash this crap off? It cocked its head and regarded her curiously. It poked again at her armor, one finger wriggling into gaps, trying to find a way into her skin. She'd seen one of these things rip a nine-ton combat mech apart. If it wanted into her suit, it was coming in. But it seemed reluctant to damage her for some reason. As she watched, a long, flexible tube burst out of its midsection and began probing at her armor instead of the finger. Brown goo dribbled out of this new appendage in a constant stream. Her gun's status light flickered from red to green. She spun up the barrels to test it, and it worked. Of course, her suit was still telling her to please stand by when it came to actually moving. Maybe if the monster got bored and wandered in front of her gun, she could get some shots off. The tube was probing at her armor more insistently now. It pushed its way into gaps periodically shooting brown liquid into them. It was as repulsive as it was frightening. It was like being threatened by a serial killer that was also fumbling at her clothing with a teenager's horny insistence. Oh, to hell with this, she said to it. 
She was about through with letting this thing grope her while she lay helpless on her back. The suit's right arm was heavy, and the actuators that made her strong when it was working also resisted movement when it wasn't. Pushing her arm up was like doing a one-arm bench press while wearing a lead glove. She pressed up anyway until she felt something pop. It might have been in the suit. It might have been in her arm. She couldn't tell yet, because she was too wired for pain to set in. But when it popped, her arm came up, and she pushed her fist up against the monster's head. Bye-bye, she said. The monster turned to look curiously at her hand. She held down the trigger until the ammo counter read zero and the gun stopped spinning. The creature had ceased to exist from the shoulders up. She dropped her arm back to the ground, exhausted. Reroute successful, her suit told her. Rebooting, it said. When the subliminal hum came back, she started laughing and found she couldn't stop. She shoved the monster's corpse off her and sat up. Good thing. It's a really long walk back to the ship. Chapter 51 Prax Prax ran. Around him, the station walls formed angles at the center to make an elongated hexagon. The gravity was barely higher than Ganymede's standard, and after weeks at a full-G burn, Prax had to pay attention to keep himself from rising to the ceiling with each step. Amos loped beside him, every stride low, long, and fast. The shotgun in the man's hands remained perfectly level. At a T-intersection ahead, a woman appeared. Dark hair and skin. Not the one who'd taken May. Her eyes went wide, and she darted off. They know we're coming, Prax said. He was panting a little. That probably wasn't their first clue, Doc, Amos said. His voice was perfectly conversational, but there was an intensity in it, something like anger. At the intersection, they paused, Prax leaning over and resting elbows on knees to catch his breath. It was an old, primitive reflex. In less than point two g the blood return wasn't significantly increased by putting his head even with his heart. Strictly speaking, he would have been better off standing and keeping his posture from narrowing any of his blood vessels. He forced himself to stand. Where should I plug in this radio link for Naomi? He asked Amos. Amos shrugged and pointed at the wall. Maybe we can just follow the signs instead. There was a legend on the wall with colored arrows pointing in different directions. ENV control and cafeteria and primary lab. Amos tapped primary lab with the barrel of his shotgun. Sounds good to me, Prax said. You good to go? I am, Prax said, though he probably wasn't. The floor seemed to shift under him followed immediately by a long, ominous rumbling that he could feel in the soles of his feet. Naomi, you there? I am. I have to keep track of the captain on the other line. I might pop in and out. Everything all right? Might be stretching the point, Amos said. We got something sounded like someone shooting at us. They ain't shooting at the base, are they? They aren't, Naomi said from the ship, her voice pressed thin and tinny by the attenuated signal. It looks like some of the locals are mounting a defense, but so far our marines aren't returning fire. Tell them to calm that shit down, Amos said. But he was already moving down the corridor toward the primary lab. Prax jumped after him, misjudged, and cracked his arm against the ceiling. Soon as they ask me, Naomi said. The corridors were a maze but it was the kind of maze Prax had been running through his whole life. The institutional logic of a research facility was the same everywhere. The floor plans were different. Budget concerns could change how richly appointed the details were. The fields being supported determined what equipment was present. But the soul of the place was the same. And it was Prax's home. 
Twice more they caught sight of people scattering through the halls with them. The first was a young belter woman in a white lab coat. The second was a massively obese, dark-skinned man with a squat build of earth. He was wearing a crisp suit, the signature of the administrative class everywhere. Neither one tried to stop them, so Prax forgot about them almost as soon as he saw them. The imaging suite was behind a set of negative pressure seals. When Prax and Amos went through, the gust of air seemed to push them faster, urging them on. The rumble came again, louder this time and lasting almost fifteen seconds. It could be fighting. It could be a volcano forming nearby. No way to know. Prax knew this base would have to have been built with tectonic instability in mind. He wondered what the safeguards were for a moment, then put it out of his mind. Nothing he could do about it, anyway. The lab's imaging suite was at least the equal of the one he'd shared on Ganymede, with everything from the spidery full-resonance displays to the inferential gravity lens. In the corner, a squat, orange table showed a holographic image of a colony of rapidly dividing cells. Two doors led out, apart from the one they'd come through. Somewhere nearby, people were shouting at each other. Prax pointed at one of the doors. This one, he said. Look at the hinges. It's built to allow a gurney through. The passageway on the other side was warmer, and the air was more humid. It wasn't quite greenhouse level, but near to it. It opened into a long gallery with five-meter ceilings. Fitted tracks on the ceiling and floor allowed for moving high-mass equipment and containment cages. Bays lined it, each, it seemed, with a research bench not so different from the ones Prax had used as an undergraduate. Smart table, wall display, inventory control box, specimen cages. The shouting voices were louder now. He was about to say as much, but Amos shook his head and pointed down the gallery toward one of the farther bays. A man's voice came from that direction, his tone high and tight and angry. Not an evacuation if there's no place to evacuate to, he was saying. I'm not giving up the one bargaining chip I have left. You don't have that option, a woman said. Put the gun down and let's talk this through. I've been handling you for seven years and I will keep you in business for seven more, but you do not. Are you delusional? You think there's a tomorrow after this? Amos pointed forward with his shotgun then began a slow, deliberate advance. Prax followed, trying to be silent. It had been months since he'd heard Dr. Strickland's voice, but the shouting man could be him. It was possible. Let me make this perfectly clear, the man said. We have nothing. Nothing. The only hope of negotiation is if we have a card to play. That means them. Why do you think they're alive? Carlos, the woman said as Prax came to the corner of the bay. We can have this conversation later. There's a hostile enemy force on the base right now, and if you're still here when they come through that hatch... Yeah, Amos interrupted. What happens then? The bay was just like the others. Strickland, it was unmistakably Strickland, stood beside a grey metal transport crate that went from the floor to just above his hip. In the specimen cages, a half-dozen children lay motionless, sleeping or drugged. Strickland also had a small gun in his hand, pointed at the woman from the video. She was in a harshly cut uniform, the sort of thing that security forces adopted to make their staff look hard and intimidating. It worked for her. We came in the other hatch, Prax said, pointing back over his shoulder. Da? One syllable, spoken softly. It rang out from the transport cart, louder than all the weeks of explosions and gauss rounds and screams of the wounded and dying. Prax couldn't breathe. He couldn't move. He wanted to tell them all to put the guns away, to be careful. There was a child, his child. Strickland's pistol barked, 
and some sort of high-explosive round destroyed the woman's neck and face in a spray of blood and cartilage. She tried to scream once, but with significant portions of her larynx already compromised, what she managed was more of a powerful, wet exhalation. Amos lifted the shotgun, but Strickland, Marion, whatever his name was, put his pistol on top of the crate and seemed almost to sag with relief. The woman drifted to the floor, blood and flesh fanning out and falling gently to the ground like a blanket of red lace. Thank God you came, the doctor said. Oh, thank God you came. I was stalling her as long as I could. Dr. Mung, I can't imagine how hard this has been for you. I am so, so sorry. Prax stepped forward. The woman took another jerking breath, her nervous system firing at random now. Strickland smiled at him, the same reassuring smile he recognized from any number of doctor's visits over the previous years. Prax found the transport's control pad and knelt to open it. The side panel clicked as the magnetic locks gave up their grip. The panel rolled up, disappearing into the cart's frame. For a terrible, breathless moment, it was the wrong girl. She had the black, lustrous hair, the egg-brown skin. She could have been May's older sister. And then the child moved. It wasn't much more than shifting her head, but it was all that his brain needed to see his baby in this older girl's body. All the months on Ganymede, all the weeks to Tycho and back, she'd been growing up without him. She's so big, he said. She's grown so much. May frowned, tiny ridges popping into being just above her brow. It made her look like Nicola. And then her eyes opened. They were blank and empty. Prax yanked at the release on his helmet and lifted it off. The station air smelled vaguely of sulfur and copper. May's gaze fastened on him, and she smiled. Da, she said again, and put out one hand. When he reached for her, she took his finger in her fist and pulled herself into his arms. He held her to his chest, the warmth and mass of her small body, no longer tiny, only small, was overwhelming. The void between the stars was smaller than May was at that moment. She's sedated, Strickland said, but her health is perfect. Her immune system has been performing at peak. My baby, Prax said, my perfect girl. May's eyes were closed, but she smiled and made a small animal grunt of satisfaction. I can't tell you how sorry I am for all this, Strickland said. If I had any way of reaching you, of telling you what was happening, I swear to you I would have. This has been beyond a nightmare. So, you're saying they kept you prisoner here? Amos asked. Almost all the technical staff was here against their will. Strickland said. When we signed on, we were promised resources and freedom of a kind most of us had only dreamed about. When I started, I thought I could make a real difference. I was terribly, terribly wrong. And I will never be able to apologize enough. Prax's blood was singing. A warmth spread from the center of his body, radiating out to his hands and feet. It was like being dosed with the most perfect euphoric in the history of pharmacy. Her hair smelled like the cheap lab shampoo he'd used to wash dogs in the laboratories of his youth. He stood too quickly, and her mass and momentum pulled him a few centimeters off the floor. His knees and feet were slick, and it took him a moment to realize he'd been kneeling in blood. What happened to these kids? Are there others somewhere else? Amos asked. These are the only ones I was able to save. They've all been sedated for evacuation, Strickland said. But right now we need to leave. Get off the station. I have to get to the authorities. And why do you need to do that? Amos asked. I have to tell them what's been going on here. Strickland said. I have to tell everyone about the crimes that were committed here. Yeah, 
Okay, Amos said. Hey, Prax, you think you could get that? He pointed his shotgun at something on a nearby crate. Prax turned to look at Amos. It was almost a struggle to remember where he was and what they were doing. Oh, he said. Sure. Holding May against him with one arm, he took Strickland's gun and trained it on the man. No, Strickland said. You don't... you don't understand. I'm the victim here. I had to do all this. They forced me. She forced me. You know, Amos said, maybe I'm coming across as what a guy like you might call working class. Doesn't mean I'm stupid. You're one of Protogen's pet sociopaths, and I ain't buying any damn thing you're trying to sell. Strickland's face turned to cold rage like a mask had fallen away. Protogen's dead, he said. There is no Protogen. Yeah, Amos said. I got the brand name wrong. That's the problem here. May murmured something, her hand reaching out behind Prax's ear to grip his hair. Strickland stepped back, his hands in fists. I saved her, he said. That girl's alive because of me. She was slated for the second generation units, and I pulled her off the project. I pulled all of them. If it wasn't for me, every child here would be worse than dead right now. Worse than dead. It was the broadcast, wasn't it? Prax said. You saw that we might find out. So you wanted to make sure that you had the girl from the screen. The one everyone was looking for. You'd rather I hadn't? Strickland said. It was still me that saved her. Actually, I think that makes it Captain Holden, Prax said. But I take your point. Strickland's pistol had a simple thumb switch on the back. He pressed it to turn the safety on. My home is gone, Prax said, speaking slowly. My job is gone. Most of the people I've ever known are either dead or scattered through the system. A major government is saying I abuse women and children. I've had more than 80 explicit death threats from absolute strangers in the last month. And you know what? I don't care. Strickland licked his lips, his eyes shifting from Prax to Amos and back again. I don't need to kill you, Prax said. I have my daughter back. Revenge isn't important to me. Strickland took a deep breath and let it out slowly. Prax could see the man's body relax, and something on the dividing line of relief and pleasure appeared at the corners of his mouth. May twitched once when Amos's auto shotgun fired, but she lay back down against Prax's shoulder without crying or looking around. Strickland's body drifted slowly to the ground, the arms falling to the sides. The space where the head had been gouted bright arterial blood against the walls each pulse smaller than the one before. Amos shrugged. Or that, Prax said. So, you got any ideas how we... The hatch behind them opened and a man ran in. What happened? I heard... Amos raised the auto shotgun. The new man backpedaled, a thin whine of fear escaping from him as he retreated. Amos cleared his throat. Any idea how we get these kids out of here? Putting May back in the transport cart was one of the hardest things Prax had ever done. He wanted to carry her against him, to press his face against hers. It was a primate reaction, the deepest centers of his brain longing for the reassurance of physical contact. But his suit wouldn't protect her from the radiation or near vacuum of iosulfuric atmosphere and the transport would. He nestled her gently against two other children while Amos put the other four in a second cart. The smallest of them was still in newborn diapers. Prax wondered if she had come from Ganymede, too. The carts glided against the station flooring, only rattling when they crossed the built-in tracks. 
You remember how to get back to the surface? Amos asked. I think so, Prax said. Uh, Doc, you really want to put your helmet back on. Oh, right, thank you. At the T-intersection, half a dozen men in security uniforms had built a barricade, preparing to defend the lab against attack. Because Amos tossed in his grenades from the rear, the cover was less effective than the locals had anticipated. But it still took a few minutes to clear the bodies and the remains of the barricade to let the carts roll through. There was a time, Prax knew, that the violence would have bothered him. Not the blood or bodies. He'd spent more than enough time doing dissections and even autonomous limb vivisection to be able to wall off what he was seeing from any particular sense of visceral horror. But that it was something done in anger, that the men and women he'd just seen blown apart hadn't donated their bodies or tissues, would have affected him once. The universe had taken that from him, and he couldn't say now exactly when it had happened. Part of him was numb, and maybe it always would be. There was a feeling of loss in that, but it was intellectual. The only emotions he felt were a glowing, transforming relief that May was here and alive, and a vicious animal protectiveness that meant he would never let her leave his sight, possibly until she left for university. On the surface, the transports were rougher, the wheels less suited to the uneven surface of the land. Prax followed Amos's example, turning the boxes around to pull them rather than push. Looking at the vectors, it made sense, but it wouldn't have occurred to him if he hadn't seen Amos doing it. Bobby was walking slowly toward the Rosinante. Her suit was charred and stained and moving poorly. A clear fluid was leaking down the back. Don't get close to me, she said. I've got protomolecule goo all over this thing. That's bad, Amos said. You got a way to clean that off? Not really, she replied. How'd the extraction go? Got enough kids to start a singing group, but a little shy of a baseball team, Amos said. May's here, Prax said. She's all right. I'm glad to hear that, Bobby said. And even though she was clearly exhausted, she sounded like she meant it. At the airlock, Amos and Prax got in and nestled the transports against the back wall while Bobby stood on the rough ground outside. Prax checked the transport indicators. There was enough onboard air to last another forty minutes. All right, Amos said. We're ready. Going for emergency blow, Bobby said, and her armored suit came apart around her. It was a strange sight, the hard curves and layers of combat plate peeling themselves back, blooming out like a flower and then falling apart, and the woman, eyes closed and mouth open, being revealed. When she put her hand out for Amos to pull her in, the gesture reminded Prax of May seeing him again. Now, Doc, Amos said. Cycling, Prax said. He closed the outer door and started fresh air coming into the lock. Ten seconds later, Bobby's chest started to pump like a bellows. Thirty seconds, and they were at seven-eighths of an atmosphere. Where do we stand, guys? Naomi asked as Prax opened the transport. The children were all asleep. May was sucking on her first two fingers the way she had when she was a baby. He couldn't get past how much older she looked. We're solid, Amos said. I say we get the fuck out of here and glass the place. A fucking men, Avasarla's voice said in the background. Copy that, Naomi said. We're prepping for launch. Let me know when you've got all your new passengers safely in. Prax pulled off his helmet and sat beside Bobby. In the black sheath of her base garments, she looked like someone just coming back from the gym. She could have been anybody. Glad you got your kid back, she said. Thank you. I'm sorry you lost the suit, he said. She shrugged. At this point, it was mostly a metaphor anyway, she said and the inner airlock opened. Cycle's done, Naomi, Amos said. We're home. 
Chapter 52 of Asarala It was over, except that it wasn't. It never was. We're all friends now, Souther said. Talking to him without lag was a luxury she was going to miss. But if we all limp back to our corners, we're more likely to stay that way. I'm thinking it's going to be a question of years before either of our fleets are back up to what we were. There was a lot of damage. The children? Processing them. My medical officer's in communication with a list of doctors who deal with pediatric immune problems. It's just about finding their parents and getting them all home now. Good, she said. That's what I like to hear. And the other thing? Souther nodded. He looked younger in low gravity. They both did. Skin didn't sag when there was nothing to tug it down, and she could see what he looked like as a boy. We've got transponder locks on 171 packages. They're all moving sunward pretty fast, but they're not accelerating or evading. Pretty much we're standing back and letting them get close enough to Mars that disposal is trivial. You sure that's a good idea? By close, I mean still weeks away at current speed. Space is big. There was a pause that meant something other than distance. I wish you'd ride back on one of ours. Souther said. And be stuck out here for another few weeks with the paperwork? Not going to happen. And besides, heading back with James Holden and Sergeant Roberta Draper and Mei Mung? It has all the right symbolism. Press will eat it up. Earth, Mars, the outer planets, and whatever the hell Holden is now. Celebrity, Souther said. A nation of its own. It's not that bad once you get past the self-righteousness. And anyway, this is the ship I'm on, and there's nothing it's waiting to repair before it starts its burn. And I've already hired him. No one's giving me any shit about discretionary spending right now. All right, Souther said. Then I'll see you back down the well. See you there, she said, and cut the connection. She pulled herself up and launched gently across the ops deck. It would have been easy to push down the crew ladder shaft flying the way she dreamed of as a child. It tempted. In practice, she figured she'd either push too hard and slam into something, or else too gently and have air-resistant stopper with nothing solid close enough to reach. She used the handholds and pulled herself slowly down toward the galley. Pressure doors opened at her approach and closed behind her with soft hydraulic hisses and metallic bangs. When she reached the crew deck, she heard the voices before she could make out the words, and the words before she saw the people. Have to shut it down, Prax was saying. I mean, it's false pretenses now. You don't think I could be sued, do you? You can always be sued, Holden said. Chances are they wouldn't win. But I don't want to be sued in the first place. We have to shut it down. I put a notice on the site so it gives a status update and asks for confirmation before any more money gets moved. She pulled herself into the galley. Prax and Holden were floating near the coffee machine. Prax wore a stunned expression, whereas Holden looked slightly smug. They both had bulbs of coffee, but Prax seemed to have forgotten his. The botanist's eyes were wide and his mouth hung open, even in the microgravity. Who's getting sued? Avasarala asked. Now that we have May, Holden said, Prax wants people to stop giving him money. It's too much, the botanist said, looking at her as if he expected her to do something about it. I mean, surplus funds? Avasarala asked. He can't quite retire on what he's got, Holden said. Not in luxury, anyway. But it's yours, Prax said turning to Holden with something like hope. You set up the account. I took the Rosinante's fees already. Trust me, you paid us generously, Holden said, hand out in a gesture of refusal. What's still in there's all yours. Well, yours and May's. Avasarla scowled. That changed her personal calculus a little. She'd thought this would be the right time to lock Prax into a contract but Jim Holden had once again ridden in at the last moment and screwed everything up. 
Congratulations, Avasarla said. Has either of you seen Bobby? I need to talk to her. Last I saw her, she was heading for the machine shop. Thanks, Avasarla said, and kept pulling herself along. If Praxitiki Mung was independently wealthy, that made him less likely to take on the job of rebuilding Ganymede for purely financial reasons. She could probably work the civic pride angle. He and his daughter were the face of the tragedy there, and having him running the show would mean more to people than all the facts and figures of how screwed they'd all be without the food supplies back online. He might be the kind of man who'd be swayed by that. She needed to think about it. Once again, she was moving slowly and carefully enough that she heard the voices before she reached the machine shop. Bobby and Amos, both of them laughing. She couldn't believe that she was walking in on an intimate moment, but it had that tickle-fight sound to it. Then May shrieked with delight, and Avasarala understood. The machine shop was the last place in the ship, with the possible exception of engineering, that Avasarla would have thought about playing with a little girl. But there she was, arms and legs flailing through the air. Her shoulder-length black hair flowed around her in a whirl, following the gentle end-over-end -end spin of her body. Her face was bright with pleasure. Bobby and Amos stood at opposite ends of the shop. As Avasarla watched, Bobby caught the little girl out of the air and launched her back toward Amos. Soon, Avasarla thought, the girl would start losing her milk teeth. She wondered how much of all this May would remember when she was an adult. Are you people crazy? Avasarla said as Amos caught the girl. This isn't a playground. Hey there, Amos said. We weren't planning on staying long. The captain in the dock needed a minute, so I figured I'd haul the kiddo down here, give her the tour. When they send you to play catch with a child, they don't mean that she's the f that she's the ball, Avasarla said, moving across to him. Give that child to me. None of you people has any idea how to take care of a little girl. It's amazing you all live to adulthood. Ain't wrong about that, Amos said amiably, holding out the kid. Come to your nana. Avasara said. What's a nana? May asked. I'm a nana, Avasara said, gathering the child to her. Her body wanted to put the child against her hip, to feel the weight bearing down on her. In microgravity, holding a child felt odd. Good, but odd. May smelled of wax and vanilla. How much longer before we can get some thrust? I feel like a f like a balloon floating around in here. Soon as Alex and Naomi finish maintenance on the drive computers, we're out of here, Amos said. Where's my daddy? May asked. Good, Avasarla said. We've got a schedule to keep, and I'm not paying you people for floating lessons. Your daddy's talking to the captain, May May. Where? the girl demanded. Where is he? I want my da. I'll get you back to him, kiddo, Amos said, holding out a massive hand. He shifted his attention to Avasarala. She's good for about five minutes, then it's where's daddy? Good, Avasarala said. They deserve each other. Yeah, the big mechanic said. He pulled the child close to his center of gravity and launched up toward the galley. No handhold for him. Avasarla watched him go, then turned to Bobby. Bobby floated, her hair sprayed softly out around her. Her face and body were more relaxed than Avasarla remembered ever having seen them. It should have made her seem at peace, but all she could think was that the girl looked drowned. Hey, Bobby said. Did you hear back from your tech guys on Earth? I did, Avasarla said. There was another energy spike, bigger than the last ones. Prax was right. They are networked, and worse than that, they don't suffer lag. Venus reacted before the information about the battle could have reached it. Okay, Bobby said. That's bad, 
right? It's weird as tits on a bishop, but who knows if it means anything? They're talking about spin entanglement webs, whatever the hell those are. The best theory we've got is that it's like a little adrenaline rush for the protomolecule. Some part of it is involved with violence, and the rest goes on alert until it's clear the danger's passed. Well, then it's scared of something. Nice to know it might have a vulnerability somewhere. They were silent for a moment. Somewhere far off in the ship, something clanged and May shrieked. Bobby tensed. But Avasarala didn't. It was interesting to see people who hadn't been around a child react to May. They couldn't tell the difference between pleasure and alarm. Avasarala found that on this ship, she and Prax were the only experts in children's screaming. I was looking for you, Avasarala said. I'm here, Bobby said, shrugging. Is that a problem? I don't follow. Is what a problem? That you're here. She looked away, her expression closing down. It was what Avasarala had expected. You were going down there to die. Only the universe fucked you over again. You won. You're alive. None of the problems go away. Some of them do, Bobby said. Just not all. And at least we won your game. Avasarla's cough of a laugh was enough to set her spinning slightly. She reached out to the wall and steadied her drift. That's the game I play. You'll never win. You just don't lose yet. Aaron right? He lost. Sorin? Nguyen, I took them out of the game, and I stayed in. But now? Aaron Wright's going to retire with extreme prejudice, and I'm going to be given his job. Do you want it? It doesn't matter if I want it. I'll be offered it because if the bobblehead doesn't offer it, people will think he's slighting me. And I'll take it because if I don't, people will think I'm not hungry enough to be afraid of any longer. I'll be answering directly to the Secretary General. I'll have more power, more responsibility, more friends, and more enemies. It's the price of playing. Seems like there should be an alternative. There is. I could retire. Why don't you? Oh, I will, Avasarala said. The day my son comes home. What about you? Are you looking to quit? You mean, am I still planning to get myself killed? Yes that. There was a pause. That was good. It meant Bobby was actually thinking about her answer. No, she said. I don't think so. Going down in a fight's one thing. I can be proud of that. But just getting out to get out, I can't do that. You're in an interesting position, Avasarla said. You think about what to do with it. And what position is that? Ronin? A traitor to your government and a patriotic hero. A martyr who didn't die. A Martian whose best and only friend is about to run the government of Earth. You're not my only friend, Bobby said. Bullshit. Alex and Amos don't count. They only want to get into your pants. And you don't? Avasarla laughed again. Bobby was at least smiling. It was more than she'd done since she'd come back. Her sigh was deep and melancholy. I still feel haunted, she said. I thought it would go away. I thought if I faced it, it would all go away. It doesn't go away. Ever. But you get better at it. At what? At being haunted, Avasarla said. Think about what you want to do. Think about who you want to become. And then see me, and I will make it happen for you if I can. Why? Bobby asked. Seriously, why? I'm a soldier. I did the mission. And yes, it was harder and stranger than anything I've ever done, but I got it done. I did it because it needed doing. You don't owe me anything. Avasarla hoisted an eyebrow. Political favors are how I express affection, she said. 
Okay, people, Alex's voice said across the ship's PA. We're back up and commencing burn in thirty seconds unless someone says otherwise. Everybody get ready to weigh something. I appreciate the offer, Bobby said. But it may be a while before I know if I want to take it. What will you do then? Next, I mean. I'm going home, she said. I want to see my family, my dad. I think I'll stay there for a while. Figure out who I am, how to start over. Like that. The door's open, Bobby. Whenever you want it, the door is open. The flight back to Luna was a pain in the ass. Avasarla spent seven hours a day in her crash couch, sending messages back and forth against different levels of lag. On Earth, Sadavir Ehrenreit was quietly celebrated, his career with the UN honored with a small and private ceremony, and then he went off to spend more time with his family or farm chickens or whatever he was going to do with the remaining decades until death. Whatever it was, it wouldn't involve wielding political power. The investigation into the IO base was ongoing, and heads were quietly rolling on Earth. But not on Mars. Whoever in the Martian government had been bidding against Aaron Wright, they were going to get away with it. By losing the most powerful biological weapon in human history, they'd saved their own careers. Politics was full of little ironies like that. Avasarala put together her own new office in absentia. By the time she stepped into it, it would already have been running for a month. It felt like driving a car while sitting in the back seat. She hated it. In addition, Mei Meng had decided she was funny, and spent part of each day monopolizing her attention. She didn't have time to play with a little girl, except that, of course, she did. So she did. And she had to exercise so that they wouldn't have to put her in a nursing home when she got back to a full G. The steroid cocktail gave her hot flashes and made it hard to sleep. Both her granddaughters had birthdays she could only attend on a screen. One had twenty minutes lag, one had four. When they passed the cloud of protomolecule monsters speeding in toward the sun, she had nightmares for two nights running but they gradually stopped. Every one of them was being tracked by two governments, and Aaron Wright's little packets of death were all quiescent and speeding quietly and happily toward their own destruction. She couldn't wait to be home. When they docked on Luna, it was like a starving woman with a slice of apple touched to her lips, but not allowed to bite. The soft blue and white of the daylight planet the black and gold of night. It was a beautiful world, unmatched in the solar system. Her garden was down there, her office, her own bed. But Arjun was not. He was waiting for her on the landing pad in his best suit with a spray of fresh lilacs in his hand. The low gravity made him look younger, too, if a little bloodshot about the eyes. She could feel the curiosity of Holden and his crew as she walked toward him. Who was this man that he could stand to be married to someone as abrasive and hard as Christian Avasarla? Was this her master or her victim? How would that even work? Welcome home, Arjun said softly as she leaned into his arms. He smelled like himself. She put her head against his shoulder. And she didn't need Earth so badly any longer. This was home enough. Chapter 53 Holden Hi, Mom. We're on Luna. The light delay from Luna was less than six seconds for a round trip, but it was enough to add an awkward pause before each response. Mother Elise stared out at him from his hotel room's video screen for five long heartbeats. Then her face lit up. Jimmy, are you coming down? She meant down the well. Coming home. Holden felt an ache to do exactly that. 
It had been years since he'd been to the farm in Montana that his parents owned. But this time, he had Naomi with him, and Belters didn't go to Earth. No, Mom, not this time. But I want all of you to come meet me up here. The shuttle ride is my treat, and UN Undersecretary Avasarla is hosting, so the accommodations are pretty posh. When there was calm lag, it was difficult not to ramble on. The other person never sent the subtle physical cues that signaled it was their turn to talk. Holden forced himself to stop babbling and wait for a reply. Elise stared at the screen, waiting out the lag. Holden could see how much she'd aged in the years since his last trip home. Her dark brown, almost black hair was streaked with gray, and the laugh lines around her eyes and mouth had deepened. After five seconds, she waved a hand at the screen in a dismissive gesture. Oh, Tom will never ride a shuttle to Luna. You know that. He hates microgravity. Just come down and see us here. We'll throw a party. You can bring your friends here. Holden smiled at her. Mom, I need you guys to come up here because I have someone I want you to meet. Remember the woman? Naomi Nagata? The one I told you about? I told you I've been seeing her. I think it might be more than that. In fact, I'm kind of sure about it now. And now we'll be on Luna while a whole lot of political bullshit gets straightened out. I really want you guys to come up, see me, meet Naomi. It was almost too subtle to catch, the way his mother flinched five seconds later. She covered it with a big smile. More than that? What does that mean? Like getting married? I always thought you'd want kids of your own someday. She trailed off, maintaining an uncomfortably stiff smile. Mom, Holden said, Earthers and Belters can have kids just fine. We're not a different species. Sure, she said a few seconds later, nodding too quickly. But if you have children out there... She stopped, her smile fading a bit. Then there'll be Belters, Holden said. Yeah, you guys are just going to have to be okay with that. After five seconds, she nodded, again too quickly. Then I guess we better come up and meet this woman you're willing to leave Earth behind for. She must be very special. Yeah, Holden said. She is. Elise shifted uncomfortably for a second. Then her smile came back, far less forced. I'll get Tom on that shuttle if I have to drag him by the hair. I love you, Mom, Holden said. His parents had spent their whole lives on Earth. The only Outer Planets types they knew were the caricature villains that showed up on bad entertainment feeds. He didn't hold their ingrained prejudices against them because he knew that meeting Naomi would be the cure for it. A few days spent in her company, and they wouldn't be able to help falling in love with her. Oh, one last thing. That data I sent you a while back? Hang on to that for me. Keep it quiet, but keep it. Depending on how things fall out over the next couple of months, I may need it. My parents are racists, Holden said to Naomi later that night. She lay curled against his side, her face against his ear, one long brown leg thrown across his hips. Okay, she whispered. The hotel suite Avasarla had provided for them was luxurious to the point of opulence. The mattress was so soft that in the lunar gravity it was like floating on a cloud. The air recycling system pumped in subtle scents handcrafted by the hotel's in-house perfumer. That night's selection was called Windblown Grass. It didn't exactly smell like grass to Holden, but it was nice. Just a hint of earthiness to it. Holden had a suspicion that all perfumes were named randomly anyway. He also suspected that the hotel ran the oxygen just a little higher than normal. He felt a little too good. They're worried our babies will be belters, he said. No babies, Naomi whispered. But before Holden could ask what she meant, she was snoring in his ear. The next day, 
He woke before Naomi, dressed in the best suit he owned and headed out into the station. There was one last thing he had to do before he could call this whole bloody affair truly over. He had to see Jules Mao. Avasarla had told him that Mao was one of several dozen high-ranking politicians, generals, and corporate leaders rounded up in the mass of arrests following Io. He was the only one Avasarla was going to see personally. And since they'd caught him on his L-5 station, frantically trying to get on a fast ship to the outer planets, she'd just had him brought to her on Luna. That day was the day of their meeting. He'd asked Avasarla if he could be there expecting a no. Instead, she laughed a good long time and said, Holden, there is literally nothing I can think of that will be more humiliating to that man than having you watch me dismantle him. Fuck, yes, you can come. So Holden hurried out of the hotel and onto the streets of Lovell City. A quick pedicab ride got him to the tube station, and a twenty-minute tube ride took him to the new Hague United Nations complex. A perky young page was waiting for him when he arrived, and he was escorted efficiently through the complex's twisty maze of corridors to a door marked Conference Room 34. You can wait inside, sir, the perky page chirped at him. No, you know, Holden said, clapping the boy on the shoulder. I think I'll wait out here. The page dipped his head slightly and bustled off down the corridor already looking at his hand terminal for whatever his next task was. Holden leaned against the corridor wall and waited. In the low gravity, standing was hardly any more effort than sitting, and he really wanted to see Mao perp-walked down the hallway to his meeting. His terminal buzzed, and he got a short text message from Avasarala. It said, On our way. Less than five minutes later, Jules Pierre Mao climbed off an elevator into the corridor, flanked by two of the largest military police officers Holden had ever seen. Mao had his hands cuffed in front of him. Even wearing a prisoner's jumpsuit, hands in restraints, and with armed guards escorting him, he managed to look arrogant and in control. As they approached, Holden stood up straight and stepped in their way. One of the MPs yanked on Mao's arm to stop him and gave Holden a subtle nod. It seemed to say, I'm down for whatever with this guy. Holden had a sense that if he yanked a pistol out of his pants and shot Mao right there in the corridor, the two MPs would discover they had both been struck with blindness at the same moment and failed to see anything. But he didn't want to shoot Mao. He wanted what he always seemed to want in these situations— he wanted to know why. Was it worth it? Even though they were the same height, Mao managed to frown down at him. You are... Oh, come on, Holden said with a grin. You know me. I'm James Holden. I helped bring down your pals at Protogen, and now I'm about to finish that job with you. I'm also the one that found your daughter after the protomolecule had killed her. So I'll ask again. Was it worth it? Mao didn't reply. A dead daughter? A company in ruins? Millions of people slaughtered? A solar system that will probably never have peaceful stability again? Was it worth it? Why are you here? Mao finally asked. He looked smaller when he said it. He wouldn't make eye contact. I was there in the room when Dresden got his, and I'm the man who killed your pet admiral. I just feel like there's this wonderful symmetry in being there when you get yours. Antony Dresden, Mao said, was shot in the head three times execution style. Is that what passes for justice with you? Holden laughed. Oh, I doubt Christian Avasarla is going to shoot you in the face. Do you think what's coming will be better? Mao didn't reply, and Holden looked at the MP and gestured toward the conference room door. They almost looked disappointed as they pushed Mao into the room and attached his restraints to a chair. We'll be waiting out here, sir, if you need us, the larger of the two MPs said. They took up flanking positions next to the door. 
Holden went into the conference room and took a chair, but he didn't say anything else to Mao. A few moments later, Avasarala shuffled into the room, talking on her hand terminal. I don't give a fuck whose birthday it is. You make this happen before my meeting is over, or I'll have your nuts as paperweights. She paused as the person on the other end said something. She grinned at Mao and said, Well, go fast, because I have a feeling my meeting will be short. Good talking to you. She sank into a chair directly across the table from Mao. She didn't look at Holden or acknowledge him at all. He suspected that the record would never reflect his presence in the room. Avasarala put her terminal on the tabletop and leaned back in her chair. She didn't speak for several tense seconds. When she did, it was to Holden. She still didn't look at him. You've gotten paid for hauling me back here? Payments cleared, Holden said. That's good. I wanted to ask you about a longer-term contract. It would be civilian, of course, but... Mao cleared his throat. Avasarla smiled at him. I know you're there. I'll be right with you. I've already got a contract, Holden said. We're escorting the first reconstruction flotilla to Ganymede. And after that, I'm thinking we'll probably be able to get another escort gig from there. Still a lot of people relocating who'd rather not get stopped by pirates along the way. You're sure? Mao's face was white with humiliation. Holden let himself enjoy it. I've just gotten done working for a government, Holden said. I didn't wear it well. Oh, please. You worked for the OPA. That's not a government. It's a rugby scrum with a currency. Yes, Jules, what is it? You need to go to the potty? This is beneath you, Mao said. I didn't come here to be insulted. Avasarala's smile was incandescent. You're sure about that? Let me ask, do you remember what I said the first time we met? You asked me to tell you about any involvement I might have had with the protomolecule project run by Protogen. No, Avasarala replied. I mean, yes, I did ask that. But that's not the part that you should be caring about right now. You lied to me. Your involvement with weaponizing the Protogen Project is fully exposed, and that question is like asking what color Tuesday was. It's meaningless. Let's get down to brass tacks, Mao said. I can... No, Avasarla interrupted. The part you should be caring about is what I said just before you left. Do you remember that? He looked blankly up at her. I didn't think so. I told you that if I found out later you'd hidden something from me, I wouldn't take it well. Your exact words, Mao said with a mocking grin, were, I am not someone you want to fuck with. So you do remember, she said, not a hint of humor in her tone. Good. This is where you get to find out what that means. I have additional information that could be of benefit. Shut the fuck up. Avasarla said, real anger creeping into her voice for the first time. Next time I hear your voice, I have those two big MPs in the hallway hold you down and beat you with a fucking chair. Do you understand me? Mao didn't reply, which showed that he did. You don't have any idea what you've cost me, she said. I'm being promoted. The Economic Planning Council? I run it now. The Public Health Service? I never had to worry about it because that was Aaron Wright's pain in the ass. It's mine now. The Committee on Financial Regulation? Mine. You fucked up my calendar for the next two decades. This is not a negotiation, Avasarla continued. This is me gloating. I'm going to drop you into a hole so deep even your wife will forget you ever existed. I'm going to use Aaron Wright's old position to dismantle everything you ever built piece by piece and scatter it to the winds. I'll make sure you get to watch it happening. The one thing your whole will have is twenty-four hour news. And since you and I will never meet again, I want to make sure my name is on your mind every time I destroy something else you left behind. I am going to erase you. Mao stared back defiantly but Holden could see it was just a shell. 
Abasala had known exactly where to hit him. Because men like him lived for their legacy. They saw themselves as the architects of the future. What Abasala was promising was worse than death. Mao shot a quick look at Holden, and it seemed to say, I'll take those three shots to the head now, please. Holden smiled at him. Chapter 54 Prax May sat on Prax's lap, but her attention was focused with a laser intensity to her left. She put her hand up to her mouth and gently, deliberately, deposited a wad of half-chewed spaghetti into her palm, then held it out toward Amos. It's yucky, she said. The big man chuckled. Well, if it wasn't before, it sure is now, Pumpkin, he said, unfolding his napkin. Why don't you put that right here? I'm sorry, Prax said. She's just... She's just a kid, Doc, Amos said. This is what she's supposed to do. They didn't call the dinner a dinner. It was a reception sponsored by the United Nations at the New Hague facilities on Luna. Prax couldn't tell if the wall was a window or an ultra-high-definition screen. On it, Earth glowed blue and white on the horizon. The tables were spread around the room in a semi-organic array that Avasarla had explained was the current fashion. Makes it look like some asshole just put them up anywhere. The room was almost equally people he knew and people he didn't, and watching them segregate was fascinating in its way. To his right, several small tables were filled with short, stocky men and women in professional suits and military uniforms, orbiting around Avasarla and her amused-looking husband, Arjun. They gossiped about funding system analysis and media relations control. Every outer planet's hand they shook was an inclusion that their subjects of conversation denied. To his left, the scientific group was dressed in the best clothes they had. Dress jackets that had fit ten years before, and suits representing at least half a dozen different design seasons. Earthers and Martians and Belters all mixed in that group. But the talk was just as exclusionary. Nutrient grades, adjustable permeability membrane technologies, phenotypic force expressions. Those were both his people from the past and his future. The shattered and reassembled society of Ganymede. If it hadn't been for the middle table with Bobby and the crew of the Rosinante, he would have been there, talking about cascade arrays and non-visible feeding chloroplasts. But in the center, isolated and alone, Holden and his crew were as happy and at peace as if they'd been in their own galley, burning through the vacuum. And May, who had taken a fancy to Amos, still wouldn't be physically parted from Prax without starting to yell and cry. Prax understood exactly how the girl felt, and didn't see it as a problem. So, living on Ganymede, you know a lot about low-gravity childbearing, right? Holden said. It's not really that much riskier for belters, is it? Prax swallowed a mouthful of salad and shook his head. Oh no, it's tremendously difficult. Especially if it's just a shipboard situation without extensive medical controls. If you look at naturally occurring pregnancies, there's a developmental or morphological abnormality five times out of six. Five, Holden said. Most of them are germline issues, though, Prax said. Nearly all of the children born on Ganymede were implanted after a full genetic analysis. If there's a lethal equivalent, they just drop the zygote and start over. Non-germline abnormalities are only twice as common as on Earth, though, so that's not so bad. Ah, Holden said, looking crestfallen. Why do you ask? No reason, Naomi said. He's just making conversation. Daddy, I want tofu, May said, grabbing his earlobe and yanking it. Where's tofu? Let's see if we can't find you some tofu, Prax said, pushing his chair back from the table. Come on. As he walked across the room, scanning the crowd for a dark, formal suit belonging to a waiter as opposed to a dark, formal suit belonging to a diplomat, 
A young woman came up to him with a drink in one hand and a flush on her cheeks. You're Praxitiki Mung, she said. You probably don't remember me. Um, no, he said. I'm Carol Kiesowski, she said, touching her collarbone as if to clarify what she meant by I. We wrote to each other a couple of times right after you put out the video about May. Oh, right, Prax said, trying desperately to remember anything about the woman or the comments she might have left. I just want to say, I think both of you are just so, so brave, the woman said, nodding. It occurred to Prax that she might be drunk. Son of a fucking whore, Avasarla said, loud enough to cut through the background buzz of conversations. The crowd turned to her. She was looking at her hand terminal. What's a whore, Daddy? It's a kind of frost, honey, Prax said. What's going on? Holden's old boss beat us to the punch, Avasarla said. I guess we know what happened to all those fucking missiles he stole. Arjun touched his wife's shoulder and pointed at Prax. She actually looked abashed. Sorry for the language, she said. I forgot about her. Holden appeared at Prax's shoulder. My boss? Fred Johnson just put on a display, Avasarla said. Nguyen's monsters? We've been waiting for them to come closer to Mars before we took them down. Transponders are all chirping away, and we've got them all tracked tighter than a fly's. Well, they crossed into the belt, and he nuked them. All of them. That's good, though, Prax said. I mean, isn't that good? Not if he's doing it, Avasarla said. He's flexing muscles, showing that the belt's got an offensive arsenal now. A man in uniform to Avasarala's left started talking at the same time as a woman just behind her, and, in a moment, the need to declaim had spread through the whole group. Prax pulled away. The drunk woman was pointing at a man and talking rapidly, Prax and May forgotten. He found a waiter at the edge of the room, extracted a promise of tofu, and went back to his seat. Amos and May immediately started playing at who could blow their nose the hardest, and Prax turned to Bobby. Are you going to go back to Mars, then? he asked. It seemed like a polite, innocuous question until Bobby pressed her lips tight and nodded. I am, she said. Turns out my brother's getting married. I'm going to try to get there in time to screw up his bachelor party. What about you? Taking the old lady's position? Well, I think so, Prax said, a little surprised that Bobby had heard about Avasarla's offer. It hadn't been made public yet. I mean, all of the basic advantages of Ganymede are still there. The magnetosphere, the ice. If even some of the mirror arrays can be salvaged, it would still be better than starting again from nothing. I mean, the thing you have to understand about Ganymede. Once he started on the subject, it was hard for him to stop. In many ways, Ganymede had been the center of civilization in the outer planets. All the cutting-edge plant work had been there, all the life sciences issues. But it was more than that. There was something exciting about the prospect of rebuilding that was, in its fashion, even more interesting than the initial growth. To do something the first time was an exploration. To do it again was to take all the things they had learned and refine improve, perfect. It left Prax a little bit giddy. Bobby listened with a melancholy smile on her face. And it wasn't only Ganymede. All of human civilization had been built out of the ruins of what had come before. Life itself was a grand chemical improvisation that began with the simplest replicators and grew and collapsed and grew again. Catastrophe was just one part of what always happened. It was a prelude to what came next. You make it sound romantic, Bobby said. And the way she said it was almost an accusation. I don't mean to, Prax began, and something cold and wet wriggled its way into his ear. He pulled back with a yelp, turning to face May's bright eyes and brilliant smile. 
Her index finger dripped with saliva, and beyond her Amos was laughing himself crimson, one hand grasping at his belly and the other slapping the table hard enough to make the plates rattle. What was that? Hi, Daddy. I love you. Here, Alex said, passing Prax a clean napkin. You're going to want that. The startling thing was the silence. He didn't know how long it had been going on, but the awareness of it washed over him like a wave. The political half of the room was still and quiet. Through the forest of their bodies he saw Avasarla bending forward, her elbows on her knees, her hand terminal inches in front of her face. When she stood up, they parted before her. She was such a small woman, but she commanded the room just by walking out of it. That's not good. Holden said, rising to his feet. Without another word, Prax and Naomi, Amos and Alex and Bobby all followed after her. The politicians and the scientists came too, all of them mixing at last. The meeting room was across a wide hall and set up in the model of an ancient Greek amphitheater. The podium at the front stood before a massive high-definition screen. Avasarla marched down to a seat, talking fast and low into her hand terminal. The others trailed in after her. The sense of dread was physical. The screen went black, and someone dimmed the lights. In the darkness of the screen, Venus stood in near silhouette against the sun. It was an image Prax had seen hundreds of times before. The feed could have come from any of a dozen monitoring stations. The time stamp on the lower left said they were looking back in time forty-seven minutes. A ship name, the Celestine, floated beneath the numbers. Every time the protomolecule soldiers had been involved in violence, Venus had reacted. The OPA had just destroyed a hundred of its half-human soldiers. Prax felt himself caught between excitement and dread. The image scattered and reformed some kind of interference confusing the censors. Avasarla said something sharp that could have been, Show me. A few seconds later, the image stopped and reframed. A detail screen showing a grey-green ship. A heads-up display marked it the merman. The image scattered again, and when it reformed, the merman had moved half an inch to the left and was spinning end over end, tumbling. Avasarla spoke again. A few seconds lag, and the screen went back to its original image. Now that Prax knew to look, he could see the tiny dot of the merman moving near the penumbra. There were other tiny specks like it. The dark side of Venus pulsed like a sudden planetary flash of lightning under the obscuring clouds, and then it glowed. Vast filaments, thousands of kilometers long, like spokes on a wheel, lit white and vanished. The clouds of Venus shifted, disturbed from below. Prax had the powerful memory of seeing a wake on the surface of a water tank when a fish passed close underneath. Vast and glowing, it rose through the cloud cover. Spoke-like strands of iridescence arced with vast lightning storms coming together like the arms of an octopus, but connected to a rigid central node. Once it had climbed out of Venus's thick cloud cover, it launched itself away from the sun, toward the viewing ship, but passing it. The other ships in its path were scattered and hurled away. A long plume of displaced Venusian atmosphere caught the sun and glowed like snowflakes and slivers of ice. Prax tried to make sense of the scale as large as Ceres Station, as large as Ganymede, larger. It folded its arms, its tentacles, together, accelerating without any visible drive plume. It swam in the void. His heart was racing, but his body was still as stone. May patted his cheek with her open palm and pointed to the screen. What's that? she asked.
Epilogue Holden Holden started the replay again. The wall screen in the Rosinante's galley was too small to really catch all the details of the high-resolution imagery the Celestine had taken. But Holden couldn't stop watching it no matter what room he was in. An ignored cup of coffee cooled on the table in front of him next to the sandwich he hadn't eaten. Venus flashed with light in an intricate pattern. The heavy cloud cover swirled as though caught in a planet-wide storm, and then it rose from the surface, pulling a thick contrail of Venus's atmosphere in its wake. Come to bed, Naomi said, then leaned forward in her chair and took his hand. Get some sleep. It's so big, and the way it swatted all those ships out of the way, effortless, like a whale swimming through a school of guppies. Can you do anything about it? This is the end, Naomi, Holden said, pulling his eyes away from the screen to look at her. What if this is the end? This isn't some alien virus anymore. This thing is what the protomolecule came here to make. This is what it was going to hijack all life on the Earth to make. It could be anything. Can you do anything about it? She repeated. Her words were harsh, but her voice was kind, and she squeezed his fingers affectionately. Holden turned back to the screen, restarting the image. A dozen ships blew away from Venus as though a massive wind had caught them and sent them spinning like leaves. The surface of the atmosphere began to roil and twist. Okay, Naomi said, standing up. I'm going to bed. Don't wake me when you come in. I'm exhausted. Holden nodded to her without looking away from the video feed. The massive shape folded itself into a streamlined dart, like a piece of wet cloth plucked up from the center, then flew away. The Venus it left behind looked diminished somehow, as though something vital had been stolen from it to construct the alien artifact. And here it was. After all the fighting, with human civilization left in chaos just from its presence, the protomolecule had finished the job it came billions of years before to do. Would humanity survive it? Would the protomolecule even notice them, now that it had finished its grand work? It wasn't the ending of one thing that left Holden terrified. It was the prospect of something beginning that was utterly outside the human experience. Whatever happened next, no one could be prepared for it. It scared the hell out of him. Behind him, a man cleared his throat. Holden turned reluctantly away from the image on the screen. The man stood next to the galley refrigerator, as if he'd always been there. Rumpled gray suit and dented pork pie hat. A bright blue firefly flew off his cheek, then hung in the air beside him. He waved it away like it was a gnat. His expression was one of discomfort and apology. Hey, Detective Miller said, we gotta talk. The End this has been a sci-fi audio production of Caliban's War, Book Two of The Expanse by James S. A. Corey, narrated by Jefferson Mays, and directed by Erica Jensen. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Sci-Fi Audio recommends Artemis by Philip Palmer, narrated by Heather O'Neill and Robert Ian McKenzie. Artemis MacGyver is a thief, a con artist, and a stone-cold killer. And she's been on a crime spree for, well, for years. The galactic government has collapsed, and the universe was hers for the taking. But when the cops finally catch up with her, they give Artemis a choice. Suffer in prison for the rest of her very long life, or 
join a crew of criminals, murderers, and traitors on a desperate mission to save humanity against an all-consuming threat. Now, Artemis has to figure out how to be a good guy without forgetting who she really is. Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So visit us at recordedbooks.com to learn about our latest releases and special offers. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.